Hi, my name is Uncompetitive and this video is called Uncompetitive Reacts to Eric Weinstein's 2013 Geometric Unity Lecture. And I'm just going to see if I can hear myself. And I'm just going to see if I can hear myself. That works. All right. So we'll get into sharing the screen. We need to be able to see how long this is taking. And we want to bring that up so that it doesn't overlap that. Um, it would be nice to have that at the back. Um, where are we with this? Um, I had an image, this image. We have this image, but off to the side there. Um, and I did drag it off to the corner of the screen like that and then this off this way um actually I need to have it wider so it can be off this side as well it needs to be if I make it wider it doesn't make it bigger hmm it looks like it won't let me have it full screen as an underlay. Okay, doesn't matter. This is this is going to probably be all that. So um, we want that brought over from the other desktop onto this, and that goes there. And it's a little bit encroaching on that, so I'll make it go up like that. And then we'll have it all the way over there. That's not too terrible. And see so what's that look like? We want that more like that. Now we can see the clock. What's this down here? Okay, we've got two sets of lists of names. Uh, this one's scrollable, the other one's static. And this one um, has got the prerequisites on it. So if we put the prerequisites over here. Um, I've discussed this all in previous streams. So the point is that you go somewhere like the the, the portal discord the official portal discord like i did and you say ask a question about geometric unity and they'll post an image and it'll be all these books that you expected to read and then you'll know your academic prerequisites for um understanding geometric unity and in this image there were about 18 books and it was like linear algebra, um, differential manifolds, um, Lie groups, um, I don't know, uh, algebra topology, um, you know, books on general relativity, books on group theory, books on gauge theory, um, books on Einstein. Did I say Einstein? Um, yeah. Um, lots of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff. Um, and so I can't remember. I wish I had had the image because I thought it, it made me laugh when they did it. I thought, this is this what they do to everyone that's new? Because I've come at this as someone who doesn't understand. And when I watched the 
and that's going to bother me because that's slightly not aligned we'll move this over a little bit tiny tiny wincy bit um yeah that's better so the thing is is we will we have it where The, um, I, I came upon his lecture in 2020 and what happened was is I had um, started watching the Joe Rogan experience when it used to be on YouTube because I was bored and I needed some long form content and I got myself YouTube premium which is a good investment, I recommend it uh, this isn't an advert for YouTube premium and um i just started thinking well you know it's quite expensive i better watch as much youtube premium as i can to the extent that i have given up tv and i have uh, stopped paying my television license that you pay in the uk and you can go off to a website and you can say i don't need this no more and you have to make sure you can't um uh, receive um, television programs and you know if they find out you are having said you're no longer paying then you might go to prison so uh, it's quite quite serious and uh, I did this and I must have said something I can't remember what the television license is it's something like 175 pounds a year maybe I'm not sure and um, for that I was able to afford YouTube premium and then I got Netflix and i preferred that to i also got amazon prime for deliveries and it comes with amazon prime video but i i don't really like watching things on amazon prime video because so much of the stuff on there you have to buy and it just they don't separate out the stuff that you can watch free with amazon prime from the stuff that you can pay for it's all muddled up now it used to be in the old interface it was all quite clearly separated and i wish they went back to that but i suppose they're just trying to tempt you with their wares and they're doing the whole thing of serendipity which i find kind of irritating because it's like look i'm paying for this i want to have the free stuff that i paid for which isn't really free because it's a subscription so i have i want the stuff that i am entitled to see and you're concealing it from me now actually People have said, you know, there's things that are on these services that you can only find through search. There's like websites of interesting films that you can only find through search. And if you just try browsing for them, you'll, you'll never find them. So um, that's an interesting thing. Because I've been thinking the whole thing of browsing stuff was highly overrated. Because I'll have something like I've downloaded a document on my computer and I think, uh, do I face going into the file system to try and find out where I put it? Or do I go and Google it again? And Googling it again, although I don't use Google, I use DuckDuckGo, is almost always faster. Right? So if you can remember some salient thing about the thing that you downloaded before, some bit of text, then you can find it again. And that's wild right so it's like it's wild when it's like right there in your computer and you can't access it so um i think there needs to be a paradigm shift on how we deal with files and computers um, and make it more like search and then make it so that the kind of a search where we don't do a search ends up giving us uh, a kind of default view of our files so like we might have like a current job that we're working on so it would know what job we were doing at any given time that would essentially be our project and the project and the, the kind of folders that would be associated with that project um, would then be under that purview of that thing and we would get to see all of that information uh, when we went to do a search um, and it would all, wouldn't necessarily 
will be higgledy piggledy. You might actually have folders that will be titled in certain ways, but um, there's there's different ways of organising things, and it might be useful to say look at it as if it's a, like a relational database management system and you've got like the um or, or how 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 is it do you want to access your data and and that sort of thing so i'm, I'm interested in in that sort of thing and i'm looking to design a new operating system and graphical user interface and i'm quite critical of these things i think they could be improved and i'm about to implement my programming language which i've worked on for 25 years and and then i'm going to use all those things and some middleware tools to make a video game uh, that i've been planning for a long time and it's because it's so ambitious that's why i have to have a new language in order to improve my productivity to be in a position to attempt it so um that's sort of who i am I am an amateur video games designer who um, has made some games a long, long time ago um, and then published a paint box that was color uh, before Adobe Photoshop got to be color. Um, um, so I have experience, but only like technically in being a professional software developer because i mean it only took me like a week to write the, the paint box and then the people in the shop were like we'd like it to be able to print out and i'm like but you don't have any color printers <laughs> what else is going to do if it's trying to print out and there's no color printers so i had to like figure out something where it turned everything into a grayscale and then it went off <coughs> and because it wasn't even a monochrome printer it turned it into dithering patterns like you get in a newspaper and it did that on a dot matrix and i came back after a week with that as the extra feature they'd asked for and they were happy <laughs> they were happy with it coming out looking like newsprint and it had fantastic colors on the screen like 256 colors on the screen and it comes out like gray <laughs> with kind of mud and then like now we can sell this i'm like okay what did you say I'd been setting up uh, a camera and I'd been doing exposures of the screen onto slide photography. And then you can like project it onto a, 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 you know, a, a projection screen or better yet, you can have it like in a transparent scene, you can have it lit from behind and it looks just like the monitor. And you have some um, art galleries that have done this where they have done computer art and they put the exhibition on and they actually have the things on the walls and I actually I went to one the first time I went to one they had and it was um things were in little lit things with transparencies I thought okay I understand why you've done that but it does mean everything's going to have to have to be wired up to electric right <laughs> so it's electric art and the other one was years later and they ended up with um, iPads on the wall quite obviously iPads <laughs> and I just thought okay then so like iPad 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 each with a different drawing on it you know um I don't know I think they've done something to disable them or frame them so that you couldn't mess with them you know if you went you know I don't think they had the home button um visible but it, they were definitely iPads um anyway um so um because i've been to art college but i dropped out and um i've had problems with mental illness and i have not worked because of this and i have found this thing of um i found the whole thing with the pandemic quite stressful and that led to me being ill again and then I um, came out of that and I wasn't fit to be able to work on my uh, programming and I thought damn it you know I thought it was all right and writing the software I need to write is really requires a certain kind of um, mental acuity 
and I just felt very, very woolly, and I couldn't think straight. I couldn't concentrate. And I thought, if I go into this prematurely, even if I like give myself a few months to recover, because they always let you out of hospital before you're better. Um, you, you, you think, well, I'll give myself a few months to recover, and then I'll get going. And it's like, well, mm, it's problematic because you're going to end up maybe um, wrongly assessing your abilities and getting in on something that you're not really fully fit to do and messing it up right at the outset. And then because it's like the foundational stuff that everything else is built on, it makes the foundations weak. Because I want to make it so that when I write the software, I write the software and it's basically right. So it might be that I have to go through a kind of iterative feedback loop when I first make it. But once I moved on from that, thing that I was trying to make and I make it and test it, make it and test it, make it and test it. And I get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm happy with this. When I move on to the next thing that he's doing, I never go back to the thing that I did before. Now this isn't usually how software is developed. Usually people go back and they change things that are fundamental. They say, oh, wouldn't it be good if we did this and that and the other? And they keep tinkering with things and they, basically fuck up everything else that comes afterwards because it's like a house of cards. And you want the cards placed at the bottom of the tower to be left the fuck alone and everything else to be built on top of them. And this isn't anything to do with concepts like fragile base class syndrome, which is something that afflicts object-oriented programming languages. This happens in everything to some degree. If you have um, something using something that's written before it as a service and then you change how that service works in order to kind of enhance it there might be some ramifications of that change that you hadn't considered that then have the knock-on effect in code that was exploiting it being that certain way and you were um you've ruined it now right so um that's not good you don't want to do that. So um, I uh, thought, yeah, if I start writing something, I want to not have to come back and change it because it was not done when I was at my best. I want to almost start at my best and almost get worse over time. You know, I, wanna, I don't want to be bad at programming and then get better at programming as I go along. I, I will accept that I will get worse at programming over time, right? Which is interesting because entropy is, is kind of constant in the universe. So it's kind of more likely that you get worse at programming as you go along. And I just thought the stuff that would be the hard stuff to do, like, you know, getting all the mathematics to work in the language and the type system, that is the stuff that I'd be like, wanting to be on my top game when I do it. Once you've done it, it's done, right? You're just then dealing with the next thing, which is like, you know, defining functions involving mathematical expressions involving types, like natural numbers and integers and reals and whatever, complex numbers. And it just works, right? And then you kind of build some arrays and then you kind of tell it about tensors and how they work have a kind of special case of an array and you're kind of kind of getting somewhere where you're kind of already better than most programming languages it's like a bit like apl a bit like cl classic fortran uh, that was a has array programming elements in it um it has inherent parallelism um you can make it look nice you know you can have it so that the equations that you type in you can write that in the language, literally, right? And they're like, no way. And then you're like, yes way. You can, you can have it so you can write in the Einstein field equation in the Vogel language and it will work. And doing that is hard, right? And no one normally bothers. They all use code that looks like 
nothing like the scientific stuff that it's supposed to relate to. So when it comes for them to take something from a book on science and like maybe put it into a video game, it ends up being unrecognizable. And they can't just kind of, I mean, they wouldn't do copy and paste. They wouldn't take, say, the source of a, a document in LaTeX and then copy the LaTeX into their programming language and it would like, have executable LaTeX. That's that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that you'd have something in the book that looked like the Einstein field equations, and then you go off and you be able to type something in that again look like the Einstein field equations, and it would work, right? But you'd have to do that transcription, and you'd have to input it so it came out, and then it would look a certain way, right? It's not, I mean, there's some thought of like, I think they talked about it in the Big Bang Theory where they had like an idea for an app where you'd have a camera and you'd go off and take a photograph of an equation and it would do something with the equation. I can't remember what it was that it did, but it was like OCR uh, and then it went off and did something with it. And then Penny <laughs> went off and did, did an app where you take a photograph of someone's shoes and it tell you where to buy them. And her app did the much better. And I just thought, yes, that's a much better idea. That's something that actually more than 14 people want, you know? So, um, um, so this whole thing about me engaging increasingly seriously with geometric unity, although I am um, an untrained um, amateur um, and I'm a layman and I watched the original um, I, I watched the Joe, Joe Rogan experience I saw Eric Weinstein was on there that led me to the portal podcast I watched some of them not all of them and then he did this portal special presentation I was like okay I'll watch this and it was completely incomprehensible now he said some names that I recognized maybe more than the average person. And I thought, okay. And I thought, I don't think Marcus de Sotoy would have got him in there if it wasn't credible. So I didn't think the whole thing was like a hoax or, you know, um, an April Fool's or anything like that. Um, and it wasn't happening in April anyway. It was happening in on May the 23rd. And so... I, I I was inclined to think it was all um, credible, even though it's, it's unexpected to something of such ambition and scale will come out from one individual, because these things are usually the work of at least two people. And um, I mean, some scientific papers have numerous names on them, right? Um, you know, like cyborg witness theory isn't proposing anything near to the scope of this is quite a modest part of um, describing the standard model. And it's just Ed Witten and um, Nathan Seiberg. That's it, right? So um, that led me to watching that. Um, and I thought, you know what, this is kind of interesting because when you read things in science fiction books and then you watch things like Star Trek and various other things that are kind of purportedly hard science fiction, um, it's like they can't really do the science uh, because if they need new science for something, like how does a warp reactor work in um, Star Trek, they make a bit of an effort and they try and stay consistent with the law but they can't actually say, um, you know, get down to the nitty gritty of things. And I thought that's a bit of a shame. And they kind of just have to hand wave things away. And I thought it would be interesting to have a science fiction novel about maybe a scientist who um, discovers the theory of everything or like a unified field theory or 
depending on what you want to define it as, it would be like a really big deal. Okay. So like he would be the next Einstein, he would be this character that would, you know, do this. And I thought, okay, but that's a bit dry. Okay. If it's that. And then I thought, well, Eric in his interviews has talked about ego and that stands for the embedded growth obligation. And he's talked about how there's a website about something to do. I think it's 1973 or 1974. And it, it's to do with like what happened in that year. And it's like the thing that was the upstream driver of the economy uh, that was um, fundamental theoretical physics basically came to an end. And the things that then came after that was just like, uh, the, it was like a car that was still had momentum, but it, its gas tank was empty. And everything's starting to self cannibalize and all the institutions are starting to um, become pernicious and self cannibalize and vampiric and parasitic on themselves and any scrap of an original idea. And the original idea is that students are all being uh, taken up by their uh, tenured professors and it's because the tenured professors are under responsibility as part of their contract to produce a number of papers and it's really hard to keep doing that when you basically run to the edge of physics and so ideas are going to get stolen and people aren't going to get the attribution that they want and i'm not naming names on who's doing this but it seems to be quite pervasive and uh, counterproductive. So um, he has talked about this a fair amount about problems in academia, his view of it as a former person in academia who left it because he got sick of how it was. And, but now, you know, having been through a period of time when he was an economist, he has a perspective on it from the lens of economics. And he's like saying, the problem is lack of funding. You know, they've got the worst deal. They've in invented all these fundamental physics that are then being turned into technology. Uh, we then use, and it makes people like Apple and Microsoft and uh, the people with the GPS satellites, whoever that is, um, lots of money and, um, they don't really see much out of it. And it's because the government thinks, well, we'll keep funding them, we'll give them another accelerator or something, that they kind of have some oxygen, you know, to kind of continue doing what they're doing. But um, the government doesn't really have to, you know, throw them crumbs, right? And um, I think it's, a problem and he talks about this embedded growth obligation and it's like we need to keep growing and then there's no way to sustain it and the things that would uh, create value in the economy would be things like having a new forms of physics and that would then spur things on that were new forms of technology so technology um will um, accelerate you know, progress and create um, wealth, obviously, but that doesn't come from nowhere. That comes from that technology being founded in uh, physics and that physics being founded in mathematics, actually. Because if you, you know, none of this that's on the screen at the moment would have been possible without Everest Galois, right? He's the guy who um, had the insight the, the night before duel of, of groups. And he thought, I might die tomorrow. I better write it down. And whether or not him staying up all night writing it down in a feverish way meant that he was too tired for the um, duel and that contributed to him dying in the duel, I don't know. But 
um, it's all very tragic. And so we have um, a list of people. Um, let's see. Oh, pressing the wrong key. We have the list of people we've got, like in modern times, we've got uh, these people. And I sort of trying to put them in roughly um, historical order. And we've got mathematicians in there and we've got physicists. And then if you go back, we get a few people there from antiquity, uh, I think are important as well. And you've got natural philosophers and you've got um, philosophers and you've got mathematicians. And like people like Pythagoras are interesting because he like was into mathematics, mathematics, but he actually had like a cult. And um, it's interesting that his work is um, informative of the work of Einstein. And the stuff that's to do with Einstein here, um, being able to you know calculate um, surfaces on a squished space time in part is reusing the work of um, um, well, who was I talking about? Um, Pythagoras. Um, so there's a whole list of people on here that are important and um, the reason I have it here is that I can go and I can um, we need to add a name here because I had it on the right hand side and I didn't put it in on the left hand side so we better put that in we'll put it in uh, here it's not really the best place to put it but we put it in here Song uh, Dao Li and then there's someone else that's missing um few other names is missing who else is missing we've got to have George Zweig with um, where is it because there should be the people behind Mogul man okay George Zweig so I got this um, list um, I think that's the way it's spelled um, I got this list from reading his paper and going through all the surnames and then going through Wikipedia and then working out who their full names were, okay? And I thought this would be useful because I thought when he talks about it in the lecture, I can just go off and scoot over and refer to people. So the one that's on the right-hand side that was a screen grab isn't the full list, and this is going to be amended to be more like the full list. Now, uh, who else is? And it's not everyone in physics by any by any means, but it's like, yeah, it's kind of like trying to try to get a list, and um, this is kind of helpful. So, who else is needed on here? Have I got Pauli on here? Um, I don't know that he's on the list. Um, Uh, we need Pauli, which I'm going to put, I'm not quite sure where to put him, I suppose he could go here. I don't know exactly when the dates are, um, maybe it's after Einstein, possibly was. So um, we've got Herman Weil, have we? Um, yes, okay, good. Um, mm, anyone else? Oh, uh, we, we need the people for the electro weak unification. So that will be uh, Sheldon Glashauer. And then we would need to have S Salam. And then we'd need to have Stephen Weinberg. So I've missed out Stephen Weinberg, which is an 
oversight. So we've got that. Right. So, funnily enough, the only person who's now missing is Eric Weinstein himself. So let's put him on the list. Because, I mean, why not? I mean, he's, he's uh, made an effort and he's showing his ideas and, um, you know, so there we go, Eric Weinstein. And uh, to be fair, we put some some other people, Max Tegmark, um, and we'll have uh, Stephen Wolfram. Um, and uh, I think we might have said Sir Roger Penrose. I don't know, have we? Don't see him there. Um, Nobel laureate. Um, anything else? Um, mm, oh, yeah. Um, can I really see? Um, uh, trying to think who else has got theories of everything. They're the guy with the CTMU theory, and I can't remember what his name is. But that's more of a kind of theory of everything rather than the theory of physics. And so I'm not leaving him out to denigrate him in any way, but his work is on, it's based in logic and it's to do with um, the meaning of life. So it's kind of, not dealing with explaining the universe as much as it's explaining the universe of discourse. So I think that's legitimate, but it's not, um, it, as far as I'm aware about it, and I haven't looked into it that much, it seems to be something to do with that rather than it's to do with um, theoretical um, physics. And I'm more interested in having stuff to do with that. Um, we'll spot these names around. Um, one one thing that's interesting about Eric Weinstein is he was actually interested in um, where's he gone? Where, oh, he's gone? It's really difficult to do this. I need to find the list. Um, we need to have Gareth Bleasy and Eric Weinstein. There we are. So, because I found out about Gat Lisi first, and the exceptionally simple theory of everything that he did, based on the E8 Lee group, and um, that got me interested in um, these um, the mathematics of quantum field theory, in, as expressed in these terms and the symmetries and the patterns and i could understand it in that basis so garrett lisi's work is if we look up that and this is all relevant right we go and go and find i had all like these windows on screen and um you say to your computer right i'd like to turn you off because i don't want you overheating but when i Bring you back on you will bring back my windows won't you and it's like yeah yeah and it doesn't so that's apple's fault that is so um uh elementary particle explorer and in this we get this e8 thing and that's in terms of mathematics we want it in terms of physics and it's slightly different there it's got some axes written on it and we're seeing a projection of something that's uh, got multiple dimensions and you can kind of rotate it and stuff like that. And then we then go off into this and we say, right, we want to look at, um, say, the standard model. And the standard model has radically fewer of these things. So, um, but it's actually included. So the standard model is uh, set within the um, E8 group. 
as far as I understand, it's like um, it's like one of those. Uh, well, if we look at the next one up, this one is um, has um, a degree of chirality within the weak interaction, and if you go to Patti Salam, um, it adds these in, and I don't quite know whether that means it doesn't, but from the mathematics of the way the Patti Salam thing is. Uh, constructed it has both left and right um, SU2 and so um, I treat that as making it a non-chiral theory so um, you can see how if you go from this um, the standard model is like included within it it's just missing those things that I just had on screen and so this is like the superset of that and then you can keep going up and keep going up to supersets you can say well this would be e7 and it adds a whole bunch more stuff and this could be e8 and you can even have like two of these so you could have like um you can do that and you could do this you could do that and you could do that and so that will be E8, E8, heterotic string theory, right? So like, wow, you really have, you know, given yourself a whole bunch of stuff to work with there, haven't you, right? So, I mean, somewhere in there, it's got to be the answer, surely, right? Um, so um, you can kind of play around with this and move them around and um, orbit them in various different ways and stuff. And the thing to appreciate about this is that you um, you can find kind of patterns and um, axial transformations and stuff where um, that one's shrinking the yellow and it's making it go down like that. So, you know, there are all these other things you can do with it, depending on the way you're manipulating it according to these axes. And, um, oh, this is back to being math again. Uh, physics. Physics. So anyway, so you have all these things. Um, it doesn't actually end up being something that works as something that would apply to our reality. Um, the E8 one by itself seems to be limited and um, Eric's made some uh, crit critiques of it but um, when Gat Lucy appeared on the board podcast he said oh I've already addressed these critiques because you're referring to how my, my theory was when it was first presented and you know it's okay but you haven't been keeping up with the changes So that might be a case where Eric needed to be a bit better prepared for his guests and read up on what it was that he was doing to kind of not be putting him in the, on the spot about something that was a kind of an anachronistic criticism. Okay, so um, we'll leave that for now because there's not really anything more to say about that um unfortunately there's no one that you can select that would be um the the group that eric is dealing with but it sort of is in there um i think that's not a complete misrepresentation so this is a paper he did in um 2021 and um as you can see there it says um author's working draft version one and he has published this himself uh it's not gone to a journal he's not been subject to academic peer review and uh he's making up for that by eliciting constructive feedback through these email addresses that are on the um, um first uh, part of the thing so it's like He's open to 
people coming, really anyone coming forward and saying stuff that will help him with what he's working on as a work in progress. And we are um, lucky in a way to get an early preview of his ideas. And they are uh, partial, speculative, incomplete ideas because it is a working work in progress draft, right? So um, there's another part of his um, paper where he talks about, oh, well, because it's all typeset, people are going to jump to the wrong conclusion. And so we find that, okay. And so here he is, and he's saying, um, there is something about the nature of LaTeX, which is the thing he uses to prepare this document, that is likely to confuse a professional reader. It is if a typeset document constitutes agreement to participate in some academic social contract. No such consent is intended by this. The author functions totally divorced from the professional research context, which is oddly automatically inferred from typeset mathematics by nearly every capable reader, perhaps due to the rarity of such research programs. So all that means is he's saying, if I write an equation here and I typeset it, don't take this as me, you know, trying to be academic-y, right? Um, I'm not, I'm just trying to be unambiguous in what I'm writing. So when I had the lecture, I was putting things on the, on the blackboard and I thought, you know, this could probably do with um, some typesetting so that you don't have to be subject to my bad handwriting. So, you know, he's got this lecture, he's got things on the blackboard. It would help if some of the stuff here was like better rendered, right? So, and it actually is a case where um, there's someone who's criticized this and they have transcribed his work from the blackboard in order to critique it and they've misrepresented his work materially. Okay, so where we have in the instance of um, this, where we have these um, things that are in red and blue, they aren't present in um, Weinstein's version of this, right? And so as a result of this, um, what this means is that the critics are misrepresenting his equations of motion as existing in a universe that has only one dimension. Because the way this works, the Einstein summation convention is you use these Greek letters to refer to the rows and columns of a table. And so the red one would be the rows and the blue one would be the columns. And you can see in each of those squares, I've numbered it. And you go with the first letter, red, mu, it will say, um, have that range over zero, one, two, and three, and it will take you down those uh, parts of the table. And then if you say, um, I want to vary the second term, uh, mu, no, sorry, nu, then that's going to be going that way. And that's going to be your blue terms that are going to be in all the columns. So the columns are going from left to right. So um, that's how you get to have 16 Einstein field equations. And you calculate each of them, and then you sum their result. And that is what is expressed by um, that bit of mathematics, which is a thing that is at the heart of general relativity. This is the big equation of general relativity. Now, um, there are these things called the Bianchi identities, uh, which are due to 
this guy here, Luigi Bianchi. And Luigi Bianchi um, worked out there were like six of those um, things I just mentioned, six of those equations, where if you put them together, I think they're in triplets. The triplets ended up cancelling each other out. So there's a triplet here and a triplet there. And the triplets in and of themselves would cancel out um, their contribution to the end result. So even though the uh, individual equations looked like they were yielding a result and weren't coming out to zero, they would cancel uh, with other equations if you've paired them up, if you, you know, um, couple, couple them up the right way into these groups of three. I think that's roughly how it works. And so there's like six of them that you can eliminate because although you could calculate them and they would obviously not add to the result, you just brute force all 16. Um, by, by doing this, it means that you really don't have to do as much work. And so you only need to do 10. So I think that's, I think I've understood that and that's part of something, but I've only been looking into the um, general relativistic side of all of this in like the last two weeks, maybe. Um, so I am, um, just because I've got some names on the screen doesn't mean I know what they're all about. And I was like looking up this guy, uh, Levi Chavitia, like, two, three days ago, right? So um, don't kind of say, well, ask me about this, ask me about that, because I don't know, right? And um, we'll go from here. Um, now, the most important names in the list, to my mind, would be these two names at the top here, um, Enrico Fermi, and Satyendra Nath Bose. So I'm going to type that in the chat and I'm going to say that Fermi is, um, gave his name to something called fermions and they are, they are um, matter manifesting fields. And an example would be um, an electron um or a quark all right so that's like i want you to when i say something in the live chat i'm saying something that's super important and i'm leaving it there so you can refer back to it and that context is there for later in the talk because this is like you need to know this right and then uh, with Bose, he gives his name to something that's called bosons, and they are force mediating fields. And that will be, for example, a photon, which makes up light, or a gluon. And that sounds funny, but literally, gluons glue quarks together. And so you'll have your um, your proton, and it'll be made up of uh, quarks, and they'll be glued together by um, gluons, right? And I've talked about that in previous streams, and I've got into more detail on that, but I don't actually have to say much more about it than that. And um, in this context, and I can move forward from there and um, we're going to come back to any of this as needed in the talk okay and the the talk has a flaw and I'm thinking do I mention it now or do I mention it when he gets to it um, um, I covered it in the last video, so 
I think I'm going to leave it and I'm going to bring it up when he gets it wrong. And then that way it's going to seem like it is a reaction, right? Because this should be a reaction. It shouldn't just have this long introduction. And so this is like coming up to an hour, which is fine. I'm just talking about TV programs and things. And um, why it is that I got into doing this and how I'm appreciative of having had this to think about for all this time because it's helped me mentally rehabilitate myself uh, and I feel a lot sharper. Now, I did look at a video today about spinners and it kind of made me think, oh, I think I might have misunderstood something because I thought that SO2N was equal to SUN like always and they were saying that what were they saying they were saying that um i can't remember what they're saying they're saying something about i think it was so3 and su2 is that it? And they were talking about spin three and S U two. No, yeah, S U two. And that it didn't fit with what I had understood. And I thought, oh, oh shit. And I thought, well, maybe. I've been talking bollocks about um, groups and I don't know what I'm talking about. I thought I'd understood it all. Um, I mean, I don't mean understood it all, but the little bit I know, the scant knowledge I knew kind of like stepping stones across the river um, to get me from one side to the other side without getting my feet wet. I thought, okay, I'm okay just here. I'm not needing to know the totality of group theory and gauge theory. I just need to be able to piece things together. So like, for example, the diagram that's on the screen right now is wrong, right? And actually things are more complicated than that. And I found that out recently. And that's why I made the thumbnail that I did. And then the paper, um, let's see, the paper is, See if I can find it in the paper <clears throat> where he goes off and he says what things are. Is it here? Um, I'm going to leave that there. There. So <clears throat> it's in equation 3.32 on page 24. So this is important, and this is something I had um, missed, and I thought, oh, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, I'd read it all. I'd read this paper probably 10 times, but I mean, you keep reading it, and you kind of, you don't understand certain things, and then you read more things on Wikipedia, and you read them in a kind of shallow way, and then you eventually get into understanding a bit more about it. And certain words then that didn't make sense before now do make sense and that kind of thing. So the important stuff that I've recently grasped and that led me to do the thumbnail, um, our main object to focus would be taken to be so just under the line where it says U6464, there, all of that is actually quite important, right? So it says here, um, he's got a unitary group of uh, U6464 while spinners. So I'm going to write that in, because we're probably going to be seeing that quite a lot.
Now, I might be wrong in saying they're wall spinners. I should have said spinners. Um, a correction with the asterisk. Okay. If I type something wrong, I'll do an asterisk and I'll change that word like that. They used to let you delete things in the live chat, and they don't let you do it now. Um, so, um, now one of the funny things here is, um, I find it weird that he's using the symbol H. All oh, right, I see what he's done. Right, 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 right. Okay, this is fairly obvious. So he has made a mistake here. So, uh, and I'm not getting it, like I'm telling him that he's made a mathematical error. I'm not saying he's made any mathematical errors that I'm aware of. And I've been looking at this quite carefully and I've checked them with books and to my best of my ability to check them um, and looking at the critic's work and finding that full of flaws where the critic was wrong. But in a way, the critic's paper helped me understand some of the issues and was like a pathway into understanding what to try and look at, right? So it was kind of like informative to see him misunderstand uh, Eric's work and for me to understand he'd misunderstood and in doing that that and then and I understood it better than the critic did which meant that I had understood more about geometric unity because it had been criticized so in a way I kind of am thankful that he kind of made such a hash of his critique because if he had successfully critiqued it, that would mean that there was a weakness for geometric unity, and that would mean I'd kind of maybe wasted my time on it a bit. But there isn't one at all. And the critic um, actually made me appreciate I actually knew more about it than I did. But of course, I had to keep going off to do research to actually understand what the critic's paper was saying. Um, and that kind of that kind of discourse narrowed it down in a point of focus, but it's a very, very big paper and it's talking about loads of things, but they're like basically hammering away on more or less one point. And then the other two points they had were irrelevant because they were guessing at what Eric was doing rather than actually paying attention to the lecture where he says what he's doing. He actually says what he's doing in the lecture and they got the wrong, that they went in assuming, well, that I say they, I think it's just one guy. I think the critic is one guy and he's pretending to be two guys. So I think he's invented a co-author that has a pseudonym because it gives him more credibility. Okay, um, I could be wrong, but I th it's very easy to create a soccer account and just you know laugh along and be in a in a um, Discord and have the other guy type messages in the Discord and it's actually you, right? and you're basically having a conversation with yourself and then other people turn up and it's like oh I'm here with Theo sort of thing and it's like Theo doesn't exist, right? Now you can prove me wrong by showing up and saying, yes, I exist. But he doesn't understand a damn thing about general relativity because he leaves out all of the Greek symbols that you'd need for some Einstein summation notation, which then renders the equations to motion of um, Eric Weinstein's um, thing that's sort of similar to the Einstein field equations uh, he renders that so that it's in one dimension. And if you had a universe with one dimension, it wouldn't have dynamics. There would be no Lagrangian because you need to have at least two for there to be even a toy universe where you've got time and space, right? 
So you could have stuff, but it can't have any activity. There's no time for it to happen in. And this static universe, it's like, would be in a circle, right? Could it be like a, a loop of a one-dimensional thing? Okay, imagine a one-dimensional spatial universe with stuff in it. Um, what now? And it's like, where did it come from, you know? How did it come to be? Did it have this configuration? It's even as a concept, it's like without time, you can have no um, origination from any prior state. So um, that's a no go. And if you have it where it is time, but no space, um, you have a time loop, and then it, that will have um no, no no space in which to um have anything happen in it um now that's actually a bit more reasonable because the time loop scenario of a, of a one dimensional time loop um that without space you could possibly argue that's a singularity of sorts but a singularity with time. Um, so um, that one, that one is not quite so silly. But again, it wouldn't have anything in it. So it's kind of like a mathematical concept of a universe that will, you know, you might find in like the Wolfram Physics project, right? Where it's your your bringing things. In that are going to be um, um, you know a toy universe. I mean, people who work on string theory are always dealing with toy universes that aren't the right number of dimensions to have space time with, um, because it makes the math easier. And then they kind of say, "Oh well, as an exercise, you can do this with um, a Lorentzian metric of." Um, you know, one dimension of time and three dimensions of space. And you're like, so um, this thing here, I need to annotate and I need to sort out what's happening that's wrong with this uh, diagram. And this isn't in any way taken to be an attack on Eric Weinstein. This is kind of like, like if I was doing an email, I was doing general feedback. How would I go about putting this in an email? It would be pretty difficult. I kind of almost have to do a video where I kind of say this is where it is that it's um, going awry. So he's acknowledged it's going awry. You can see here it says on complex direct spinners using the notation H is equal to U six four six to four. In what follows, our main object of focus will be taken to be P of H is equal to something which includes H. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. You can't do that because it's going to be like a recursive definition. So what we'll do is we'll have, if it's like a programming language, you can't take something and define it in terms of itself. It's circular. So we'll do that. We'll go here. And we'll put that on screen so you can see where we are with this. And um, I should be able to. Um, that, that's where we want to be. Okay, right. So, oh. Uh, Oh, I know. I'm over here, right? I have to find myself on the tablet. And then I need to, on this, zoom it in on here. It's a bit complicated. So we have the technology. I've got the live stream this. I've got to make it big enough to be seen, you see. So... Um, okay, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to say, I can't remember what color I was using. Um, I should have checked. Um, so I'll go with green. It might be the wrong color, but well, that green might not read very well. Let's see. Um, I think green's okay. I have it look on the stream. Yeah, okay. So we're going to have green for Galois. Have you spelled Galois like that? Have I done it right? Galois. Or is it Gal? No, it's not the other way around. So we are doing that. So we have G for the group because it's in honor of um, um, Everest. Galwa. Now, I checked the paper to see does he use a G elsewhere, and he does, but the G is a script G. So the script G um, is not going to conflict with the G, um, which is uh, being used elsewhere, right? So that's an okay thing to do, I think. So what we're going to do is we are going to say g is being used as the group and that's where we are with that so um we go and look at this thing we say we want p of h to be that and actually this p of h is wrong it needs to be um, P of G because that way it's going to be equal to um, P of um, FR tilde um, and of C77 um, cross um, and he's using this notation above where he's doing that uh, to kind of make it a bit simpler. Um, and that's applied to spin 77. So you could possibly unpack all that and substitute into D, um, U64, 64. So another way of writing that would be to say um, at the bottom of the page, you'd say, uh, let's see, I've got lots of room. I want to have P of G. So this is FR represents the frame bundle. Then we're knocking at the chimeric fiber bundle. And he writes it as C77. But the problem with that is that I'm going to get rid of the number there. The page number got a bit more room, and C77 is like okay, you could write it like that, so it's a frame over the chimeric fiber bundle, but that's kind of I think the chimeric fiber bundle is over Y, if I've understood it correctly, so. Is it not the case that C77 is actually equal to C of Y77? I'm sure I've seen that somewhere um, in like the supplementary slide explainer. And there was something to do with, uh, let's see if I can remember what it was. It was something like dollar and then it was, um, 
Oh, what did he write? It was... Let's go and look for it, because we should be able to find it. Um, and we probably can find it on here by just scrolling through the transcript. So this is going to be in the PowerPoint, I think. And it's going to be here. It's very hard to remember all of this. Then you have that. Yeah, that's it. The thing that's there on the this thing here is apart from that bit there, that would be the same sort of thing. So he has P of something and multiplied by and then he has rho and Z. Interesting he has Z. Has he changed H to Z here? And then he changed it to H. Because was it Z before? And then he's changed it. Could it be that another way of solving the problem would be to change it so that you don't have H equal to the... Um, H isn't equal to U6464. You have Z is equal to U6464. Is that right? Would that be okay? Rather than H. Because in this, um, the line set where it says equation um, three point three one. He's saying I need to have that on screen for it to have context. Hold on. What can I do about that? That screenshot's out of the way. I need to have that over. Okay, I need to have that over that side of the screen. And then I need to have this over this side of the screen and then I need to zoom in on this here no that will cover that up how do I get both on screen at the same time um, I have to have only some of this on screen um, I need to scroll it up oh I can't scroll it up um, Hmm, can I swap it over? That is going to be difficult because that's on top, that floats on top and I can't do anything about that. Uh, I can't change the order of the priority of the window while it's in the mode it's in. So I'm stuck. Um, and that I'm writing, it's writing that at the bottom if I was to write it again at the top, then we'll do that. And then we'll do this. And we will move that underneath here and scroll that up there. Okay, that's better. So I can access this and I can access this and I can zoom in on both. And I can zoom in on this and it will overlay this. So when I do this, it overlays that. And that's our um, observers. Right, okay, that's fine. Now, I now need to make it so that I've got room on this to work. And to do that, I need to bring everything down so that it is I've got more room for the main principal bundle so I've got to work above so what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
make this um, white out here. Because you don't, strictly speaking, need this. And now I've got somewhere to work. And I'm now going to go and uh, clear, clear that up. That's not too bad. And then we're going to go clear this up. All right, so, uh, so I thought the solution would be, if I just do it in black, um, I write what is written, start off like that, P of H is equal to P of the frame bundle, of C seven seven cross and it has this row symbol of D representing Dirac and then H Oh, that's not all that good because I can still see the text screening through. Okay. Now, so that's where we are with what is written um, in equation um, number 3.32. So that's going to be 3.32. And he admits at the bottom of the page that he's using H to mean two things. He's using it to mean a vector space and um, horizontal vector space and a group. Now, I thought, well, I want H to be an H and a V, um, and it's H13 star and V64. I want that to be staying the same because I think it's easy to remember. And that's horizontal hinged and vertical. So there you go. We have those two things. And then I want to have whatever is the conflict. That then means that H being the group has to then um, change. So um reading this out it says for the rest of the exposition we'll let the row with the rack equals row d that's because the convention um which is ordinarily to say that the rack to denote Dirac spinners um, is kind of unwieldy, so he's like introducing a more compact notation, which is this row D. Um, then he says he's defined it in terms of spin 77, seven seven, and we know that that spin 77 seven seven is defining the field that is dancing on um, y77. So you have y77 and that's going to have spin 77 as the field and the field's going to be, ah, uh, can't draw Amiga. The field is going to be Amiga. And so that's going to be um, over on the left. So 
if you see the Y over on the left of the diagram, up left of the screen, it's got an omega there, and that's the unified field of the theory. So we're going to, that's important. Um, I think that that's the wrong color to use, actually. We should use, we've been using this. So everything to do with this, we use that color. And everything we use for X, we use blue for. Um, now, And in the context of this, um, we need to recover X one three. And so we're looking to have, I should think this will be okay, spin one, three, and then we'll cross with spin six, four. And those things are going to hinge into each other. I need to move that other spin further over or the put the cross in between them better. I'll tell you what, I'll put that. Can't seem to get rid of it. It's better than like to erase, is it? I'll just redraw the whole thing. So we're gonna go from left to right, we're gonna go spin. Six four. I don't think it matters which way around these go. Um, if it does, obviously, just a diagram just changes around. Um, I mean, I could just redraw the whole thing and make it so that it's the other way around. Maybe I'll do that. Okay, I'll do that. Um, That's a problem, the ray is too much. Um, okay. Um, right, well, forget about that because it's a kind of distraction from what we really were trying to do. Um, we want H and H to be a horizontal hanging thing, which then means we can't have H to be a group. Is that right? Right, I need to focus over, over on the left. So I'm going to have blue to denote stuff that's happening on the left. So blue for the left. And then the stuff that's on the right, um, this other thing that's from this document is going to be red for right. Okay, now, the thing from the thing with the eyeball, that's going to be written in blue, because it's on the left. 
and we're going to have to run it this it's really complicated looking so that's that and its subscript is this and i think the dollar sign in italic it means spinners then you have c which is a chimeric fiber bundle the chimeric fiber bundle is being given a dimension of two uh, but it's not just a dimension of two it's a dimension of um two to the power of d squared plus 3d divided by four and okay and then that on the same line not subsequent line there's a midpoint there for there the cross product then you can have a out in front subscript row symbol and then you can have on the same line as the p you're going to have a z okay that's fairly horrendous so there's a way of simplifying this where you go off and you say when you're calculating y you need to have some math so why do y as well over here we're going to do the math for y uh, no math for y is um offset so that's going to have the metric on it i don't care about the diagram so i'm not drawing it in so we just do d squared plus 3d as soon as I have my letters lined up and then we have this down here we're going to have xd okay first order of business is to say and he's got like met of xd over here so we're going to have that of xd uh, is equal to that and um, those are your spaces and we can then say we've got a, this space which is going to be there which is going to be where omega is and then we're going to have this space here which is going to be where we have um that will be like a primitive abstract pseudo romanian manifold uh, of d dimensions and it does not yet have a metric and so that has no metric um therefore no time um therefore no uh a grandian um therefore no dynamics okay so it's not really that you can do much with that um and you might say well where's omega come from and why is it written in there we're doing things out of order i'm just trying to draw things in and i um, i think i'm going to do use green for the top line um now so um this um, slide from the um supplementary side explainer um i don't know how it is that he um how this formula gets him to um the value that he wants so but now we've transcribed the thing on the left pretty well we can stop looking at it and we can track over to where i've copied it out here so um now i can zoom on on that and 
that's better isn't it so that's progress so uh that's too far into the corner i'm setting off the screen um that's really in the edge there okay so that's that's all right so now what we oh and it's decided to stop sharing my screen and i've noticed which is good so now i need to somehow see if i can get it to let me share my screen again can i do that whilst i am covering this image um Where's Chrome? I don't need anything on the screen. It's on the screen now. Oh, it's down the bottom there. Okay. I need to have this here. Um, I need to have this over here. This is so complicated. That can go all the way over there now. And this can go here. And I can keep myself on screen here looking at myself to see that it's actually showing the screen, can't I? That'd be easier. Share screen, entire screen, there, share. Okay. So when that disappears off there, and I can see that I'm no longer on this, then I'll be able to see that it's gone wrong. And if I make this zoom on the left again, so I've got a bit more opportunity to see what I'm doing, then it's going to look like that. Um, that'll do. What's a bit at the bottom? Not much of interest, I don't think. Okay, so now um, when that when that disappears, I'll have immediate feedback. I've got a thing here, but I wasn't looking at it. Brandon Landon, do you feel like you're keeping beginning to um, uh, I've got to type a full stop to see the chat. It's useful to have this actually. Do you feel like you're beginning to achieve a sort of big picture understanding of ge geometric unity or do you have a long way to go? Just curious. Um, I don't know how long ago you asked the question. Um, I think I do understand it. I say that I understand, well, I'm not going to give a number, but like a percentage, but I would say that I um, understand it fairly satisfactorily. So um, it depends on how deep you want to get into it. You see, the thing is, I made a single tweet uh, explaining geometric unity for the layman and um um i then was given a direct message by eric weinstein over twitter and initially i didn't believe it was him and then um i didn't know how to use the direct message system and it was all new to me and he was very patient and he was like trying all manner of different apps so we could have a conversation. And what I didn't realize was that uh, what he initially proposed, which was FaceTime, was something I could just use on my phone. And he hadn't made it clear to me that I need to tell him my phone number, right? And that's how the FaceTime will work. And I, I thought, well, I'm okay giving him my phone number. But the thing is, is that what's weird is that I thought I can't have him be no what was it no I thought I need no I the, the truth was I needed to give him my phone number but I didn't know that and he didn't tell me that and I I wasn't going to ask him what his phone number was and I didn't know that's how it worked so um yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, basically, I have skills in IT in terms of programming. I know a lot about that. 
but I don't know anything about the rest of it. So if you say like, you know, video conferencing and Snapchat and all of that stuff, I don't use it. So I'm not on Facebook. I don't have um, FaceTime. I've never FaceTimed with anyone before. It took me a long time to figure out how Discord worked. And I found that one of the hardest things, pieces of software I've ever used in my entire life. And I've used software for many, many years. So um, we went through about four different things. I was downloading apps and stuff in order to get to communicate with them. It all got a bit desperate. And it must have been like more than 10 minutes of struggle, my end, to try and get the whole thing to work. And then, <coughs> and I was able to instant message him. And that part worked, but he wanted to have a, just a relaxed conversation. And so um, I somehow managed to get it to work. And I did like online research to find out how FaceTime worked. Um, and I thought I was going to lose the opportunity of talking to him uh, because I just couldn't figure out the technology. I was thinking curses, you know. So um, eventually um, this website actually tells me. And all the websites I've been reading, I've read five at this point. The website was like saying, what the other websites hadn't said because the other websites assumed you knew how it worked and there were guides how to do it but they assumed that you'd done it before and i was like i need an explanation for someone who's never done it before right so eventually i found one that told me what to do and i was able to connect to him but only through voice and i think he wanted to see me and this software would have been of help probably but I had suspended my um, account with them because I wasn't using it anymore. Um, and it would be like, it would be like, I suspended it like the week before he contacted me. So that was annoying because I, then I would have been able to um, talk to him. Now, I wouldn't have said like, let's make it into a live stream for my YouTube channel. Um, because I think he probably preferred to have a private conversation. So I I didn't say, oh, can I record you when we have our conversation or anything? Even though it would have been helpful for me to record him, even if I was the only one to listen to it. Because by recording him, he was saying things that I basically wasn't remembering. Okay? So, because it's very hard to remember technical jargon that he's saying that I don't yet know and I have no context for and I have no place to put those words. So unless I've got like a photographic memory or eidetic memory, um, it's not very much help. So if you have a recording, you can go off and then say, he said this, that and the other, like double cover. That's one of the things he said. I didn't know what it meant. And I thought, I'm not going to, well, he did sort of explain it. He said it means going around it twice. And I thought, that's not really all that helpful to me. I need more. But I wasn't going to bog down our discussion by getting into a kind of math lecture. And um, ugh, um, so anyway, what happened was, is I made this tweet, which was like back in the days when you, when you didn't have ticks and you only wrote a very short thing. And I thought, I'll probably be all right doing this. But before I did that, I had waited cons considerable amount of time, like two years. And I've been looking on Twitter and I've been typing in Geometric Unity and I've been in various different forums and I've been looking to see if anyone had done an explanation of Geometric Unity. Had there been a video? What was the video like? And if there were videos, they were terrible. And if there were comments, they were negative. And I thought, okay. Um, I'm trying to be patient. I'm trying to wait for someone to have a explanation of it. Then came the critical paper of it. And so I read that. But it wasn't what I wanted because I wanted to have a paper that explained it. 
So that paper made no attempt to explain it, which is interesting, isn't it? And the paper actually didn't understand it. It fundamentally didn't understand it. So um, the, all their criticisms were invalid. So, um, but I did get something out of reading that paper because when I realized how bad it was, I thought, well, for me to understand that that's bad, that means I must have understood something a bit more about geometric unity than these guys or this guy, if it is one person. So one person pretended to be two people is my current theory about the critic. So um, I had Eric on the phone and um, the first thing I said to him, so I, I put up the tweet because I thought no one's doing this. There have been people in the comments under this video, the ones that I'm about to react to, and they said, oh, I wish I understood some small part of this. I'm not looking for an explanation of the whole thing. Um, you know, kind of just a gist of an understanding. And it's unfortunately completely incomprehensible incomprehensible to me and it's kind of frustrating and I thought well yeah um, I'd like to be of help to these people and I started kind of on YouTube kind of responding to them and saying well I think it's like this and then I thought well this is just staying here on the YouTube video no one's pushing back against it saying I'm wrong um, but maybe it could get more traction on um, as a tweet on Twitter. So I thought very hard about what little to say, because if you kind of describe something on Twitter, you haven't really got very many words. And I thought, actually, that's a good thing, because it's like, the less I get to say about it, the less I can be wrong. So I was like saying something like, from a recall, I was saying something like, Omega, oh there's a single unified field omega um, that interacts with itself in 14 dimensions to produce um, relativistic waves in uh, superposition and um, something, 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 right? And so it's kind of like a power graph about how it goes from being um, in in um, how it goes from being here and, and then it goes down to being as a wrong color that how activity that's happening on y ends up um it can have a wave nature but it's a super wave nature in superposition so there's multiple waves they're all probabilistic and they're all happening all at once. And then you can have it be seen as uh, deterministic things that have got, you know, um, a, a, a position or a momentum. And I, and I don't think you're able to determine um, both, but you can determine one or other with things. I'm not sure, but that's essentially uh, your two quantum mechanical things, and that will be your wave particle duality. Um, now, which of these is correct? Um, well, actually, neither of them. Neither of them is correct. These are just way, way, ways in which we think things are. And the ways that actually they are uh, in his theory and actually in quantum field theory is that everything is an excitation in a field. So you have you there a field like a field of glass, but it is a field that's in 14 dimensions. And then out of this area that has 14 dimensions, which we're going to say that we have the principal fiber bundle and we're going to eventually 
have it and we're going to color it in in yellow the principal fiber bundle will be this thing that is in yellow here and so that will be the whole of the principal fiber bundle and then we will pull actually that goes lower than that we'll pull uh, space time out of that and it will be here and we're going to go x and where it used to be four because we go through something that's called the and that this wasn't in my original tweet this is something that's happened more recently there's a whole bunch of gubbins in this chimeric fiber bundle that's part of the principal fiber bundle and it includes something where it goes through horizontal and vertical vector space which is what i have over here and then um the horizontal vector space which is we call this horizontal vector space i have a horizontal one and then we'll have a, a vertical one and the vertical one we can put there but the thing is is that this star means it ends up tilted up so that it tilts up to meet it so it ends up being that against that and that way you can get those two surfaces to talk to each other so that's like that and um, um, it has to go through the fibers so the fibers that would be a fiber that would be going through the fiber bundle and then all the other fibers would be like this but we're not interested in them we're interested in a fiber that is taking information and it's then um this um is then going through these vector spaces and then it's ending up going into like reverse in a sense from how it hinged up uh, it's now in the same point wise relationship with the thing below because this is h13 and it's gonna work with um, x13 but the thing is is this surface is um a horizontal vector space and you'll have something on it like you'll have a vector and you'll have a vector on this which will be like straight let's say and then you'll have your x13 which will be a pseudo Romanian manifold and it will be something weird like that where it's all curved so imagine when you're casting a shadow onto a curved surface, then the blue line won't, the, the arrow won't be as it is there. It will be kind of like that. You get it? And so it will be distorted. And then we will have a thing that will be the mapping of one onto the other. And we will go and do that now. And so we will say, Ray, we'll say, we'll take it from the tip of the arrow. That should be straighter than that. I'll do that again. We'll go. Oh, that's the wrong direction. Hold on. It needs to be from this direction back into X. Now, obviously, what I've done here is silly because I've drawn them upside down. Because um, actually the H is uh, above the X, right? Um, I drew it better in the previous stream. But the thing is, is that this thing, in fact, that's terrible to have done it that way around. Um, Okay, it's not 
going to be too much effort to get this diagram right. What I need to do is get rid of that, get rid of that, and then I need to put the vector space. That's not right, that needs to be straighter. You've got a vector space here, you've got an arrow on it, and there's the arrow. And then this is going to be your horizontal vector space H. And this is before it gets turned, so it's got no asterisk on it. And then that then has your levi chivita connection. Now the levi chivita connection is usually you go from your pseudo Romanian manifold, which has a metric, because Einstein gives it a metric, he selects a metric, and he then goes off and does his stuff to do. Um, uh, general relativity and so that would be um, general relativity to go from a um, pseudo Romanian manifold uh, which is Specifically, uh, one which has got this X13 signature, which is a Lorentzian um, bit signature metric, right? And the metric is time and space. So this thing out in front here, that's time and that's space. Right, so there's a whole bunch of information in there. You might think, well, it's space time. Why don't you put in the metric as three comma one? You can do that, but then it will be in disagreement with all the textbooks which use a different convention. So you have that. Um, I think I've got used to this blue being on the left now, so I can take that out. Um, so all of that is, um, we can't be doing that because he's trying to not lock himself out from doing a, um, a theory of everything. Uh, he wants to come up with something that can be considered a hopeful candidate um, for what a future um, theory of everything might look like. And it's an incredibly uh, qualified statement. Um, so um, he's in the introduction to this video, in the video itself, and in the supplementary slide explainer, and in this paper, he at no point says it's a theory of everything. He's very, very careful. And it's only when he went on the Joe Rogan experience that he says, I think it's a theory of everything. And I wish he'd said, I think it will become the theory of the thing. I don't even mind him saying the, right? Some people say, well, you should have said, I think it's a theory of everything. That's like, okay, lots of people have got them, right? Max Tegmark's got one and various other people, um, you know, so on, so on and so forth. Uh, Garrett Lisi. Um, he he really shouldn't be saying that he got a theory even because that's premature because he hasn't got a theory yet so that's all in the description of this video and so um if you say you use future tense and uh, you um that allows you to um, put things off. So it's like you're standing in front of a building site and there's what's going to be your home and you 
have um, kind of shell of a house. It's all going quite well. The site manager walks up to you and he's got a big smile in your face and he says, well, everything's going great. Uh, looks like you'll be able to move in in the spring. And it's like, you know, it's October. And you're thinking, hey, that's pretty good. And um, it doesn't look like you will because it's like got no roof. There's no stairs. There's no way to get upstairs. Um, there's no electrics. There's no windows. Um, the plumbing's in. Well, it's got all the walls, all the bricklayers been done. Uh, there's a foundation, obviously. Um, the sewage and everything like that, obviously, got dug out and done. There's no garden, you know. <laughs> there's no driveway. All of that's going to have to come later, right? There's no front door, no way to lock it, right? And so it's missing a whole bunch of stuff, but actually the material business of getting a house going and coordinated and the bricks laid, um, that part's been done. And it's pretty housey, right? But it's not homely. And so for it to be homely, you need to have a lot more things done. And you'll need to have, you know, staircase put in. Otherwise, your daughter can't get to her bedroom to sleep upstairs. And you'll need to have a roof. So that's kind of comparable to where we are with geometric unity. The staircase would be the uh, lack of formal definition for the ship in the bottle operator. You have these two spaces, you have upstairs and downstairs. The upstairs and downstairs exist, but they're not that well connected. And the idea is that they could in principle be connected. They're expected to be connected, but it's like, well, we thought we'd had the details on how they're connected in this paper, but we ran up against the deadline basically, and we weren't able to describe them, right? And I think he assumed that he had the notes um, from when he was last working on them, and he went looking for the notes sort of like a month before he was due to publish, and where are the notes? Can't find them anywhere. And probably went a bit frantic looking for them. So um, I'm sorry if he had that happen. Uh, couldn't, couldn't have been very nice uh, to have that happen. But I've had similar things happen to me. I had my programming language and I, I would work on it for 25 years. And then I wanted to install Windows. And I thought, well, I'll install it on another external hard drive. And I plugged in an extra hard drive, and then um, used some unfamiliar software to format it, and it formatted the drive that had all my notes on, um, which is um, 25 years of research. So, you know, missing a few uh, ship in a bottle operator things is like one thing, but losing 25 years of research into programming languages, uh, where I had looked at about 1700 programming languages and written about them all in my analysis, um, in, in attempts to create the ultimate unification of paradigms um that would be the perfect programming language at least for me um that was catastrophic and i said to my mother what had happened and i said the only thing i can think to do is to um try and reconstruct it from memory and i'd been through something like 20 different syntaxes with my programming language and it was all starting to get into a model in my head, what was it that I had the last way that I did it? Because I needed my notes and I hadn't got my notes, right? And I hadn't printed anything out and I hadn't got any backups. So you could say, well, you're stupid. And yeah, like, okay, I'm stupid. So um, that happened. And then 
I went in to do it and I had to uh, tease out all the things that I needed to fix. Uh, and if you're designing a syntax, it's like um, whatever you think you decide to use in order to describe things, um, that then locks other things out down the line, right? And um, you have to make choices after choices. And um, I thought the only way to do this is to be quite slow and um, start in the right position. And I wasn't quite sure where to start. And then have that, whatever you have as your first decision, takes a space of um, possible ways that language can be, and it reduces it to like infinite possibilities to being like, well, finite number of possibilities within certain bound constraints because of the choice you've made. And then the next choice you've made is in part determined by the previous choice you've made. Uh, and as you go down that chain of reasoning and, and choices, the choices have less flexibility and the, the space of possibilities ends up narrowing. And the space of possibilities, in a sense, describes all the programs that can be written in the language. So you're trying to keep that space of possibilities big so you can write lots of interesting programs in it. So once you're doing it, you're imagining all the ways that the different syntax that you've defined allows itself to be combined legally to be able to express statements in a, in a kind of universe of discourse that is the program. And then that then leads into you... Um, being able to say what you want to say that will express a solution to whatever program you, a programming problem you have. And you're dealing with the ramifications of every decision you take and aesthetics and the um, semantics and the practicality of things and how they're going to be implemented because I knew how things were going to be implemented. Um, I, I don't ever think of like a feature for the language that I don't know how it's going to be done. So if I have an idea for that, for me, getting it so that it's done with the right syntax is more important than uh, clever ways of programming, right? That some people say, oh, I've got a great way of doing something that's a programming thing, it's great. And then I have some hacky, ugly syntax for it. I sooner not have the feature and not have that polluting the code and making it hard to read. If I can get by without the thing that they propose that they think is cool, I'll use a language that's simpler like you know, like that. Because I've programmed in machine code. I've not I don't mean assembler, I program literally in machine code. Which means looking up the book that has the assembly language. Uh, in it and then saying here are the things that I want to use in my program write it down on a sheet of paper and then go off and say each of these for the values I'm going to put into it will need to have a, a value that will be a number that will go into memory and then I look in the book and I say well the 6502 opcode for this is going to be this and then the number that will be needed for its parameter will be this, and so that means it goes in like that, and then I go off and create my bytes, and it's not going to be that many bytes, because it's only a small program, and I work out what all the byte numbers are, right, in decimal, and then I poke them into an area of memory, and then I jump to that area of memory and make sure I've got a return um, operation at the end of it, so I'll get back again. And it works first time flawlessly. So that's hardcore programming, more hardcore than assembly language programming that I've done. And so I never get into fetishizing, you know, things that are voguish in programming language circles. Um, because I think, well, you know, 
it, they end up decoupled from um, they, they, they usually end up with syntax that's ugly and the, the thing that you should be bearing in mind when you create something that's a tool is an interface between your intentions that you're trying to articulate you may be not quite sure what you want to a computer's mind and it's an alien mind that thinks very differently from you and it doesn't actually understand numbers you have to teach it about numbers you have to teach about everything and if you teach it wrong you have know, like a malformed type system in it it's going to be operating kind of like mathematics but not quite right so you know like things like floating point numbers don't actually give you the right answers and if you're going to be doing uh, anything to do with finance and you've got some money you don't want to use them right now you know you might not have been told that and you might start bloody using a float to carry your bank account and it's a really bad idea to do that um so there's there, all these things that you need to know the kind of compromises that are accepted by industry uh, because well floats are fast it's like yeah but floats are inaccurate and they're totally inappropriate for what they are purportedly for which is holding decimal values they they don't right they don't hold decimal values. it's a lie right so like if you want to say I'm a decimal type, um, provide it. Actually, do provide that thing. And there are some few languages that do, and they can be used for finance. Um, and if you're doing something where you are happy to have an approximate um, floating point number, then that's that's different. That's fine, right? But accept that that's what it is, and. Um, so all of these things is like you there's two modes to programming one is that you are um, essentially creating a system and you are telling it about things in mathematics generally and you're saying this is a you know integer and this is how it works and this is a real number and this is how it works although they've already got that wrong and you Give all of these things and you're saying like essentially you're saying that a uh, this would be a concrete example a natural number is um a, an integer so if you have something like um if you have something like a natural number that will be an integer and that symbol z, z is after the term zalem in German okay and if you have um, a, a, an example of a, an integer could be like minus 8 but that can't be a natural number a natural number can't even be 0 right so it has to be a positive whole number so we're looking at that and we're saying, okay, we're going to say, um, get rid of the eight. Can't have it be negative. That would be um, an example of a natural number and that would be an example of a integer. And although the integers can have, you know, negative and zero, the natural numbers can't. And that means that you can do something where you can promote anything that is in the set of natural numbers into the set of integers. And in terms of like a Venn diagram, you could say N is inside of Z, right? And then you can go up from there and you can then say, well, you can go further than that. You can say that Z is inside of R, which is the real numbers. And I don't mean the floating point numbers. I mean the proper real numbers. 
and then we can say R is inside of complex numbers, like that, right? And actually, this all comes into geometric unity. But most programming languages that are off the shelf don't even do complex numbers, right? So they're not got their batteries included. Um, they have many deficiencies of things that they ought to do. And they make life really difficult because they don't do these fundamental things. They're like crippled. And so um, part of me making my language is to make it so it is a better language that isn't crippled and it does all these things correctly. Now, if I just did that, that would be something, but that isn't anywhere near enough, right? Um, you could be saying, well, I'm going to make something like one of the earliest languages that ever existed in the 1950s was a language which was called Fortran. And Fortran is actually still in use to say it's actually a very good language, design-wise. And essentially, it more or less does this stuff correctly. I mean, ish. And it stands for formula translation. And so you go off and you have your formula and you have to represent it in the computer code in a different way. And that will be, you know, you might have to say something like this bit here, you couldn't write that, right? You'd have to write it as, we could write D as a variable, but in Fortran, you'd have it. It depends on the thing because it it has a weird thing where certain letters in the alphabet are taken to mean real numbers and integers, right? But you can turn that off. And I think you have to write down uh, no implicit, and that will mean it won't take it that you mean um, an integer by a certain identifier, and that then means you have to then have um, declarations of the types of things. So let's assume all these things have been de declared and D uh, is declared to be the element of the natural numbers. Now that's not Fortran syntax, that's mathematics. Um, in probably should have done that in blue then. But anyway, this here, if you're trying to write it in Fortran, as far as I can recall, it's this, because there's no way of doing subscripts on an ordinary keyboard in the 1950s. And then you have plus and three, and you can't put three directly in front of the D because it doesn't understand. And it can't cope with like A, B, C, D as, as like, multiplication by juxtaposition that does not work so what you have to do is you have to do this and use big asterisk and then go d now you've got a problem which is how do you do the division well the division they haven't got a character they haven't even got that character on the um keyboard uh, back in the 1950s. So you have brackets, you put the brackets around it like that, and then you go off and do a slash, uh, which is used generally to be, uh, say, 17th of January um, uh, 2024, right? So you use it for dates ordinarily, but they were like looking at it and saying that can serve as the division sign. And so the division sign over two, like that, okay? So it's all written out on one line rather than it's all written as a stacked equation. And that's how that is. So that's the difference between computer code and mathematical formula. And that's why it is, formula translation because the idea is you get your scientists who are using this
and you get it to the programmer who is writing it that um, that will be fitting to the specification of the thing that's being worked out right um, and this is hard to read and what would be nice is if you could just write this right so that's part of what I want my language to be like. I want it to not only know about types and do everything properly mathematically and not have logic problems like JavaScript, which actually has bad logic in it. Um, I want it to have um, all of those foundational things done right. Now, um, since this point in time, with what Fortran did, has there been many languages that have tried to do this and tried to make it so you can enter in um, a formatted um, bit of mathematics? Um, practically zero, right? So even though we've got LaTeX um, and we've got word equations and we've got desktop publishing and all of that, and we have graphical user interfaces. Those graphical user interfaces are written in programming languages that can only cope with something that looks like this. Right? And I think that's actually scandalous. Right? So, um, and if you're writing a video game, and you're having to do something that's involving, um, you know, some sort of mathematics to do with matrices and stuff like that, it usually doesn't know about matrices. Usually doesn't. You can't just put in uh, M, N and have the whole thing work, right? Because it will just think that's a variable that's called M, N. It doesn't know that you can do multiplication by juxtaposition. And it doesn't know that you can have types that will be denoting that those things are going to be matrices and that those things are going to be needing special rules by which they multiply. And then they're different from A, B, where A and B are not the same and they are arrays, right? And so they will have a different set of ways of being multiplied, right? So having the, the labels for things be a single letter and then they carry around from the point of their definition, um, the declaration um, type information enriches uh, the way you can concisely communicate your ideas. And then the next step from there is to have extensible types. And then you go off and you have a type that you, your user will create, which will then describe other things in terms of the types that already exist, right? And when you do that, you end up with an extensible programming language which allows you to then express new ideas that will be of mathematical nature. Okay, that then allows you to bring things up to the point of having something that's closer to a given domain. So you have a domain um, specific context. And so it's all based on mathematics. But what you're looking for is you're looking for a way of lifting everything up to be like you've got more of the right types and everything in order to talk in terms of those things. Now, this is happening in geometric unity because it's creating, you know, um, I mean, it's it's built out of things like Lie groups. Uh, Lie group is, is the work of Sophus Lee and um, it's a, it's, um, it's based on the work of Everest Galois. So it's based on the work of Everest Galois. And then that uh, Galois is, is, is work that's basically a set, which I've got over here. This is a set up here. So those things up there are sets, right? And he says, well, a, a group would be, a, a, I'm going to have the idea of the group. And a group G is a set um, with um, operations. 
and that usually then leads you to symmetries and then surface lead comes along and says well i want to have something where the uh thing that i'm working with that the object to focus is going to be something that's going to have a differential manifold so it's it's going to be that and it's going to be symmetries um on that um hold on. symmetries on that di differential manifold right so that will get you to that and then you have emmy nertha comes along with nurse's theorem and she says oh these symmetries here these are actually uh, physical conservation laws so um we can actually uh, say things like we have a law of um of uh, conservation of momentum right as a result of that so just with that alone you like galois lee nertha you basically got your foundations of physics right and if this was like a, a programming language and it's essentially is like a programming language because it's basically you using ideas and you're constructing them so what you're doing with a programming language is it's just you're manipulating symbols and you're saying syntax and semantics is, is a way to um do things that operate on data computationally and that's like that's that can be different from the established um, um, notations of mathematics um, or you can follow all the conventions and you can have it be um, compatible so for example you could say well i'm not that happy with this oh that's not a good idea doing that i'm not happy with um that's not going to work if i do that i'm going to have to do where it says z i'm going to put in a change and i'm going to change it to i because i think i know better and i think that's going to be you know for integers i have integers that's going to be more memorable but then if you know more about mathematics you'd know that there are imaginary numbers right so like what, what symbol do you use for the imaginary numbers but i mean you could critique at mathematics as a design you could say well um when you have the quaternions um you'd expect them to be q right because everything would be like a quaternion would be a Q letter, so that would be a quaternion. And that the problem is with that is that no, it's not a Q, it's an H. And you're thinking, why the fuck is it an H? And it's because the guy who came up with it was called Hamilton, William Rowan Hamilton. Now, none of the others are named after anyone, right? Unless the Zalan is. I don't know that it is. So he somehow got his name in there. The Octonians aren't named after Mr. Octonian because there's eight of them. So he could have called it um, Quaternions, right? And Q for Quaternions. And then you might say, well, when you have fractions, like you have three over two um would that be um what would that be and um that is not f that is um q and that's really confusing 
that they've picked a letter that you'd think would be for the Quaternions, and they've made that be for um, the Rationals. And you're saying Q for the Rationals. Wouldn't it be better to say R for the Rationals if they're going to be called the Rationals? And then the Reals, we could call them... Uh, I know, we'll call them the decimals, right? So the decimals change that, the I become the that, the um, this um, quaternion is replaced that, that is replaced by, um, we're going to call them rationals rather than fractions, we're going to do that because they are things like pi is irrationals and then you realize oh i can't use i for this because i've used you know because i've got irrational numbers so i don't know is the irrational numbers written with the i i can't remember Anyway, the whole thing is kind of a bit of a junky mess and it's cultural and it's artifacts of culture and things like that. So that, that isn't perfect in and of itself, but it has more provenance than traditional um, establishment in how it is. Much as like X13, you might think, wouldn't it be better if it was written like that for space time? You're thinking, yeah, it really would be. Well, it, you can't help it. That's how it is, right? So the thing is, is that you're creating a programming language and it's like manipulating all these symbols. It could be any way you like, right? You know, if you're using something like C, you're going to say int um, I. It doesn't have to be I. It's equal to three. And then you're going to say float. Um, F is equal to um, 4.0 and that sort of thing, right? And then you have to put semicolons at the, to terminate all the lines, otherwise it freaks out. And it, it's kind of abbreviated. You, rather than you saying integer and um, uh, floating point like that right which would be like a lot to write um but you could have a programming language where it was just um there like that now the thing about that is that like, that's a lot tidier and once you've learnt the notation it's a lot better but the next thing is okay so you have this thing where you have it and it's doing that and you don't even need the semicolons because you're using the the new lines at the end of the line to put things on a new line. And if you know anything about programming, you don't want to have two things on the same line. So if I was to move that so it was like that, and I put that there, that's, we can do that in C, right? That's perfectly legitimate C and it, it ends up being, um, I think that's right, the, the lines end up being um, separated by the semicolons. Well, um, you might have something and it, you, you start reading a line and you, um, you think, um, I think that's as big as I can make it, hold on. 
if you start that and you read it like that, you might think, okay, and you think you've seen it all. You keep going and reading, but you don't want that. You want to uh, know about everything that's happening on that line, right? So it, you don't want to have more than one idea on the same line when it's sometimes doing logic and stuff like that. It It's bad. So um, um, it's better discipline to have everything given its own line, uh, books on, the presentation of code like it, like that. And um, that isn't a particularly good example, but it's, it's like a simple example. And then having it so that you put the type after the name is better because the thing that you're interested in is the, the name of the thing that you're working on. And then you say, you know, uh, name um, syntax is basically the name um, uh, such that, um, and then we have the type. And the bits that are in black are the bits it's looking for, for um, whatever you have, and then you have a, um, it's going to look for possibly a little, but it could be that it would be any value. So I suppose I should change that to a literal or a value. But I suppose it would be a little or symbol. Yeah, a little or symbol. So the symbol would be like another thing. So you could say, uh, I could write another line and I could say, I could say, I could have G is equal to R, where R is equal to I. And that would be okay as well. And it would make sense of the fact that I was giving it the wrong type because as we've already established, everything that is um, an integer is also a real. So you can put an integer inside a real and it doesn't complain. And what would happen is it would just represent three inside of this as, as if I told it that I wanted it to have 3.0. So that would be the case of exploring that part of the syntax, right? So the bits that it's using to know what's going on are this bit here and this bit here. And it's hunting for that. And then it's wanting the things that are either side here and here and here to match those categories. And so um, that's all how you write a programming language, basically. Um, and design wise, it's better to put the name out in front, because that's the thing that's user focused. And that's the um, thing that the value they're interested in. And they are interested in the types of things that they're working on when they are making them and they're not interested in the types after that point right so, i mean you can look back at the declaration that when you've done the declaration if you were to hover in an integrated development environment over say g and you put your pointer on it then in many environments it would kind of come up with a pop-up which would be um, and it would come up below and it would say something about it and it would say what this is so it would say g is a real and it will say maybe what this value is so um it would go um See real value 
um, which is equal to um, 3.0. Like that. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, you could spelunk all your stuff with what that is. And in the terms of geometric unity, um, if that worked in geometric unity, I could now hover over this and it would literally go, draw it in, in red here, I'll put in the pointer, then I'm asking it, what is that? And I'll move the pointer out of the way now, and it will go, and it will say, have a little pop up. And this is something the LaTeX doesn't do. It'd be nice if it did, and it would go, So that would be depending on how terse you wanted it to be, it could either be that, which would just indicate it was real numbers um, in the fourth dimension. And that's probably not that helpful to the average person. So depending on how you've got your editor set up, it will go and it might say, uh, this is a pseudo um, Riemannian manifold as a hyphenate and then but you need it to say how big it was so um, it would need to say that as well and then you have to extend this this way And then we go so that wouldn't be hyphenated and that wouldn't be so those would parameterize that thing um yeah Or you could have it be the other way around. You could say a pseudo Romanian manifold of four dimensions, which suppose that would be okay as well. So you put that, you wouldn't have that part first, you'd have that part second. And you go of four dimensions, and then you're reading it as it's written. Um, it's a bit less. Um, a bit unconventional to do that but that would be um, and then Y would be a, an Erismanian manifold um, which would be with a split signature metric you're running out of room you see and you have to say seven seven 
so um that's that's a lot to fit there but it wouldn't be there it would be underneath wouldn't it it would be on the line below so if i put that there and i put that there i have that as the thing that's going to be put in there then i drag that then that would kind of go under that when you put the arrow on it um so so that would be a kind of like a form of latex that would be one which would um give you things when you highlighted a term it would it would know what it was it wouldn't just be dumb text um because the thing about latex is it doesn't know what anything is you're telling it here are some glyphs and uh, it doesn't enforce anything so it doesn't have anything equivalent to um um a program that used to be on involved with the C programming language which was called lint there is no lint for latex where it's a semantic lint um and there's no way of having um intentional programming and i'm not sure but i think um wasn't charles simone involved in intentional programming the feeling it was which is interesting because he's the one sponsoring the lecture at oxford so um i think it's charles simone and i thought his work he did on that was very interesting as a um you know personally as a um uh so the idea of intentional programming is you're saying this is what my intention is and you convey that in some formal sense and then you get into writing your program and it's able to check with your stated intention of what you meant to do and then the code is then um uh, intention and that it's then um the code you write is then judged in accordance with the um the, the, th the thing that you said you were intending to do. And there's other languages and they do other things similar. There's Eiffel and um, Eiffel is, um, Eiffel has contracts, or I should say designed by contract. Um, has various things like invariance in it and it's not the same thing as intentional programming but it's similar and then the guy behind the original guy behind latex um who came up with tech right this tech came before latex uh, that guy uh, donald nuth um he uh, that's his name, Nuth, and he created Tech because he was having trouble getting his documents uh, the way he wanted them. When he went to try and publish them in academia, and he was wrangling with the typesetters, and he thought, "Good, if only I could have like a programming language that would do typesetting, then I could write that program, and then I could send off to the typesetter." with the image file that it had generated and then they would then um you know do that right and he came up with more recently uh literate programming and uh, literate programming is where you have um your um documentation um is of your 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 comments are like much more than just comments and um, when you say something in a mathematical way and you say 
when you introduce something and you say something like um, we will let something something then um, it's semi-formal here but it would be more formal with his stuff so it would be um, do that and we get rid of everything I've done and Um, I think I might have to redraw all of this. Yeah, it's basically I've kind of messed up the whole page. I'm like, there's no way that I can't. I'd have to redo the whole thing. Um, Yeah, there you go, that's cleaned it all, all off. And there's a bit at the bottom, don't want that either. So, let's see if I can do this and not get distracted. Um, so what I'm looking to do is, see, this is the thing. I'm thinking like I'm, I was talking. What I'm looking to do is, that's intentional programming. I'm looking to go and I'm making this so that I have room to write out this thing with a different notation. So shall we just state that? We will state our intention. I'll do blue so I can see that I'm doing it. So the equation I'm trying to rewrite is 3.32. And The right number, yeah. And then we will reference here, um, it said clarity. I need to make sure my handwriting is clear. Okay, we'll redo that for clarity. And I'm going to reference the same footnote as him to say, like, why? Why am I rewriting it? And you read the footnote and you find out that, um, where's it gone? There we go. So we go, we've got the main principle bundle. And the intention is to rewrite the equation 3.32 for clarity. So, um, uh, why would that be the case? And it's like, well, you look down at the note here, and it says here, the symbol H is being used to denote two different objects, a group and a horizontal vector space. Horizontal vector space doesn't appear on this page, but I want to keep it so that that is stated as H. And he says, this is unfortunate and may be rectified in future drafts. So my intention is to make it so the horizontal vector space is H. Um, so that means um, Uh, 
Okay, that's simple enough. We now find that. Now, to have unambiguous namespace, we need to have it so that H can't be also used for something else. So where is it doing that? It's doing it in equation 3.32. So we write that out just to see what we're dealing with. We've got P of H. As soon as we've written H, that's wrong. And then we've got FR tilde C seven seven um cross row h uh that's wrong that's in the wrong place that should be higher up that should be on the line and that should be a, a, a subscript out in front oh and it should be subscript d there okay now everywhere it says h is a problem these are conflicting with the namespace so what do we do and um we need to think of another name so the problem i have here is is it a problem that we've got h twice Is it a problem? Because if P of H is equal to, um, let's just change P of H to something else. We'll change that to be um, the um, Won't let me erase things. Okay, we're now going to come in with our change. And the change we're going to have, which we're going to put in green, so it's clear that what we've done, we're going to call it G in honor of Everest Galois. So the group. It says the conflict was between a space and a group we're going to call group G. But should this also be called G? Because is it confusing to define something G that's also involving G, G? What would that be like if that was also G? And then I look at the thing he has where he has the um, image of the, I had it drawn up, the, the image of the, um, this, and it's like, ha, huh, interesting. So we need to copy that out again. So if we go and look at that, then we're looking at that one, which is essentially the same thing. And we look at that, and this is P subscript. And instead of the group G, it's got all of this. It's got U and then dollar sign in italics. And then it's got C representing the climate fiber bundle to a dimension. And I'm going to call that dimension um, U. I'm going to call that dimension a small letter U. And then that's just going to tidy things up. Is that right? Is that what I want to do? Um, M. Yes want that to be you and then I'm gonna say um, 
because I'm not interested in how, how this is exactly. And then it has Z. I like Z as being the name of this. And so we have that. Now, um, I would have thought that this here, oh, damn, that thing there should not be G, but it should be Z. So maybe it should be Z. And while we're about it, I think where it says Dirac earlier, I think that's clearer. So rather than having to say down here, we will let Dirac equal to something Dirac. I don't mind writing out Dirac, right? So if you were running through the paper, if you have a program and you go off and you have a declaration, you have to say a def definition or something of something, then you have to find i is equal to square root of minus one or something. Then you have much further down in the program, you have um, i. You won't necessarily know that i was defined that way uh, because it will be off the screen uh, if you're only looking at this section here. So um, it helps if you have something unusual for it to be defined um, in place. And I think this is um, one of those cases. So it's some of the time you want something concise and you want to kind of use like types to hide, hide information. Because I there was a programming language called basic and you if you wanted to put something inside of a string, you would say a dollar. Like that. And I think if you wanted to put something inside of an integer, it was this. And um, it worked fine, but all of these decorated um, things, um, I mean, it helped because it told you what the things were and what their types were. And it also served as their type declaration. So instead of saying, you know, declare this thing as being an integer and have to say int and everything, you just put this symbol next to the letter and that would be it. So it was uh, good for people to learn programming with. And um, you could say that it has influence on other languages like Perl. Um, now, if we get rid of all of that, Right, I'm thinking getting rid of the Dirac thing uh, where here is that because that little D by itself, if you read that on its own, it's like, well, I need to see the definition where it says from now on we're going to be using this. So I think that's probably a little nitpick. So I'm, I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to get rid of that I don't think that should be G. Um, I'm if I'm wrong about this, I'm wrong about this. If it is G, fine, use G. But I'm thinking of using Z because it's Z here, right? You get row Z, and I can't see why this can't be row Z. So that's what I'm going to do. So we're going to do that, and then we're going to get our white. We're going to rub out all of this.
All right. So now we put it in. We restore this. And we need to have it be. H with enough root, no, not H, Z. Now, instead of writing it like that, he wants it to be more explicit in his paper. So we're going to do that there. We're going to write that there. Okay. That seems to be okay. So that is saying, I've made a slight change here. And I've made a change here. And obviously I've made a change here um, to a, from H to um, G, where G is now the group. And I think that's well formed. Now, the thing that he uses at the top left-hand corner of the screen to create all this math, uh, we could look at that now, and we can say, can that be done differently? And we say, well, possibly, if we're going to go, uh, that's not going to let me do it. Um, if you, we don't need all this stuff below now, we could wipe that out. So we're going to do that and we'll build what we're working on into this thing. Because we've got an observers to draw and we have uh, that surface here. Oh, that's wrong. I mean, it could be thicker like that. We have that would be one thing. And then we want to have this be the thing. And then I don't know whether the um, that one is um, anything. So we we'll do that like that. So those are your spaces. And in this, we have... Um, XD. So this is from the supplementary slide exponent. And then we have Y. Oh, wrong color. Um, we want to have the other color. So we want to go back. We want that to be the, the purple color. I find color coding things helps. Um, a way of reducing the complexity of things. Now, the Y with that formula there, you could write that in, but I've not been doing that while I've been um, writing my YouTube comments. So I've been doing that. And this thing of writing metric, blah, 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 I just explained what that is. So that means all that stuff I don't have to write. So then you have the bit at the top. The bit at the top is a bit of a nightmare. Um, and this thing with the chimeric fiber bundle, I mean, it's not mentioned in the frame bundle at all. So I wonder what's going on with this. But it's not saying, it seems to be a bit scant on information even though it's that complicated. But let's just um, show how this is supposed to work. So um, we go and define M. So we're gonna say M is equal to, and then we do the formula. So rather than D squared plus 3D over two, we go D, squared uh, plus 
3D over 2. And you can write that in the YouTube comment because you can do superscript. Um, so that's where that M term comes from. That's there. And then you're looking for N um, as well. So you're looking for, uh, it seems a bit silly, but this is necessary. N is equal to M over 2. And that's because you're, what you're doing in that formula, um, where it's divided by 4, um, I've now alluded it to being just U. What you're doing there is you're taking this formula that was used here, and you are making that be um, halved. That's why it's now d squared plus 3d over 4. And it took me a while to figure that out because the subtraction is no longer uh, clearly happening to a thing. It's baked into another number. And so I thought, why is this now 4 rather than 2? And I, it puzzled me for some time. So to clarify things, it's better to have this extra step with n and then say, um, then say you're creating u and the size of the space, and this is a dimension, not a power, this is a dimension, is to say, what is the size of the dimension? And the dimension is going to be u, so we're going to do that. And u is going to be equal to 2 to the power of n. So uh, whatever xd is, d has to be a natural number. And um, that's it. That's, that's the whole thing. So that gets us from... Um, for any, I think we'll say it will be greater than, what shall we say, greater than two, greater than, there's probably some lower bound on what number it can make sense at. But I don't know if it's just from one, whether you can have a one dimensional thing in this and it would make sense. So I don't know if it's from a lower bound. It's not mentioned. So if there is one, um, then you need to say it's like natural numbers, but natural numbers starting at three or four or whatever, then that needs to be in there. You know, if it is, it has to be from four and above or whatever, then do that or equivalently do it so it's, because greater than three will mean four and five and six, right? So that all works. So I don't know whether that's a restriction. Um, so we've got that. So the D that's here, see how the numbers work. As the D is an actual number, so that means that that has to be an actual number. That then goes into this and into this, and that then makes m and that then gives you the m and then the m ends up over uh, specifying the number of dimensions of y and then the um, m it reappears as being something that needs halving in n and then um, um, which we could do by saying um, Like that and then the n goes in like that and then that ends up with the u and then the u ends up 
um, as the size of the dimensions of the chimeric fiber bundle, which is what this is. And I don't know whether this is just to kind of simplify things. Because the thing is, is you look at this here, and that there, um, I mean, I know it's split. If it wasn't split, it would be C14, right? If you go off and then, maybe it's only when it's split that you put it in the frame bundle. But if you do put it in the frame bundle, then that would not be enough here. So you'd need to have it inside of a frame bundle as well. And then that would mean that would then be um, C um, to the power of U. And so you'd be looking to write something else. You'd be looking to write C to the power of U, um, which would mean that it would be like 14 would be an example there. And then you'd be looking to say, um, and I'm going to ask it to be in the frame bundle of that with the double cover and I'm going to be if this is the correct notation I'm going to be putting it inside of spinners and then that's going to be inside of a structure group uh, which is oh damn it this is going to be oh crap just want white What? Oh, I keep tapping the wrong thing because I've moved where the palette is. Uh, I'll move it somewhere else. Okay. This is ergonomics 101. Don't change where all your tools are because you'll habituate to where they are. Okay. 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 That's better. All right. There we go. So we're doing this, right? So this frame bundle um fr that the dollar sign is uh right we've done all that we need you as a structure group then we need to have red again that's just to erase one thing and we need to do all the stuff that we have up top there and we need to write that again so this is going to be uh, mid this leave plenty of space have that there and then go um we'll go row and then we're going to go to rack like that which kind of encroaches on the xd which needed to be lower in fact, that all needs to be rewritten because it's like all in the wrong place, really. Okay, so if I'm going to have a problem there, I'm going to have to move XD, which is okay. I can do that. It's not the end of the world. It's going to take a while, though. Maybe I can just erase it. And it's easier to erase and then put white back in than it is to do the other thing. So we got that. We go row. The row is going to be subscript row. So this is the line here. And then that's in the wrong place. See the line that everything's happening on. Uh, 
a line that I'm trying to draw everything on is there. And then I need this to be there. So let me estimate the space to the Dirac. And that was going to be like there. And then that means that cross term was too high. Damn it, I've erased way too much. Oh, it's massive. The eraser I was using is huge. Right. That's better. I'll put in the cross term in a minute. So that is, that Z is sort of a bit low, but uh, it's not really quite high enough, is it, to match the U on the opposite side. If I had a line above it, it makes it more obvious what the discrepancy is. It should be, it should be similar. It's not quite there. It's be a bit taller. We fudge it, make it like that. That looks a bit better. And we'll expand that out which ways. All right, so we now need to do the Dirac thing, and that's going to be like that, and then this is midline. Here, something like, oh, that's too far over to the left. Now, in LaTeX, you just write this all in LaTeX with kind of commands, and you it would do it beautifully, and it would all be spaced correctly. But it would be a bit of a pain to type this in, but you could do it. Um, I think putting the tilde above the FR would be a little bit tricky, but anyway. Um, and of course you could do all of this with stacked numbers if you really felt like it. Now, another thing I was looking into was that is it, um, well, I mean, essentially I've done it, haven't I? Because I've said the size of CU where in, in his example u ends up being seven seven yeah um so you have d equals four um and we need to put an x four there you go um <clears throat> Oh, not, well, X4, I mean, it's not X4, it's XD, isn't it? Now, are we done? Well, this improves what was in the notes on this supplementary slide explainer. However... We're not done because, can we delete this? Um, I don't think we can delete the black lines. Um, probably not. I'm gonna try it, see what happens. Object eraser. Right, not great. That's not what I wanted. It's deleted the white, but no. I will go back to where we were. It's not like this, this is quite a nice little paint box thing, but it doesn't have layers. <coughs> um, it would be nice to have like, when you do undo and layers, it's essentially the same thing, right? So, um, 
you go off and you draw something on top of something on top of something, and then you want to be able to remove one of those things. Um, and it's a series of cumulative uh, operations on it, on something, isn't it? Um, so, I mean, if I draw something, that's the first mark I make, and then I go off and make a second mark, and I make a third mark, then I might want to get rid of, I can only undo them in the order in which I drew them. Right? But with layers, I can do more than that. So what would be nice is if I could say, I want to, in general usage with undo, I'd like to be able to just grab layer two and move it. Um, or you know, select it and delete it. So when I have in the past drawn a black line, I was like, don't need that now. And there's no easy way of getting rid of it without, um, if you object to raise it, then it erases the white that was behind, which is this blue, blue thing. So um, that exposes the text behind. So that's no good. That's not what you want. Um, I suppose you could say, why don't you just have a color erase function? That would do. So you go around and you say, everywhere that I tap in this general connected area that is red, and then this specific kind of red, get rid of it. Um, but what's it going to replace it with? Um, hmm. that might be a way for it to work though you could possibly do that there's a way of specifying things uh, it should also work really with you know just drawing and drawing on top of things with the same colour um See, the thing is that the layers system is expecting you to say that you have a layer and then you move on from there. So as an interface, you would say in, in terms of layers, you would go, I have a layer, that's layer one, and then you go off and have another layer that ends up on top of that layer, which is drawn beneath it. So there are two, and then you have a layer three. And then you can do things like you can say, I hide this layer, or I delete this layer, right? Or you can move the layer, or rotate the layer, you know, all of those kind of things. So if you don't want to have the administrative vector is administrative uh, add minus trivia of layers but you have undo is there something you can do that will be like a kind of hybrid of the two you want to add to undo so it's not just only allowing you to just get rid of three before you can then get rid of two. All right, what if you had time and it already has that in the undo. Everything you do is happening in time and it knows the sequence of the operations and then it has a sequence of operations here in time. And until you get fancy with your layers, that's the way it is with the layers. Then you go off and say, I want to go and delete or move or hide two. 
So then you go and you rewind time and you rewind. And then that gets you back to the point where you just had um, the blue one um, because you wanted to get rid of it. Um, now, having got rid of it like time reversal, I never meant to put in the red or I never meant to put in the black lines, right? Changing history to, from that point onwards. So you've got the, the equation, the black lines you get rid of, and then you move forward. You're moving forward without this and it retains what you did after. The future from this point of view exists. So the problem with undo is that in going back, it loses what's in the future. Now, actually, it does have it because if you do redo, it knows that it's there. But as soon as you start committing new changes, all the stuff that's in the un redo stack is got rid of, isn't it? You can't, once you do new stuff after an undo, then say redo, and that redo stack is still there. And why is that? Why Why would you want to get rid of it? Why not just shunt the operations from the point that was the future from the point that you reverse back to? Why not have those future actions still be in your future and if you want to redo into them have it be that they show up again right so like if i do something and i go i have made a mistake um Then I go off and I then keep going. But I learned from it. Okay. Bit of Jordan Peterson there. Then if we go back to the point where I made a mistake and you get rid of this I can go forward from here and I can reinstate that with redo and everything else is still there right however if I go back and I say something else I say cake, the option to go forward with redo isn't even present, it's grayed out. So it is got rid of my future, even though that information is still there. So you don't want it to get rid, you want redo to keep the stuff you did after the point that you went and did your edit. I don't really see why you would want to get rid of it. Now that, that's that's interesting to me for uh, GUI designs purposes because that's so much simpler than layers. Um, and you might have it be that you uh, have the sequence of operations you do and then in doing a sequence of operations, you could maybe have a way of selectively um, selecting contiguous in time selections. So rather than say, I need to select cake, which is maybe difficult to select as a thing, as an object. And it might be, it ends up selecting this as well, right? 
because it's like you clicked on it and it ended up selecting all sorts of other things as well. Maybe what happens is you can select, you select E, K, A, and C as you um, head back in time with it being like a one-dimensional thing where you're saying everything I do, um, every gesture I made, and I want to select all of that stuff, and then I want to, so I'm selecting in time, and then that allows me to select those things and then do stuff with it, like move it somewhere else. So we're talking about time editing. And it basically what you have with Final Cut Pro, isn't it? So Final Cut Pro has a timeline where when you um, take things out of the timeline, um, the rest of the thing to the right of it closes up into that space and so you remove that and it snaps in uh, like a magnetic uh, thing and it's really nice because it keeps it tidy and it's way better than premiere so um all we have here is time going this way whereas here we have time going this way so it seems as if there's some commonalities in the interface and it's just a question of orientation and there might be a way of having different types of information in your system uh, be handled um, with a type system that knows about dimensions so what we're looking at is saying you know you have the Lorentz symmetric and it's x one three maybe you could have a data structure which would not only be, be able to cope with three-dimensional information but be able to cope with one-dimensional temporal information because everything that's a movie will be a movie will be m one two where the two dimensions will be um showing you know have this dimension and this dimension and then there'll be you know, Jason Statham doing some action, right? Oh, that's not Jason Statham. There, Jason Statham um, shooting a gun at someone, right? So, um, and the activity there, the time is a bullet being fired as happening in time. And so there's like lots and lots of these frames of Jason Statham firing the gun and kicking people and stuff. And then that will be the temple stuff. So that is a type descriptor of a movie. And it could work, and it would also work for a GIF, because a GIF will have multiple frames and it will play maybe in a loop. All right, okay. I've got something out of this for me. Um, so this is the presentation of, I mean, I think about this stuff a lot, you know, user interface design, uh, presentation, all of that stuff. So um, I'm, I mean, I went, went to art college, they kept wanting me to do graphic design. And I thought, nah, I want to do fine art, uh, painting and sculpture. Um, but I, I find the graphic design stuff very, very easy to do. And um, it's a thing I'm probably best at. And it's so easy that um, I don't value the skill in a way, uh, which might be a bit stupid of me. Um, so... Um, but this is a, something I've applied to my programming language and the design of that. Now, the syntax of a programming language 
and you say we're going to make it so we're going to make the programming language have a syntax which is on one level um traditional that's terrible you can write better than that want it to be traditional math notation all right and so you go off and you do that and you make your syntax be traditional math notation and that would for most people be a um if you really took on the spirit of mathematics, it would be of a um, you'd have it being in a declarative paradigm, right? And what that means is that once something gets given a value, it stays that value and it can't be changed. You might think that doesn't have a lot of utility, but that's exactly how math is. And when they call things variables, they're not really varying. So once something gets a value, it is that value. And if you reuse the equation and you're using your variables again, that's a different question you're asking of all of those symbols. And so they all go back to being I don't know what value I am other than I am G, I am C, I am Z, right, or Z, right, I am P. They don't know what they are until they're defined, other than the labels that they are. So you ask, you know, what is X? And it will say X. But then you say X is now equal to 3. And next time you say, what is X? And it's going to come back with um, not X, but it's going to come back with a value 3 because it now has a definite value. But you can't then say, I want X to be equal to 4 because it's now got a value and that's going to be an error. All right? So that's um, the only vestige of what might be called functional programming um, that is desirable. And the problem with functional programming is it is a big agenda language, or big agenda sort of programming cult, where they go off and say, we've got an idea, and we think that we can make um, things with this idea of programming without what they call side effects, no side effects. Um, and everything is a function. Okay, so it's like, great. So you can make your programs like that. And there's things like, for example, Haskell would be an example of this. And Haskell has a very tricky type system. And it doesn't have types that look like this. Right? Or like this. Right? You think it would, given like how hardcore it is. Um, but they didn't even make the effort. So it's like, well, okay. Um I think there's a language called Z, which is a formal definition language. And I think that might use this, and that would be in the language Z. Um, and I think I've seen it in the language that never got released. Um, that cost something like $3 million. And that's called Fortress, which is a, a successor to Fortran. And they threw money at it and they, um, banked on uh, releasing it on the uh, Java virtual machine and then they couldn't get the Java virtual machine to do what they wanted it to do and then I think they wanted to do kind of concurrency on it and it wasn't suited 
and they'd already committed to the Java virtual machine. And it's kind of like, well, that's embarrassing. Um, so, I mean, it's a pretty good language and they've got lots of good ideas in it. But if you, part of the problem with relying on other people's stuff is, you know, like a virtual machine, um, is it could let you down. So anyway, you have that and that's the syntax and you're describing the low level stuff um, in math and then you're taking something that is the computer and you're doing um, what's called, um, how can I make this really stand out? I have to use a really big paintbrush. I'm going to do, um, oh, that's way too big. I could use that as a background. So we had that, and what we're doing here is we're doing we're doing bottom up programming. That's like starting off with, you know, machine code as designed by the hardware engineers. And then you're saying, well, let's make some assembly uh, opcodes that will make this a bit nicer to use. And then someone comes along and says, well, you don't want to be using assembly. You could use something that almost exactly maps to assembly. And then you move on from there. And Someone says, well, we could make something that knows a bit about mathematics, so you don't have to do all that every time from scratch. So we're going to implement the type system, and here's a language called C. And so everyone thinks that's great. They think that's pretty well close to, you know, the metal, as it were, although it isn't. And there are other languages have come along since then called Zig. And Zig is actually lower level than C, but higher level than Assembler. Um, so the fact that C has got a preprocessor is a problem. So uh, if you get rid of the preprocessor, if you get rid of a few other things, strip strip it down a bit, and you end up with something that's closer to assembler, and it's kind of like a one-to-one -one correspondence. So you want to, there to be a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence and no surprises, really. Um, and oh, the way one way around that no surprises thing is you could say, well, I want there to be a well-defined context. So I um, well-defined context, and then that leads into another idea later which is a form of this idea, but you're establishing it now. And the form of this idea is an idea from Rebol, which is, let's have dialects. So there would be a language which would be, um, as it is in natural language, you have different um, jargon and you use jargon in different contexts. So you go to the doctors and they're like speaking a special language within their own group of doctors about the patients and they're using technical terms that you're not privy to. I watched this uh, thing and um, it's the same. <coughs> you have to be clued in to know the language. So it's all English. You know, English is a big thing with a big umbrella. And if you're just looking at mathematics, it's not even mathematical physics, it's going to be these things and they have these meanings, right? And you can have a situation whereby you have something that has a given set of semantics and a given set of syntax, and you can have something that looks just like it and it has the same syntax and it goes off and it means something totally different. So... This is something that happens when you allow yourself to have your 
language redefine the syntax on you. And you might think, okay, that sounds really unders undesirable. So that would be something like the C preprocessor. which was then used to create the C++ preprocessor. And then out of that ended up making C++ horrendous, horrendously overcomplicated. Because it went through a, a thing where it was initially, it was a C, C, pro, C preprocessor ended up being um, a language called uh, C with classes. Um, and um, they made C with classes out of C with the preprocessor of C and extended it naively. And then it wasn't like a bona fide anything really. And then they went off and then made C++ and they gave themselves uh, a bit more kind of like latitude to change it. And then that led to them um, having C++ be incompatible with C, which is kind of like, but defeats the whole point of programming in C++. Um, I think C programs will run in C++, but I don't think, well, the other way won't work. Obviously, the other way won't work. This is a superset of the other. But there are, C, you know, there are C programs that don't work in C++, which is like unforgivable. It completely defeats the object of that. You might as well have made a different programming language which didn't have the faults of a language which was designed in 1972 by two guys um, who didn't really know much about design. So... That was that set back computing decades. John Strustrup has ruined computing with C. It's a disaster. It's being used in Windows, being used in practically every video game. It's holding back and creating costs to development around the world. It is a major, major, major problem, right? Um, the amount of lost productivity from the existence of C++ and its invention is just, you know, it's terrible. It's such a pity. Um, and other people come along and they create things like, hey, look, I created a language, it's called Haskell. And it's like, yeah, and it's like totally something you can't use for anything, right? Uh, you, you can't use it. It's got... It, it, you can't make programs with it very easily. So it's so rigorous, it doesn't let you do stuff. So it looks on the surface of things, anything that allows you to um, change the meaning of things in the syntax um, is going to be dangerous. And you can literally go and you can say, make the plus sign mean minus. Okay, so you don't want to do that. And you're going to have false mean true and true mean false and all of that stuff. And you'll look at the code and it'll look fine. You don't know why it's not working. And then you find a header file has a, um, a define, hash define, which does that. And it textually looks at the code and it swaps out one thing for the other. And it's like, you mean it's rewriting my program before I... You know, I read it, I think it means one thing, and then it goes off and transforms it into this other thing. So you've got to really, really be careful about reading everything in terms of your header files to see any monkey business that's gone on. However, if they weren't in header files and they were in the code file in which you were located, so let's have ourselves in a code file. I am in a code file over here. This will be my code file. And that will be my code file. And inside that code file, not outside of it, somewhere else, that won't be here, 
I'm not interested in a type definition anywhere else. This would effectively be a namespace, okay? This thing will automatically be a namespace and that will be where I'm defining stuff. And it will inherit from the namespace it's in, the rules of that namespace. So if it's inside a bigger namespace, then that will have rules and have meaning, right? So like if you grow up in a certain country, um, words and thumbs up, thumbs down mean certain things, right? And this will mean that you will have something that's defined here is, you know, uh, let's see. Um, thumbs up, right? And then this will also inherit that. And the reason why you want that to be the case is you want there to be things where this doesn't have to redo all its definitions. It's in the, in the sense it knows from the context in which it's in um, the definition of thumbs up. Now, if it's the Roman emperor context, it means stab the person. And if it's um, since the Roman Empire fell, it's like good, good going, right? And it doesn't mean stab the person, like the complete opposite meaning. So um, you have this thing and you're saying in this, but not in the outer one, I want to do something special. And I want to do something special where I to find something which has or applies, like it borrows a dialect. So all you have to say is like use your know, dialect and whatever that dialect is. And then that is going to get you so that it's going to change the meaning of certain things within this. So it could be that, you know, ordinarily you're not using things to mean I can't think of a good example but you might want to have different kinds of notation um, and it would all be in there it would all be in that and you'd be able to kind of shift to that notation in this area and it would all be handled by the dialect shift but the dialect signaling that using that dialect would be within the file that you were in it wouldn't be in a separate file and um it'd be pretty clear um you wouldn't have to be familiar with the whole project and go all over the whole project and go all over here and find out what's happening here and it's like oh it's doing a define and um that that, that doesn't happen right so there's no preprocessor. Um, and the other thing is that's just one direction. So that's bottom up and you can go top down. So we got some sense of enclosing things of meaning as if we've got like a system of objects or something, um, not namespaces. Well, these things are actually prototypes and they are generalization of the concept that we need to be able to make the types such as Z and N and uh, the real numbers, etc., and the complex numbers, right? So all the things we use to make those types, the prototypes give us that and more. Right, so the prototypes are like, well, we'll be needing types, but rather than just defining them in the language and then leaving it there, and they're, they're built in, and we can't make more of them, we can make more of them, right? We can make more of types. And the type sense of the type gets to be less and less important over time as you 
grow from the bottom up. So it's very type P low down when you're dealing with numbers and stuff. And as you move away, the stuff that's the typiness of it, um, it's, it's still important, but it's less obvious that that's what it is, that it's a type. And um, it's easy to think of these things as being like objects. But the problem is if you say they're objects, that brings in a whole lot of conceptual baggage where you're thinking, oh, I know what an object is. And you'd be wrong. So they're not objects. Uh, just say not objects. Um, so what are they if they're not objects? Um, I mean, I suppose you could say they're modules because you can put them inside each other. That will do. They'll, they're modules. Some people might call them entities, but um, um, modules is all right. Um, that's like there was a programming language called Modular. Uh, what was it called? Modular 2, I think it was. And um, had the idea of modules. Um, modules and then namespaces are quite similar. Um, but it's a um, modular abstraction is something that's quite good for projects. So you um, are not thinking. The problem with the objects versus modules is an object is like I have something in the real world and I'm modeling it and I am making it so that I'm bringing that part of the real world into the computer and then I want the computer to just do something with it. And you think that that's what you want and it seems to do quite well for quite a long time and then there's loads of stuff that doesn't fit that paradigm. So it just doesn't fly to go off and say, make everything be objects. So modules are more general and they, um, they're better. So, um, and they are, um, they're essentially a bit like a group in the sense that they are a set of operations. Um, and you might say, well, are they like a glee group where there's like a manifold? And there's not a manifold, but there is something that they have um, that is like a collection of their values. Um, and you might say, what are their values? And you might say, well, you know, it has data as well that it's carrying around with it. Um, but the data is, is tricky because there's reasons for keeping it pure. Um, I suppose the thing is, is that if you're going to do this, you know, you need to have the color. We're going to have... Um, this, no, this. We're looking to go the other direction. We're looking to go, um, no. We're looking to go this way and we're looking to go, no. Looking to go. Top down. That can be a long time to say all this. The top-down programming is talked about a lot, but it's rarely done. And they they don't understand how to do top-down programming because they um, don't start high enough. And they can't because the thing that they're trying to articulate things with is this stuff here and this stuff here is completely inadequate so you first have to bottom up program um, into dialects that are going to be um 
a domain um, specific. So you basically have to write a domain specific language that is going to be pertinent to the thing that you're working on as a problem that is going to be um, I mean, you have your client and the client comes to you saying they want something done in the way of software. And then you have a, a systems analyst and then they go off and tell the systems architect and then they talk to the software engineers and then 18 months later, something's returned to the client and it's not really what they wanted, right? And that happens a lot. And it's sort of a bit like Chinese whispers, and it's sort of the friction and the lack of articulacy in being able to um, have this thing, which is um, in adequate. What not programming is inadequate. Um, so. When you come to a language and you say, oh, well, I'm not allowed to add keywords, I'm not allowed to add types, I'm not allowed to do this, that, and the other, I'm not allowed to add new data structures even necessarily, you, some languages are like that. Um, JavaScript just has floats. Um, you come in and you're like, how am I supposed to make anything out of this? And you, and you think, well, you shouldn't blame your own tools, right? If you're, you're a bad craftsman, if you blame your own tools. But actually, if you're the craftsman that gets to make the tools, there's no problem. You're not, it's not a gripe if you go off and say, I'm going to make better tools. And interestingly, in this lecture, he spends the beginning part of this making better tools. He says, the issue in doing this is partly that we're locked into using the tools and talking about these things a certain way and we need to escape that and be able to talk in terms of new tools and then the new tools that come from new thinking will then lead to uh, new ways of expressing uh, the problem when we will escape the Einstein uh, prison which is due to it being based on uh, a restrictive set of dimensional measures so um, with this, it's like, it's the problem in programming is that every programming language that exists, and I've studied basically all of them, um, that's 1700 languages. Uh, if I studied them all and they're all inadequate, they're all bad, then what do you do? Um, I mean, it keeps people in work as the programmers, but uh, maybe not for long with ChatGPT, who knows. But what you're looking to do is you're looking to have the top-down stuff be easier, right? So we want to make it so that you come in and you already have this stuff at the bottom. Now, this won't be the case because you're going to find that you're going to have to make it, right? You're going to have to build the tools and then you're going to be in a position to then have um, what you need. So you have to have to build tools for your domain in a new dialect and if you didn't have that last part there you would just been to the problems of c++ adding features in with overloaded semantics 
And that's what they are caught in. They're caught in a trap where they are trying to make new tools to make them have easier software development, but they're making their life more complicated because they're making the language more complicated and making it so that when they look at code, they don't know what it means because it could have been redefined seven, way, seven ways from Sunday. If it's all kept sensible with the technology of Rebol, which is basically allows you to have completely unrecognizable syntax in different parts of the program, it just doesn't matter because it clearly organizes what's what and where it is and what means what, then that thing of the dialect concept frees you from this problem of um, what's called metaprogramming and the, and the downsides of metaprogramming. Now, we now have, we might have a step before we are able to get into the programming what we want to program, where we have to build out our programming language first, right? So we're appro approaching something with humility. And we're saying that I have a problem where the thing I'm trying to get my computer to do, the computer can't do, the language can't do, because the language doesn't know how to let me articulate within that thing. So I have to be humble and I have to realize that, that is actually the real problem and I have to make it so that that um, language is extended in the direction of my uh, inarticulacy. So we go extend language um, in so just as I have been hopefully gleaning something of a gist of geometric unity and I've probably made loads of mistakes and said lots of stuff that's silly but the point is is that I've spent three years engaged with it and I've found it like a huge rabbit hole to go down right and it's kind of a combination of things like um Edwin A. Abbott's Flatland and then you've got you know a romance in many dimensions and then there's Lewis Carroll's As to As um, in Wonderland and As to the Looking Glass. And it's very, very like those books. It's strange. It's uncanny, actually. So it is, um, it's been fascinating to get involved with learning about all these things like Galois and it's it, all these fascinating stories that come out about people right um but when i I'm, not, I'm saying i am not extending the language literally to make it more inarticulate i'm saying i'm extending it in the direction of my inarticulacy not its inarticulacy or to make it more articulate itself see it's, it's difficult for me to articulate this I want the language to, I'm, I, in my humility, I recognize my inarticulacy. That's key, right? That right there is key. So if you know that I can't tell the computer and I can't say, hey Siri, make me in my game and it will just know what I am wanting from my game and just make it in three seconds flat and it would be like perfect. Uh, there's going to be some kind of impedance between me and it. And even if you say, well, you need to give it more information than that. You need to kind of talk to it about everything that is that you want, and then it will make it, but it won't. And the part of the reason is for that is you don't know what you want. 
So you, you need to be aware that that's something that you just don't know until you get in there and try it. Because you're making something in the game which is a dynamical system and you have to engage with it as a player in order to get a sense of whether it's fun or not or whether it's interesting or not. So in terms of the usual thing, in terms of the usual thing of you know the systems analysts, the systems architect, the software engineers, etc., and programmers, what you have is <laughs> Siri keeps thinking I'm talking to it. Um, thank you, Siri. <laughs> That's my only way to get it go away. Um, you need to have. Um, That's completely thrown me off. Um, I can't say what I want. I don't know what I want. Yes, I do not know what I want in a game until I make it. All right? So I'm going to keep on iterating over these different dynamical systems and And it will be in a feedback loop. And I'm going to be the observer of that dynamical feedback loop. That's not how it's supposed to be, is it? I'm going to be the observer of that dynamical feedback loop, interacting with it. And it's going to be... I'm going to be building out my universe and I'm going to be creating it from pure math and then I'm going to be taking it up and into a type system and then I'm going to have the data structures containing information of interest to me and then I'm going to have something I can talk about stuff with and then I'm going to say well what I really need to be able to do is be able to describe things in three-dimensional graphics so that's like oh well that's a whole lot of mathematics so I have to teach it that because it doesn't have it in the language. It's not got batteries included. So no batteries included. So if you're doing something in gaming, you think, well, there should be a way through this, right? I mean, surely other people have come from this problem before. And yes, there is. I mean, you have libraries. And you have uh, tools like, um, you know, Unity and um, Unreal. And they are middleware and they come with a whole lot of stuff where you can go off and it's like, here's the stuff that you said you wanted. Problem is, that isn't like, that isn't, they control that stuff and they can change their mind about what they're giving you and you're under the contracts and the license agreements to pay them the money and all of that so it doesn't come for free and a lot of these times these libraries especially things like windows when you're working with windows um they are made to be proprietary and so that you are, in a sense, in a state of lock-in with what it is that they do. So they aren't made to be accessible. So the accessibility um, is... Um, that 
that's an issue is that the libraries can be inaccessible and then the unity aren't real is complicated and so it's indigestible it says it's like a huge edifice of stuff and you're thinking where do i begin with all of this i don't know it's so much i don't know where to begin to be able to make my little thing right and it can be based around certain assumptions which might not be your assumptions and they might have their own way of making things for what people commonly go about to do and you might be like fundamentally different from that so in my case the way most games work is you have um data and then that data goes into the game you have input from the user and then you have a render of what that is um what's being seen as a result of the user input and then that's seen by the user and that's your feedback loop but you start to start off with this data that is you know handcrafted art you know teams of 300 people working for three years at ubisoft and it's a whole it's a whole deal of stuff to make all of that stuff and that's not something i can do because i'm just one guy right so it has to be done differently i have to be able to reduce the amount of data or get rid of it entirely and is that theoretically possible and it is possible because what you do is you use a technique that's called T <laughs> wrong color I keep doing the wrong colors you use a technique called teleological procedural content generation and then you add onto that some cur curation which is actually like a filtering of that um, procedural content generation so what you do is you go up to the stuff that would be the data and you say um, I need to have this type of data for my game and you teach it using these bottom-up methods how to make the stuff you want now you don't get the stuff you want you get something similar to the stuff you want you get kind of an inexact match to what it is so rather than it being specifically exactly what you want you get something that's kind of ballpark of what you want so you get a kind of ballpark of what you want and then there's a whole lot kind of search space within that where it's kind of like well you know it's kind of bad this way and it's good this way and it's it's got all these different kind of parameters that you can explore in that space of like if only you could find the exact thing that the procedures given the right inputs would then give you something that's closer to what you want so so long as you can tune your way through this kind of swampland of different things it's generating you'll find the kind of universe that is the thing that you want to be the content of your game and that will work for most of it because most of it is just background material 
that is not something that is going to be the main focus. You have your show goals. Well, you have your show goal, and then you have your chorus line. And so it's important to have the chorus line with the show, show goal. And the chorus line don't have to be as pretty and as nice legs as the show goal. They are in the background. They still dance in unison. They will still kick their legs well. But that part is important. They can't be bad. But you don't want fat ones, you know, that sort of thing. They all have to wear as good a dress as a show girl has. And your focus is going to be on the show girl. But then you're going to think they will be as beautiful as a show girl as well. And it's just you don't look at them as much as a show girl. Because she's front of stage and they're back of stage, right? So um, to have back of stage in an environment where you could visit all these other places that are made with this um, technology where you haven't gone around and you haven't done, and it said some, right? I said some curation. The majority of the stuff will be not done that way, right? So you could do like the whole Milky Way and you could do, let's say, 400 um, million stars. We say that 10% of them have planets. That's how many uh, planets there would be. Okay, in the whole of the Milky Way. And then how many Goldilocks planets? Probably um, um, a tenth of that. So we could go off and we could knock one of those zeros off. But then the the the, um, the, the comments would be in the wrong place. So anyway, so we'd have, what's that say? 40, 40 million planets that are possibly with plants on. So plants and water, um, but no animals. Because if you have animals, then it's going to be, how are you going to do your animals? And it's like, you go to one planet, see something, go to another planet, see the same thing, because you're not in control of what it makes. And the seeds aren't guaranteed to be that different. And it's going to be like, how did you get from here to there? Whereas the plants, you're not going to be noticing them so much, and they can be a bit more varied without you saying, how the hell do you live being evolved looking like that? Which is what you tend to do when you're looking at animals. So the animals will only be on the curated planets, and how many of those do we have? 500. So there's 500 show goals in the whole of the Milky Way, and those 500 are like efforts put into those. So that's something that's feasible for you to say, well, that's 250 a year. And that would be a two year development where you're doing one every day. So somehow you've got to make a whole planet a day. And it's like, yes, you can do it. Because what you do is you use your teleological procedural generation system to just throw up lots and lots of planets overnight and you get to the computer in the morning and you look at it and say, here's I, you know, how many planets is generated? And you say, these are the ones that are the most interesting candidates to work on today. And um, it's like you're rolling the dice and you're saying, okay, and there's this one and there's this one and this one. And you've come up with something that's, interesting so um all the factors that can lead to an interesting starting point that you then tweak and you say well that quite close now explore within that space of how that is you know that volcanic planet with the with the purple clouds or whatever let's keep those things but let's change some other things because that doesn't have plants on it and doesn't have animals on it. Let's uh, make it so that it has, um, you know, lizards on it or something, right? 
and so you you go off and put that stuff in so um and you put it in by adjusting sliders and the sliders then tell it the seed numbers for those characteristics and then that then leads it to know to take the basic planet which is you know it knows the geological stuff the climate stuff um and then it goes off and the mass the gravity stuff that's basically what you get and then the the mineral stuff and then the rest of it is stuff where um it's you're going in there and saying i want to sort of create a skin over this uh basic planet where i'm saying um you know things but everything you can do there has to be something that makes sense so the, the because of climate because of the minerals because of gold lock zone and water being liquid uh you would have a series of biomes climate areas different places in the planet that would be different you know, there'd be an arctic region and a desert region and a jungle maybe because it's likely to have plants if it's in the cold liquid zone if it has water if it has the right minerals and stuff so those factors will be already limiting where you can do your work as an artist and you will have the thing generate stuff and then you'll go off and say show me something that looks promising as a canvas on which i can then do my my work and then it will give you candidate planets are a bit more interesting the in like a barren moon and then you go off and say i work that up and you start adding stuff and you could be adding more interesting varied plant plants uh, that you wouldn't see anywhere else that is very unique and they could you know like you know dare the triffid type things and then you could go off and have um insects and you could have you, know, you could go wild and have dragons if you like you know and all of these things you would be uh having to teach it about as extra stuff that you would need to be able to have and then it because you told it how to do certain things then and, and they would be the things that would be suited to this particular planet right under the conditions of this planet these things were able to exist then it would then work out that there would be a good chance a probability but not a certainty that these things like dragons would exist elsewhere but they would be differently adapted and they would look different and so well maybe that's not such a good idea because the thing is you might go somewhere else and you'd find the dragons and you think the coincidence of evolution would be too jarring so all right we won't we only have the animals on the planets that you have overseen and then we'll have the plants able to be migrating everywhere um, to anywhere where they can have a niche we might if we okay tell you what the exception is because water is so populous um in common around the milky way they're going to be oceans it's stupid to not have fish so we're going to have fish it's going to be a lot of fish and um that's terrible can't like the fish um So you want to have fish and that's going to be part of the thing that's the only exception that's the kind of animal that you wouldn't even be aware was there unless you really went looking for it and then and people aren't that familiar with the creatures of the sea and you can make those very they're all of a type um they're different kinds of streamlined shapes aren't they so it's easy to make those and generate those so um i think this is um 
not a bad way of looking at things. Um, but in in terms of this, um, you know, you say you start bottom up, you have to make it to overcome the inadequacies and it's like batteries included and can't be something that's indigestible. It, it's got to be light in the sense that the, um, you've got to have a thin user manual, okay? So that's quite a hard um, thing. So the language needs to have a thin user manual. That's despite um, despite its power, right? Because I mean, it has power because of its articulacy, because of all the features, right? And so how are you going to get around that? And I suppose you could say, well, how would you explain this in a in a thin user manual? And you just say, well, you don't bother because it's like mathematics, so you don't have to. It's already known. So for as long as you can keep things close to how they already are and known to be and behaving in the way that they're accepted to be, you don't not have to say right you just you don't have to say so um it when he said earlier and he was saying the symbol pd is equal to p dirac i was like you don't need to be doing that you don't need to be doing that because how often are you going to be doing this throughout the paper i mean i could be wrong you might be doing it a lot but I just think it's way easier to just be straightforward and carry this stuff around. And it's a bit like, the, you know, the um, uh, situation in basic where you said 8% was um, an integer and a dollar was a, a string. So if you go, go row Dirac, then that's saying it's a Dirac spinner, right? So that suggests that what you want is you want to be able to have names that are going to be as subscripts. So that means that's a feature. So you want to have Greek followed by a subscript. And the subscript definition um, can be a subscript expression or ID, which is an interesting thing I hadn't thought about because um, that's literally very fascinating because uh, you could have something that could be indexes or it could be something that is um, identifies. So that means for it to work syntactically as being you write Dirac. Um, The rack probably has to be Roman, I think. That would be Roman. Is that right? Oh, it's Roman because it's a type. So if it was a variable, it would be an expression and it would be part of this and it would be an italic. There we are. So you're using um, you know, A minus B or 2A minus B, you can have that as being a subscript for your, you could have row 2A minus B, let's say, and that would be something. And then if you go um, the other, then that would be where you'd be with that. So that's, that's done it. That's absolutely, yeah, I'm happy with that. So, um, I've got something for my language for that. Oh, okay. Just drag this up a bit. Um, uh, 
Um, it's, it's, I'm, I suppose I'm a bit like this at the moment because I was interrupted in my reaction by the um, guy doing the kitchen next door. Uh, I don't know if they're going to start doing it again now. Um, it might be a multi-day job and they might be about to start drilling again, which is going to be bad because I'm supposed to do the reaction overnight tonight. And it's now getting on for nine o'clock. But the point is, is that all of that is really quite valuable to me and my programming language and the game because it's giving a sense that I know um, how to do it. You have your 500 planets that you aren't hand making, but you are overseeing. And then the rest of it, you're leaving it to do it itself. But because you've done some 500, those 500 inform the rest and make those better. Um, but only in ways where they're not going to seem like repeated content because you get fish where there's water and plants, but that's it. And that isn't always a guarantee anyway. And the places you're generally going to visit are the places that are in the known map. And the known map is a hundred places, right? There's a hundred places in the map. And the rest of it is yet to be discovered, and there's 400 of those, and that will be what you're looking for. So it'd be a needles and a haystack, and it's 400 out of, well, it's going to be 400 million planets in the Milky Way. So it would be one in a million um, for you to find, right? Which is very low probability. And you're going to keep flying around places looking for planets and You'll scan them from orbit, and then you will say, no, not there, sort of thing. Or you send out probes. There will be kind of competition over who can kind of find the interesting place. Because you share the game, and everyone's got the same universe, because it's a deterministic function based on their position in space-time. So they all see the same stuff. And then they could have a wiki, and they could go off and say, I've found someone really good at this location, right? Or they don't let on that they found it. And then they build a city there. Because that's part of the game, is to, you go out and colonize places. You find somewhere that is either a barren moon or Mars or whatever, you know, not literally Mars, but, you know, you find somewhere and you want to kind of start terraforming, building it up, whatever, and uh, doing that. And you get more efficient at doing it because you can kind of use robots and stuff, and you can delegate the work to robots. And there was an interview with Jonathan Blow that I was listening to today, and he said that with VR, you have all of this um, stuff coming to you, even with a regular game, you have like 4K and sound, and you have, um, yeah, you know, the display resolution is 4K, and then you have all this audio, lots and lots of data in the audio, and vibrations into the controller. And um, <clears throat> he was saying, you know, you get loads of information bitwise this way. And then the amount of information you put in is like a click. And then moving this way, this way, this way, this way on the mouse. And I thought, right, yeah, I suppose you're right. And then he said, and then he said, you get to kind of tap a few keys on the keyboard, you know. WASD, let's say, maybe a few more than that, like space bar and stuff like that, but not many because you've got to have your hand on them ergonomically because you can't move over the keys and then find them again that readily. So you kind of have to have a rest position for them. You might have shift, WASD, maybe QE and space, right? So that would be what would that be? Six, seven, eight keys, and then nine if you can't click. And then um, the degrees of freedom of the mouse. And so that's not a whole lot of input. And um, compared to the amount coming back, which is 3,840 3, by 2,160 uh, in 24 bit color. To so do the numbers, it's like a really large number. 
and then you've got the sound and that's always happening like second by second by second and it's like that's a huge amount of information it's some stereo so it's two channel if not multi-channel it could be you know 7.1 um it's it's a lot and so he he said even before you get into vr um, and what that adds to it and enhances things in the terms of what you have in the engagement um he said that the thing that he in, is interested in in vr is that you have this thing where you um get more articulacy it's not so much the immersion of the experience of vr but the experience of being able to um say you know play the piano and it can track your fingers as you play the piano that's in virtual space and you look around and you're in the concert hall you didn't move your body you independently moved your head and it coped didn't freak out about that and make you do something right and that your whole body is the body having the gain and you don't have a controller to move the body the controllers are moving your hands and now you've got articulacy of your hands and you can turn them and you can grip things and it's quite nice right so i've messed around with vr and i thought it was quite good um and i hadn't really recognized what he was saying until he, i heard this interview with him saying the thing about vr is not the visuals being wrapped around and you look here look there it's all there right and it's stereoscopic and everything the thing about vr is it's capturing more from the user and therefore you are starting to kind of get more data out of the user than you did in the past and you're being more articulate and then i thought hold up you're not wrong but actually you don't need to have vr to do this you could take a controller and you could make it so that it had more inputs you could have it so you hold this down and then that means that the buttons that you ordinarily have now do different things so you can have it that you hold that down and then those mean different things then you can have it mean these mean different things so that means that that now you've got eight more buttons um well actually this could have these diagonals would be things as well so that would be four that's eight that's um 12. so there's 12 buttons there then you've got these two sticks which is 14. so there's actually 14 inputs and then you could have that then mean 14 things that are additional to the 14 things you ordinarily have because you're using this kind of like an alt key on the keyboard to get you foreign characters and that's just if you use that by itself because you could use that and then that and that opens up like alt and then you know um shift right so that would be another 14. so now you've got 28 extra things that you can say to the game and you can keep down this rabbit hole and then you go wait 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 i'm looking at this wrong you do that and then you can hold that and then that can mean eight things so for each of these i've got eight things right yeah so that means that for each of these things i have got eight things so four times eight is going to be um 32. so if i added before i was adding 28 but now i'm adding 32. so depending on how you go about this and what you do you could add a lot of articulacy to it then you have contextual context, um, contextual articulacy where the situation you are placed within the game your avatar proximal to something will mean that these things as inputs do different things depending on the situation now you might say that's going to be hard to remember well it won't because you hold this down and then it comes up on the screen what these do which will change depending on the situation and then when you hold that it's going to then say what this should do 
depending on the, the situation. And it will tell you as you go through the game what the controls are doing, and they'll be changing dynamically, but consistently with the situation as you come to it. And you might say, I don't want all that clutter on the screen. Well, this has been done before. In Far Cry 3, they made it so that you only got a button prompt to kind of climb a ledge. When you got to the ledge, and you could climb up the ledge by pressing A, and you failed to press A. So you walk forward, and you get to the ledge, and you stand there like a numpty, and you don't press A, and A would climb, climb the ledge, and then it says press A to climb ledge. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I forgot the button. You press it and climb to the ledge, right? So it's on a delay. It's still there, and it's like a remedial pedagogy. So it's a slow learner to get the reminder. And so you could have it be that you do this, and it doesn't always tell you what these things do, because this is like more likely to be familiar with this. And then when you are into one of these scenarios, you press one and hold one of these things, and then it will have to tell you what these things are, right? Or it could be the other way around, because this one here has eight. So it's actually more advantageous to rather than say four times eight, to say eight um, times four. I mean, those are going to be the same either way. I have four things, and I, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be the same number, isn't it? Four times eight and eight times four is going to be the same thing. I'd need there to be when I do this. I'd need there to be these things do different things. There are two other buttons that you could have, but that's in mutual exclusion to this. So that's no good. So that's probably not going to get used. Um, you got that. That could be a shift. And then you got that as a shift. So yeah. I don't, all sorts of things to work out with that, but there are, more ways of interacting with something and you don't have to kind of say well we'll have the whole keyboard and we'll use every key on the keyboard and we'll be typing you know on on every everything there um it's just overkill you know so okay um I've got quite a lot out of this. Um, so the idea of having, um, you know, more input from the user, that only works if you have it ergonomic, where you say the things you most commonly do are the things that are the thing where it's unshifted, and then you shift in order to get into more and more obscure things, and it helps that the world has a rich set of context that you're proximal to. But interestingly, if this is movement and you move towards something, it actually does make sense that you will stand still and then that way you have to have this be the thing you operate with because this can't be pressed while you're walking forward. But if you're walking forward, you can't then be opening a chest, opening a door, doing whatever it is that the game would do when you use this to do your actions. Normally in games, they have this A button do the action, and um, it's kind of unnecessary. Um, I suppose it has an advantage in that you're moving forward and then you can while moving forward press an action. Um, 
you could possibly have a default action that would be like the most common thing and it could be like when you hold this down and then you tap that that will be the action and so action moves onto this and i think that was done in a game called um i think it was halo reach did that so um but um well that's sort of like they did reload and rather than having that be reload they had that be reload and that way you could keep your thumbs on the sticks and then you'd reload like that so um there's an advantage there so there's another idea where you could have it so that this programmatically changes what that does and then you would have it be that it would only work that way when you were in this mode so this here puts you into the mode where this changes what that does and also you can only use it when you are in that mode and so that will be reload or you change it and that would be you know turn the flashlight on on the gun or whatever right and you have to keep changing the states of this to keep this being um what this button does and then you have your thumbs on this and you're not even using these because moving off this onto this is breaking you away from the game so you have basically one action button for the game and one thing to say i'm doing stuff and the reason you do that is so that when you do press these they can do different things and when you press this it could do different i don't know there's all sorts of things to be worked out there and this is part of it is that you can't know what you want right i don't know what i want until i make it and i have to be in a, a system whereby i am observing the system and i make it and so part of the language that i'm working on is to um make it so that you can do live programming where you see immediately the changes to what you're doing so in latex you write some stuff and then you compile it and then you see how it came out and you go no 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 i didn't mean it like that and in mine you change the code and it immediately makes a difference and the program that it is can be running at the time and that changes the way the game is operating you can see in the split screen you got your game you got your code and the code is now making the game operate differently and um you're not playing on the keyboard you're playing on a controller right so the controller is your interface to the game and your keyboard is the interface to your um, window which has got your text describing the game so it would be confusing if you had everything be keyboard controlled because then you wouldn't be able to go up and down with the cursor keys and do that and you wouldn't be able to select text and um, you know that would be a nuisance you want you don't want to use a mouse and keyboard for the game it has to be a, a designed purpose designed controller otherwise it won't work now how are we with the um the um oh they're there well we'll see how it is if it's not too noisy i might continue but they are there is he driving off? Oh, he's driven off. Okay, well, that might be a good sign. So that might mean he's not working today or he's done working today. So I'm going to um, just pause for a bit and uh, I'll be back.
some more hammering. Don't know whether to keep going or not. We'll see how it is. Well, I'm in soup today, this time. Um, so I don't actually know. Okay, it's Wednesday. So they're going to do the bins tomorrow. Which means I do need to do the bins today. So, like, my plan yesterday was to... Um, <clears throat> my plan yesterday was to... Right, my plan yesterday was to not even stream overnight. And I slept and I thought, oh, I'll, it's, I've had a good sleep. I'll be able to work through the night while it's quiet and get this done. And of course, I got distracted. Although I did get to talk about my corrections to his notation, where he says he has a conflict between H and h being used for the same object and i was like well don't change h from referring to the horizontal vector bundle change h from referring to the group to having g refer to the group and then i spotted what i thought might be a mistake where it seemed to be P of H defined in terms of some expression that involved H. And I thought, well, you just don't do that. You don't write mathematics where it's like something is defined in a circular definition. So I thought, because it's not on equation, right? So um, I thought it could be that um, he meant what he meant in the supplementary slide explainer, which he'd written a year earlier. And so I went to that, and he had not got H there. He had got Z. So I thought, okay, then, we'll have Z. And maybe that's wrong. Then he'd done um, Rho Dirac, and then he said he's going to simplify it to Rho D, and that's because he's using it a couple more times in that part of the paper. And I thought, well, if it was me, I'd keep it as Dirac. But then that led me to think, how is it that it's been disambiguated from being, you know, multiplication by juxtaposition? And it is um, that the it's in Roman type, 
whereas everything else is in italics. So that's very interesting. So that means that if you have something, it, like, it would be like if in my language I had a variable that was a piece of symbol that would contain a quantity that would be unknown and then it take a value and then it will not change, then that would be in italics. And if you had something that was in Roman type, it would be um, a type. And interestingly, um, the spin group is in Roman and the other groups are in Roman. Um, so in a sense, they are types, aren't they? I mean, U6464 is a set. Uh, it's a Lie group with a set with operations that are acting on a differential manifold. So should I think of my prototypes as being a set that has operations where the operations are all uniquely characterized and defined separate from each other. So the features of that set are all going to be unique, right? You wouldn't have like more than one version of the same thing that would be identical. You'd have, they might be distinguished in, you might have like an overloading of the distinguished like polymorphism, but you wouldn't have, um, that they would all be, um, the, the feat that there wouldn't be like, if someone's like had sent me the message spook, there'd only be the one response, the one response, which would be, ah, right? And you go and do that to a sheep and it go, ah, and then you do it to a wolf and it go, oh, you know, and you do it to an owl and it go, oh, and you know, everything you do spook to uh, will do a different response and um, some will treat it as a scare thing and an alarm to others and others will treat it as a confrontation and it will start, you know, um, you know, chimpanzees will make an awful noise and they'll be um, being aggressive and lions will war and, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through the whole gamut of spook noises, but, you know, it's a, it's where I've illustrated polymorphism at the zoo. And um, other things don't make a noise at all. You say spook and, and it will just slither away, you know. So um, I think we're into something here that's quite interesting where we're seeing that the types are uh, Roman. And they also seem to be capitalised. And as I was going to have it be that the words that were like, you know, and and or and where, which are Roman in mathematics, they're all lowercase. Then the way that you are delineating the types is that they are capitalized. So it's si simply that they are capitalized, that they are, there, there is this thing of, that's a preposition or a conjunction, and that is a uh, a type. It's incredibly simple. Um, so they don't actually have any input uh, decorators um, needed for them, whereas the stuff that is a tannic does, and um, you put in those uh, to tell it, yes, I want this to be an italic. And there might be some that you put in to make things in bold. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be going in with tilde over things, but you never know. I mean, if you have dialects and you're able to specify um, what it is that you want as your notation, and there's some way of expressing that notation, and you could somehow get into the editor that renders the stuff and make it so you could put in tilde above something or whatever it is typographically and have it have meaning, that would be quite good. So I'm just going to cover the comments because there's banging next door from the um, guy doing the um, kitchen fitting and then I'm going to stick to the plan I had originally which was to spend the day um, without worrying about the noise 
try to do the stream and then do it maybe this afternoon if he's gone by this afternoon. And that means I do my bins this morning and um, that sort of thing. So let's see, I have Brandon Landon, do you feel like you're beginning to achieve a sort of big picture understanding of gen geometric unity or do you have a long way to go? Just curious. Um, I was saying to him that I had, you know, uh, taken an interest in it um, when he, you know, when he first did his, um, um, revealed this um, lecture in 2020 and I found it completely incomprehensible but I was interested and then I ended up uh, learning more and more about it uh, because I was interested but I was just coming from the perspective of a layman I waited two years for people to get around to making a decent video trying to explain it and no one did and then I got frustrated and then I saw that people in the comments of his video say, oh, I wish I could understand some small part of this. And I thought how disappointing it is that no one's managing to make it more accessible to them. And I thought, well, I kind of think I might have a gist of an understanding of it, but I'm gonna make it very clear that I am a layman too. And I could be wrong. And if anyone in these comments of this Eric Weinstein you know, video, says you're wrong uh, because of X, Y, Z, then I will improve my understanding. So under that view of like, no one else is saying anything, I'm gonna venture out there to be shot down in flames. I started saying a few things and I didn't get shot down in flames. That helped build my confidence a bit. And then I thought, right, I think I know enough to be able to make a tweet. And a tweet, so, so few characters, it's hardly anything to say. So being so few things to say, then how much can you go wrong in a tweet? And I was very conservative about what I said about it. And I only said things that I thought I was confident about. And that was mainly about how you get from X4 to Y14. And then I had a, an illustration that was an animation of space time which is the best one I've found on the web. And then I thought, oh, hold on a minute, here's a trick. Inside of the alt text that you can put to describe what the image is, I can say something like a, a thousand characters and you can use Unicode characters. and uh, You can use an invisible Unicode character that's used for tab, tab, right? So you can create spaced out things and you can have dotted arrows and solid arrows pointing up and down and you can make a whole diagram with superscript numbers that can represent the, the the things that are in this theory to do with x y and z as the spaces in which he is having his geometric unity theory be an obverse. and i wrote all this down wrote the math down as to how you come up with 14 and um you know, that kind of thing. And um, just the basics of explaining how do you get from four to this group that is, I can't remember what it was at the time. Um, whether it was, whether I said at the time it was 128 or I said, I think I might have said at the time it was 128. But anyway, I did all of that. And then Eric Weinstein has made this contact with me pretty soon after, and he wants to talk to me. So I talk to him and I say, if uh, I've inadvertently misrepresented your work in any way, I'm quite happy to delete the tweet because like, it didn't take that long to do. And he was happy for me to leave it up there. And he said, what do I want to ask him? Which I thought was strange because he's the one phoning me up. And I thought, well, for the people who were interested in knowing more about his work, and I said there would be people in the comments who would like, like to have some kind of gist of an understanding. I know that might not be the kind of people he's interested in reaching out to. He wants more technical people. But these are people who just want to have some kind of feel of what it is he's doing. And I thought maybe I could provide that. But I didn't want to be saying more to them if I hadn't checked it out with him first and 
like he's there on the phone with me so i go off and say to him is it all right if i explain geometric unity to you and this was a tactic of mine to make him so that he wouldn't speak and i'd be the one speaking because if he speaks he's going to use a whole lot of terms like in homogeneous gauge group that i just do not understand right so i went off and said in about two and a half minutes a description that was like what i'd put in the tweet but a bit more than i'd put in the tweet because i obviously my understanding had grown a little bit at least i thought it had and he was fine with it so i thought okay when i do a video i can at least say that and i'm sure about that since then um i have been reading up more on to the ge general relativity side of things so this first um, tweet was largely to do with the constructing the elaborate uh, extended um, quantum field theory that he needs and then this um, latter thing was to do with understanding general relativity which is actually a lot harder than quantum field theory in my opinion and um, I've only been at it for like three weeks and I kind of put myself under a bit of a deadline because I wanted to get into writing my programming language so I could write my game which I I've worked on my programming language for 25 years, right? The, the design of my programming, I've worked for it on, on that for 25 years. I have a year in which to implement it, and then I'm going to have a year to make tools with it, and then those tools are going to make um, a game in two years, right? So that's the, the, the setup, and it has to be within that time frame because I'm going to be running out of money, all right? And um this game is going to be um if it comes off it's going to be the biggest game ever made in terms not in scale although that's true but in terms of scope of what you can do in it and um that's why i need to write my own programming language because I needed to boost my productivity. I was trying to calculate what my productivity do boost would be the other day, and I couldn't crunch the numbers. And um, I was thinking about how many words I write a day in my writing, because I write long comments all the time. And I was thinking, I wrote something the other day, which was something like the order of 50,000 characters. And then, um, if you say a word is like um, seven letters to a word, then seven sevens are 49. So that would be 7,000 words, roughly. Okay. And then how many of those words would be in a sentence? If you say like, I don't know, 28 sentences, I could write quite long sentences, then that would mean divide it by um you have let's see you got your seven thousand you're going to divide it by seven and you divide that again by well if you say 21 divide that by three yeah so you've got three clauses of seven words and then you've got the, the thousand divided by three would be about 330 and i looked up online and it turned out that the productivity in terms of lines that is independent of language it could be assembler it could be haskell it could be whatever is about 330. and i thought that well, that's very interesting that i've done my own thing on productivity based on sentences in english and it ended up being um 330 sentences um something like that anyway so then i thought well hold on a minute if it's assembler that's not really achieving very much and if it's some higher order higher level language it's doing a lot right so what you want is you want whatever your high level language is to be able to say as much in as little 
as profoundly as possible and have the things that you're talking about be uplifted into being more profound, right? So you want to work on making the stuff bottom up, um, do more, and then you want to work on things so that you can go down from the top and use it. But this is computer oriented often. So you want to make it so that it's adapted into a domain where it's like, well, that's more like useful for graphics and that's like more useful for like story and that sort of thing. And so they actually has an affinity to the domain that you're dealing with. And so then you kind of come down from the top and you are using those different things and it could be that you could have a conflict in the syntax because you had used things to make a kind of concise way of expressing something in one area and then you use it in the other area to mean something totally different and that would be a problem so i thought i need to isolate that problem and there's a language that already does that called rebol which um, does things which called dialects. So it has you know a dialect for each thing, and that then means that those things no longer have a conflict because uh, you just say I am using this now, and it knows to treat the symbols in this a certain way, while certain symbols that might seemingly be the same symbols are treated differently in this because the dialect is different, right? So like if I do that in the roman empire it actually means kill the guy and if i do that um it means save the guy and if i do like put the put the sword down and this means stab him with the sword i put it up in and if i'm outside of the roman empire then it's inverted because that was means that's that's you know good going you know celebration and that means bad bad boo 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 right so it's opposite meanings and you can have a language that has dialects that have contrary meanings um because the context of the language requires that for the domain that is being programmed in and different people or me wearing different designer hats at different times will be in different domains of my code and i'll be like so what are the rules here for how I am articulating with these symbols, and it will be different depending on what domain I'm in, right? Now, I think that's an important thing to get right, and there's something that the language that is very much used in games gets wrong, and this is a language called C++, and it totally fails on this. And so um, I think it's not something where you say, symbols normally mean one thing, and one thing only, and that's rigid, and that's the way I had been. And then as of today, I'm now thinking, no, you can have it where you have operator overloading, but it has to be in semantically isolated contexts that are controlled by dialects. So that's really quite a complicated um, thing to kind of get around and allow that richness. But in having that richness, you have domain-specific languages under an umbrella of a substrate that you're extending um, so that it is more expressive and articulate. And then you come to meet it and say, what have I got in the way of stuff I can talk about? And you realize you've got far more um, ways of talking about your problem and your intentions and, and getting the thing done, right? And so that's what I I want from my tool. So everything I do from now on, like, you know, starting next month, is going to be to further this project. And then it actually kind of snowballs because it's an extensible thing. So the language itself grows out of the language and then the tools grow out of the language, but the, la the, lang the tools made in the language make the language a better language. Right, because they, they put the batteries into the language. They're the, the tools essentially are part of the language as well. And they were like talking about 3D graphics and things like that. So it ends up being a, a language that isn't just general purpose. It's a language which becomes 
the best possible language that it could be to do the thing I want to do with it. All right. And so I'm making it so that rather than directly going laser focus for making the game as if I knew what I wanted to make, I'm going to be carefully dodging around trying to feel out, try and make the best 3D software I can, trying to make the best work, work process I can, redo the GUI because the GUI is all wrong, right? Graphical user interface is all bad. Redo the OS, right? Not have a filing system, because why do you need files? Because you only got one game that you're going to be playing. So you only need to load the one game, right? Completely kind of crackers ideas about how to do things. No applications. You don't need applications if everything in your desktop is a document, right? Um, no copy and paste. No copy and paste because there's a better way of doing it. And I'm not telling you what that is. But all of these things are like, it's insane the number of things that I thought of that are like, how come no one else has thought of doing it this other radical way? And I thought, but a lot of them are kind of like ways that were done in the past and were successful within their niche. And so they were tested as ideas and then they never went into the mainstream, usually because of the dominance of C and C++. And then you have a sad situation like JavaScript, which is used everywhere, including, you know, the web browser you're looking at through now, which has got problems in its logic. So the logic that it does to make decisions is bad. And that's like almost unheard of in programming languages. And that will catch you out when you're programming. So that's really bad. But it was written in 10 days by Brenda Nike, which is like absolutely insane length of time to try and write a programming language in. It's just like, well, how, how, how do you make a language in 10 days? But it's being used in practically every website there is online, right? So it's not completely rubbish. Um, but... <laughs> The thing is, is that language is modeled after the syntax of C, which is a language that came out in 1972. And C++ is modeled after the language C, and it isn't even compatible with C. It's, it's sought out, it tried to be, to begin with. And it's like, great, it's going to be another C, but extra. And then they failed to make it so that it was compatible with C. So it's kind of like, what's the point of it now? So JavaScript isn't at all compatible with either of them, and yet it looks like them. And you're thinking, well, why is it trying to be like them? And it's like, well, it's trying to be like them because people are familiar with those languages, so it's trying to make itself similar. It's like getting in a car, and, the, and it's got the clutch, and it's pedals, and the steering wheel, and it's all kind of familiar, right? You don't want it all to be completely radical and we've reinvented the steering wheel with this is how you are and you don't need to have a clutch anymore. It's automatic. And it's like you can have too much change and throw people off, right? So that's why they're doing what they're doing. But I think, you know, JavaScript could have been an opportunity for something nicer. So, um, and there's so much of it that's been written. So you think about every thing that was in the design of JavaScript that could have been different, that could have been nice, and then it would have been pleasure for all of the millions of programmers that have used it, you see. Now, I do think about that with mine, and I'm making it for me, and I might ultimately be the only person who ever uses it. But i am also been thinking over the years, 25 years that I've been doing it, that I need to make it so that I am, as, as if I'm thinking about I'm doing this in public, and I could be embarrassed by how bad it is, right? So I'm doing everything I do with a view to it being used by someone. Okay, so, um, and I want it to have a, th a very thin instruction manual. And part of that comes from basing it on traditional mathematics. So you don't have to learn that because you already know the notation and basing the other aspect of it, the bit where you do top down on English so that you've got nouns and verbs and prepositions and um 
It's not got any kind of weird syntax and dots for invoking a feature on an object or anything like that. And um, it, you just write English. And um, it's, um, it, you have to say a bit more because you're having to like, say it as a sentence, but actually you just come back to maintain it later and you just read it. And it's just like, I don't have to think about what does it mean? Because it's, it's ordered in the way my brain works. Whereas when you go back to maintain code that you wrote, that's in a like, say, um, C++, let's say, it's all kind of wrong. And it's like, it's not um, verb object, it's um, um, object verb. Now, if you're German, that's okay, because you're used to German being that order. But it throws your brain off. There's a little bit of an impedance, a little bit of a friction there going on the whole time you're trying to read this thinking, now what does this do? And you wrote it yourself six months earlier, but you can't make sense and divine the purpose of it. So part of my work is to try and make something that's intentional, which is a thing of programming that Charles Simone came up with, who's the person who was funded the chair of science that uh, Professor Marcus de Soto has. And he had this idea of intentional programming. And it's like you say, this is what I'm trying to do. And you express your goals. And then that bit of programming actually holds you to satisfying your goals. So you have to be fairly specific. And then you go into writing the program. And it, um, it's like you've made it almost like a contract with it. And there's various other ways of going about this there's things like the design by contract and there's literate programming there's a somewhere in that space there's a kind of amalgam where i might kind of weaken some of the things that are in intentional programming because it might be like premature formal specification in something where i will be wanting to do exploratory programming and have feedback and say actually that's not what i want so i might make that fairly kind of loose my intention but I want to say what it is that I want to do rather than say this is what this code does after I've written it right and the thing is, is if you have a comment and you say my code at this point does this and you change the code but you don't change the comment that's a lie now right so you don't want to lie but how do you enforce that can you make it so that the language reads your comment and says, actually, this is bollocks, right? So yes, you should be able to have syntax errors in comments, right? So you should be able to write a comment that is in part in the same terms as your code and looks like your code. And it's not something that does anything, but it's something that just is talking about what it is doing, what it is intending to do. And that can be things like literate programming does that. Literate program says what it um, does or is intending to do. And the notion of saying, having it enforce that or say, you know, it hasn't yet managed to do this yet or something, um, it could be something that could help me. Uh, keep track of things and like when I was doing the thing at the end of the stream and I was saying I need to take his equation I think it was 3.32 and I need to kind of rewrite it so that h was not being used for two different things um, I found all sorts of things wrong with it but I had to write at the top my intention and then I said I'm, my purpose here is to do this and it had like a a, a kind of link to the footnote four and the footnote four of course on that page says that the this h it refers to two different things and you know i might fix this in future graphs right so the kind of criticism i provided in the video over this point in his paper is quite detailed criticism of this one page where he's made this one equation i'm saying that you could do that differently and um, 
and basically fixed his problem for him and said switch from H to G and then have G be the group which is the main gauge group of geometric unity and is also in honor of Everest Galois who came up with the groups okay so you can have that not no cost <laughs> um ho happy to help it, all it is is just notation you could make it any letter of the alphabet that has already been used by you know geometric unity uh, there is another g elsewhere in the paper but it's a script g so it's like okay that's not going to be a problem you, you can tell those things apart Letters that are in different styles, Roman, Italic, script, fracture font, uh, Hebrew, um, they're all obviously different. Greek, you know. So, um, yeah. So, you know, if you're making a program, you want to be able to um, feel your way into it from, you know, top down. I suppose that doesn't look like top down. My diagram was the, the other way. So the top down would be like this, and bottom up would be like this, wouldn't it? So you you make bottom up, you make the ways by which you can do stuff, and you make that as rich as possible, because at the moment it's kind of like that. And I want to make it so it's kind of like that or more, and so I can really, really, really do things with it. And then I want to come down, and I want to be able to um, access all of this stuff with the things I make. And um, I suppose this should actually be the other way up, but it's all going to end up building. Has it end up being a tree that I build up? Is it always going to be bottom up though? Um, no, because the stuff at the top is just going to be. It's going to be okay. This stuff up here is going to be distributed systems in parallel um because the whole world is like made up of lots of things that are happening at once and so you don't worry about what order they happen in you go into them in separately and say you are this you are this you are this and make it so they all do their own stuff and they all re react off each other and produce behavior so that's how you do that so that's all kind of like activity and then this here is um providing the mathematics by which you have effectively the symmetries by which that activity has to then fit um it, it can't not be according to this because it's what it can do is only as an articulation of the language that you have here so in the sense of geometric unity although it's upside down the way I'm talking about it, the bottom up stuff is like the groups and the types, the types of groups that are sets with operations. So that's very, very similar to my language. And then the stuff at the top that you're making, they're also types, they're also groups which are sets with operations, but they are tasks. Each of those is a separate parallel thing and they're all operating independently and they're going off and doing their own thing. So in the game, they would all be non-player characters, etc., etc. And so, uh, you know, cars driving around, you name it. And it's not like you create a system to then get it to do all of that. You go off and just individually take those things and say, have you have this do this? And it makes it very, very robust because You've not got a one loop that's going around the program saying do all these things and you can also have things cycle down in terms of clocks so that the simulation it'll be like i'm here i need things around me to be active and the things that are proximal to you geographically in the game will have the most cycles and they'll be running at full whack and the things that are distant will still be doing stuff but they'll be lower grade low resolution simulation so there needs to be a way where it's kind of like level of detail, but it's like level of intelligence. And the level of intelligence just decreases. And so, I mean, stuff that's out of view off, off stage will not be rendering. 
So that's a huge burden of computation that's being reduced, right? If you've got an NPC that's walking across the room, you have to do inverse kinematics to have them legs walk and everything. If you have a character that's left essentially walking across the room off stage, you might possibly need to track them as a blob moving through a room to know where they were when they moved through the room. But you don't actually need to animate them walking. That would be insane if they're like not being seen, right? And you might say, well, why even keep that information about the path they took and everything? Well, if you were to like go into that bar where they had been and then look at the CCTV camera and footage on the videotape, you then put it in and the game's like going, oh, oh well, you're now asking me about the past, about something that happened and I didn't do the animation. That's your time you can do it. You can actually go off and retroactively put it in because you've got a little scant bit of information about the thing going through, which was a blob moving around the bar, knowing about the geometry of the bar and the other blobs that are in there and the interactions and stuff with them, right? Maybe it got out before there was a fight because there was a fight that night. And then it's got enough in its model that you can go to the footage and see the fight that took place and the fact that the guy that you wanted left, right? So none of that was rendered until you asked it to provide it. So that would be a really, really good way of doing one of the things I wanted to do, which was dynamic scoping, which is an idea I thought of myself. And it's like you have something that is so enormously complicated there's no way that even a really really fast big computer with lots of RAM could cope with it so what you do is you make it so that it doesn't do the whole thing at once and some of it it just shuts off completely and kind of goes to sleep and other parts it will kind of tick 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 very very slowly over what it is so it will be like things aren't dead but they're like being asked like every two minutes five minutes ten minutes okay, you, you, you get a few cycles in order to think about what you're doing because we're not going to leave you completely out of the picture. And here's what's going on. And, you know, so there'll be like some area where they can go to get public information on stuff and they'll be able to sample that and they'll be able to act accordingly uh, based on what will probably for them be limited information about the world because that also needs to be a thing. They can't all have perfect idea about what the world is. Because if people knew exactly everything about the world, they wouldn't act and do stupid things because they would more likely see their way to kind of avoid having catastro catastrophic situations. So having ignorance allows the repetition of um, stupidity. And so you want there to be stupidity because you want there to be stuff like it is with human nature you want people to behave like life so you actually want to make your artificial intelligence stupid but not stupid by being unintelligent you want it to be stupid by being uninformed so you're not looking for artificial stupidity which is something that some designers considered for a while you're looking for kind of a, a form of ignorance and you also on another thing within the game there would have to be a way of people lying to each other gaslighting each other uh, manufacturing fake news that sort of thing and so getting to like the bottom of anything would be part of the game and you know misinformation disinformation all of that stuff would be in there and it'd be part of the game would be to talk to people that would be the main thing that you'd be doing in the game. And um, if you think about it, talking to people is like the most rich thing you can do in terms of communication. So in terms of the bit, you know, bits going in, bits going back. And if you have a game where you make it so that I can delegate some works to someone, so some underling comes up to me, and I, they say, how can I help you do X, Y, Z? Then I then say yes or no. Um, then I'm already possibly delegating something to them. Well, 
you could have it be that you have it in the game that the game plays itself by you telling things that work for you in the game to do your bidding and you are essentially programming the game but no one wants to program a game because that's going to sound like oh god i'm going to have to program the game but what you'd be doing is you'd be programming it by talking to people and so you'd have like an npc or a robot and you go to the robot and say i need you to mine some minerals on this planet and i'll come back as and when and then you come back maybe sometime later and it's gone a whole lot of minerals right you didn't have to go around going and laser some rocks because that's incredibly boring it goes off and it finds all the minerals for you so that's brilliant right then you go off and have to take some of those minerals and build another robot right and then you get it so that the robot can build robots right and then you have it so that it goes off and strip mines the whole planet right then you go off and program them to with blueprints you have to buy to be able to build cities according to certain designs and you have the architectural star magazines of the day and you kind of look it through them and say okay well, that's nice i like spires and i like all that marble and then you kind of get them to make you a marble spired city right and that would be part of the game and you would leave them on a planet with the resources that would be required to do that and go away and you come back sometime later and it would all have been done now if it was the game where you had to do that yourself and micromanage everything everything it could be kind of boring but i want to draw the focus into the dramatic and I want to make it be, you know, you dealing with other people and their troubles and emotional problems and, you know, you delegating to certain things and whatever, you know. I mean, there's um, Anne Rand's, um, A.N. Rand's uh, The Fountainhead, I think it is, where it's a book. It's about um, 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 this guy who builds a skyscraper and everyone gives them a hard time at building a skyscraper. You can write a book about that sort of topic, but you can also make it so that it's, you know, like again, like city skylines. I think if I went head on into head on competition with city skylines, it wouldn't really be a very good idea because it's already really doing its job very, very well. Uh, but if I have it so it's kind of like um, that city gets made because I've kind of delegated work to the things that make it, and then it's on a realistic time scale. So I don't often say, you know, build a firehouse and it happens before my eyes. It takes really long amount of time for it to do anything. And there's no point being there, waiting for that as a part of a gameplay loop. You shouldn't even wait for that. You should not probably even be there telling it to do stuff. You should leave that to others to do that, to make your city according to a plan of your desiring. And you should go somewhere else and find some, something else in the game to do that's interesting. But when you come back, and it could be like a month or, you know, six months later, that's all now being constructed, right? Because you can't have it be that cities are really, really fast to make. Because if players in the world are in competition about colonizing planets and building cities, then um, it's just the whole whole of the Milky Way that's going to get covered in cities you know, within the first year. And it needs to have a game which has got some longevity. And then the things that people create, um, and all it has to store is for their given profile, they have like a ceiling on the number of um, planets that they can build on and the number of continents they can build cities on. And then they go off and they go to these planets, they try and occupy the main continents and build cities on them. And the same planet can be shared by more than one person, but not shared in a necessarily nice way. And they can have wars on planets. So you can have a situation like risk 
and then kind of situation like diplomacy so that people are trying to avoid a war and that's so that they can have time in peace in order to then make the means by which they can then have a war and have the ammunition for the war so the game is enormous but again when it comes down to it it's like how do you play it and so you play it like this you move around and you look around and then you press this like you say a you go hey and someone goes what and then you go they can't see you and they say something to you because they know because the game knows what you're trying to do what your goals are your intentions and so they thought of its finesse that they will talk about themselves and what they people always talk about themselves and then you listen to them, you humor them, and they're the thing, you finesse them, and there's a kind of like mutual respect factor in the communication. And if you get past all of that bullshit, then they'll say, What, well, you know, how have you been? And this, that, and the other. And you say, Oh, right, you're still with the wife. And you go, Yes, right? So, you know, you care about people, you're empathetic. You, there's a whole gauntlet you have to run through in a conversation. And then they remember that there's a thing that you wanted because the game slips it in there and it might on a random basis be you get something fruitful out of the conversation that furthers your adventure and they'll ask you you know yes no about something and you go either y for yes or x for no right and because all of this can be going on and they could get really boring talking about themselves you want to be able to politely say goodbye so you go b for goodbye they could walk off and just break away but that would, could, could be seen as rude and next time you go and see them they might not want to talk to you now with this system you're not locked in in a kind of mass effect style thing where you're in a context where we're in a conversation and you pick options and you, like you pick the thing and then shepherd says something different from what you picked and all of that nonsense you're literally saying yes no hi and bye that's all you said to say but the questions that are the yes no questions come from the people you engage with and they're determined by what you're doing in the game and the game is trying to make it interesting at any given time to have a question come up that will be not too obviously forcing the narrative that's that's the art of the whole thing and i think this is possible to do and there's another way of doing stuff which is using a d-pad and you use a d-pad to send military forces into battle and stuff right and use that to control and send them you know to attack something or flank them or whatever or retreat so you've got something where your control on that side of things is kind of like like that and the other one is kind of like like that right so that's that's the difference in the controls and it it seems very limiting but this is what i've come up with because the controller barely does anything in terms of the inputs and you can't say and talk to it and it can't have natural language recognition and you wouldn't want it to rely on that because people have tried this in the past with connect and talking to connect and they felt fucking stupid so having it so that you were talking to a video game your wife comes in the room saying who are you talking to it's no, no good it fails right so um having it so you're quietly passively sat there silently doing this and stuff and the game's doing that and sometimes people in the game are talking to you that's fine and that's everyone's accepted that as the style of what a game is so the silent protagonist means that because you are not yourself voiced you're only using gestures and then when you do yes no hi bye it's kind of like it, it might be like nods and shaking your head and things like that um that's 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 fine um so uh all of that communication system is actually taking away from this being used for what it would regularly be used for, kind of like re reloading the weapon and swapping the weapons and punching someone in the face, etc., and jumping. And you're thinking, how will I ever do without all of that? And there's ways of getting to those buttons 
and their functions by holding this down and then these things will do that if you happen to have a weapon equipped but if you don't happen to have a weapon equipped these will do different things depending on your circumstances and that's that right so there's a lot to all of this and i've been thinking about it for a very long time um, but i haven't really been developing the plot or the characterization of the game um much over this period because there's like no point because i don't know how much of it is technically possible and i've got to make it so that i can get to what's possible you know i've got to do the bottom up stuff to get to the top down stuff to then see how much i can do but i think it is possible i've seen other people since i started my idea do exactly what i was doing so i've seen hello games do no man's sky years after i had the idea of doing something like that and i've seen uh cloud imperium games do starters years after i came, came up with an idea similar and my idea is bigger my idea is bigger than gta 6 and um but the only thing about it that people will go, okay, this sounds like one guy who's, you know, um, got megalomania or something. Um, the thing is about it is I obviously recognise I'm the only one doing it. <clears throat> and so the compromise is that it can't look amazing graphics. It's going to allow you to do amazingly deep rich engagement engaging things things that you have never done in the game before but it's not going to look like the last of us two that's the, that's a compromise um so i'm not gonna give myself a hard time over aesthetics and um that is something that if people have a problem with, then the game's not for them. But you look at the number of people playing Minecraft, and the, the aesthetics in that are like, give your, give your eyes cancer. So it's like, okay, fine. It's it, Obviously, how things look is not really a problem. It's just not really a problem. So you, it will find an audience, most likely. And you have a game like Starfield, have a big team spend years on it and it is incredibly boring to play and it people were funding it people don't like it people give it a bad score and then uh, sky everyone likes it it keeps on improving and it was made by a really small team so it's making the right thing that is the important thing now, as to the the notion of Eric Weinstein and locking himself out of the theory of everything, there is something about that which I think is interesting because when I had lost my work and I had to think through the ramifications of every choice I made in the syntax because it would mean that, okay, it allows you to make this construct, but it, I won't be able to use it for other things right i had to really 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 think hard and it took me 38 hours of consistent thought to get through to the whole thing of like now i scrape the bottom of the barrel of everything i can do and this is it can't be better than this and i was a step 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 and i didn't go backwards it's weird thinking back on it i didn't go into things and once I made a resolute decision that that's how that now was I didn't go and revisit it because I'd already considered everything so thoroughly up to that point that when I went, made the choice at that point I'd completely like a chess game searched the entire chess game right to the end so um I effectively solved the problem um and there was no better way it could have been and then i was very tired and i went and slept for a very long time and then i thought well 
okay, I messed it, but I'm not going to look at it because what if it's bad? And so I um, left it for a week and came back and looked at it and was like, wow, this is perfect. I mean, this is actually good. I, I'm amazed that I've done this. And I did it like in one stint from scratch in 38 hours. But obviously informed by 25 years of research and what I could pull out of my tired brain. Um, you know, I was very, very petrified. I'd forget the whole thing. That was the problem. Now that might have been what was happening with Eric in the pandemic. And he had his stuff on geometric unity and he thought I might die and this might never get out and people will find my notes and they won't be able to make sense of them. And the idea, if it has any value, will never be considered by anyone and that'll be a tragedy, right? So um, I'm not putting my thing on the level of geometric unity at all, but I'm saying that it's very nice when something comes together. Though my thing is obviously small scale, it's just dealing with can you describe simulators in a way which you are totally happy with? And I'm like, yes, I'm totally happy with it, right? There's nothing about it I'd change. Is it a unification of certain selective programming paradigms that after a lot of analysis, I've decided are the ones that are the ones that are worthwhile and the other ones aren't? after lots of research and I was like, yes. So does it have the power and the sophistication and the good qualities and none of the bad qualities of those paradigms and are they in harmony? Yes. Is the manual for it going to be thick because it's got multiple paradigms? No. Um, is it going to require a lot of learning? Like, no, you probably already know how to do mathematics, so that part is going to be easy, and you probably know how to write English, so that part's going to be easy, right? So, what's the development like? Are you going to be using a compiler? No, you just write it and it works, and you can be running the program whilst you're changing it in the, in the code window, and everything is live update, so you have you're like. It's instantaneous. And so it's just like ridiculous how much more productive it is than the regular programming language because you end up encouraged into changing things you wouldn't ordinarily change and trying out ideas, which is the important thing, uh, that might make your game better, where otherwise you wouldn't have dared because it's like, oh, you know, it's working now. Can we not just leave it working rather than change it? just to see if we could get a marginal improvement, which might not be there and then have to revert to the previous code. So that's where you are with it. And then you say, is there an analogy to the theory of everything where it's like, it kind of grows itself out of nothing and it, it somehow, the idea is, it can't be any other way and it's inexorable and natural and stuff. I suppose a bit, but only within the space of its own ideas in terms of culture. The culture that it's located and situated in has to pre-exist, has to be there for it to have been natural within that environment. So it's it's more like akin to a unified field theory than it is to a theory of everything. But a theory of everything, I would think, will explain how you got the one you got rather than another one. Whereas a unified field theory would be quite happy to have 20 so parameters in the standard model saying, well, we've observed this to be the case, that's a fine structure constant, etc., etc." And in my language, things are a certain quirky way because things are a certain quirky way in mathematics. So, you know, the integer sign being Zalan is like, I don't know why they decided to do that, but okay, I'm going to have to go along with the way that they are because if I start making it different, 
it won't be like mathematics anymore, will it? So, yeah, there's, you know, why is it that the quaternions aren't a Q? They're not a Q. They're an H. So, um, I think it's not useful to think about um, a theory of everything, to be honest. And I think having a smaller ambition and just doing a unified field theory is like plenty big enough. And I have been working on a unified um, ultimate programming language. And it's not like It, it has to be the way it is because of the culture it's come up in. So it's not, if it was final, it would be separate from all culture. It would be, um, it would be like, how can I put it? It would be objective from, like, okay, let's say I have a language. Uh, and I don't mean a computer language, I mean any kind of form of communication. There's a thing called Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and they say that in certain languages you have certain more articulacy compared to other things, depending on what you're talking about. So like Eskimos talking about snow is a classic example. And you could imagine that there might be languages that we don't know, maybe they're alien languages, and these alien languages have things that they can talk about that we can't talk about. So that came up with Stephen Wolfram and Arrival, where he and his son worked on the language in Arrival and made it so the aliens there were able to talk in terms of nonlinear concepts to do with time travel and impart that to the actress. And she was then able to, you know, um, um, essentially ha have the gift to time travel sort of thing and um it's kind of like the reason why you are stuck in linear time is you can't think the right way because your language is deficient and if you have the right way to think you kind of have this kind of higher consciousness or something then you wouldn't be stuck in the rut of how you are. And it's like, okay, I don't I fully understand the film, actually. I mean, I like the film a lot, it's one of my favorites, but I, I don't know, I fully understand what they're driving at there. But anyway, my take on it is that if you go off and you have something whereby you know, you could have like an imagine a, a perfect language. What would the perfect language be? And it wouldn't be like human language. It would be uh, what language do angels speak? Okay. Um, you know, what language do pan dimensional beings speak? Because if they've been around for billions of years, they might have optimized their language to the nth degree, right? To make sure that there's no concept left unturned because their other previous languages have had a blind spot somewhere. Is there, in a sense, a universe of discourse um, which is has some parts that are inaccessible to it because of language having limitations? I mean, if you don't say swear words, there's a whole bunch of things in conversation that you can't access because you have a thing about swear words, right? So, um, there might be something there where it's like, for me working on language, and I've worked on a language where I've given myself the constraints of making it like mathematics, making it like English. Those are quite parochial Western assumptions. And it might be that if I had made it like Arabic, because, you know, Algorithma um, 
was a guy, Al Charisma was this guy who came up with algorithms. Who's to say that they're not having some cultural advantage in their language or Indians have some cultural advantage with Hindi that we're missing? Um, you just don't know. Um, you know, there are a lot of Jewish scientists. Is it the Hebrew? Uh, Yiddish, is that something that there's something about the way you think in that language that gets you perhaps in friction with the language or the culture that you're in, which is opposing, is literally in opposition character-wise and the way you read. Um, is that something that's stimulating you into having... Um, you know, opposing thoughts, you know, you've got Walter Benjamin, who's, I think, is a Jew, I think, isn't he? And he's, and Karl Marx, I think, was a Jew. And so they're, like, having opposing thoughts to Adam Smith, who's, like, very, very white English. So I'm not saying all Jews are communists. I'm just saying that the concept of counter-cultural dominance of communism is one where it's come from people who read backwards. So I'm not saying that to be anti-Semitic in any way. I mean, it's arbitrary which way you read. The Chinese are reading top to bottom. The Romans read left to right and right to left, back to left to right. So it's boostrophedonic. Okay, so the Egyptians are reading think top down um with their cartouches and everything and their birds and whatever so you know it's i think it might be something to do with right hand dominance because you are going and you are writing that that you're making sumerian shapes on the tablet and then it's the clay and you want to uh, perhaps make it so that you don't mark the tablet you've already marked um, and like ink went in ink from a fountain pen that's like with we'll, we'll use the right hand write it and it's still wet and if you were to go the other way it would mess up and put ink all over your hand um, they always try and get you, if you're left-handed, to try and write with your right hand when you're at school. Um, I don't know. I think the whole thing, the theory of the thing, is something that can't really be dealt with <clears throat> because of the problem of the universal discourse. And I think that's intractable. If you include the universe of discourse in the term everything, then it can't be answered because you can't be objective towards the universe of the discourse. There's no way of being outside of it because you can't be outside of it and then talk about it. Because you have to be in it to have the ability to talk. So... Um, so I was saying he asked me um, to have a big picture understanding of it I think maybe yes um, to an extent and I've spoken to Eric and I explained it to him and he didn't have a major problem with what I said um, so well he didn't have any problem with what I said so um but I'm, I am very much a lay person. So, you know, there could be a lot of things I've said that were wrong. I'm not sure that I've got it right to say that SO2N is equal to SUN. Because I just saw a video just today and they was talking about it and it said something and I thought, what? So, you know, it might be I've misunderstood um, those groups uh, in group theory. So, but I'm sure I read it in a book that that was a relationship. So, um, 
Um, ice Cream said hello at 8 a.m. That's two hours ago. Brandon Landon said hi to Ice Cream. Are you talking about quantum computers? We weren't talking about quantum computers. Um, you can try reinforcement learning with a physics engine instead. Use PyBullet or something. PyBullet is a lightweight and open source. I have a GitHub and a good amount of starter code. Look at PyBullet or Godot or Blender if you have too many assumptions. I, if you want, I can share with you my repository. Um, really enjoyed all the commentary regarding programming languages to stream. Really? What, Rebol and C++ and C and... Interesting. I mean, wouldn't it be hypothetically possible to, once you've made sufficient progress, show your game to a game publisher if they like what you're doing, give you a team of people solely for working on the graphics? Interesting thought. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing I would like more than that is multiplayer. Like, I think it's probably feasible for me to do the multiplayer where it's just people who say, I've colonized this place, and it goes to a server, and it registers the fact that that's where they you know, planted their flag, so to speak, and then someone else goes there, and they get to see that that was a city there. Um, that is important that that works, otherwise you're not doing a, um, a 4X. But as to like having, you know, a territorial battle on a planet, that's somehow got to work where people are able to, I mean, you can't really do it where someone's invading a planet for space and they are, um, you know, you've got everything set up nice, and made a nice city, and then someone comes in and nukes it from orbit. I've decided that that wouldn't be something that would be very popular because people put in a lot of effort into creating their stuff and then they get wiped out by someone who happens to have a nuke. So the way it would work is you put things into the game for yourself and then a copy of it would then be available to be shared elsewhere. Now, the sharing process, I thought, well, what if the sharing process was actually like locked in? So there was like one universe that was the one that was the one that was being possibly transformed, possibly being nuked. And then the ones that you had like with your private copy of that was what you did. So like if I go around and I make my city, my city and my console can't can't be changed. And then if I go and fly over to some person's planet, like, um, I can't think of a planet, planet Jemison in Starfield, right? And I decide to new, new Atlantis. The person who built New Atlantis, because it's like their game, they don't see a change. Because on their game, on their console, it's going to look the same, right? But for me, when I went there, it downloaded onto my, system that the planet was the deterministically procedurally generated planet comes over to my system and then it sends over to me information about what the city looks like whilst i'm flying there right that's the important thing it takes time to get there so that's the opportunity in which you get to do all the loading and so that comes in and so you get to fly down immediately and it's all there no loading screens but it cheated because it loaded it because it's the only place that you could visit because it's the only Goldilocks planet that would support a city. Yeah? Okay. So you, you warp there, you fly in from the gas charts because you can't warp in directly into orbit like um, in Star Wars. That's out of the way because if you could have people turn up directly in orbit over a planet, you could immediately start bombarding it like they do in uh, The Last Jedi. You know, um, Star Destroyer shows up, start bombarding the base. You want to make it so that that's unsafe and you have to be outside of the solar system when you come in with your warp drive. Otherwise, you mess up the planets. Okay, it's that powerful thing that otherwise um, 
and that's basically for gameplay reasons. Um, and then the stuff happens to you on the way to getting into the Goldilocks planet. So you've got you know all sorts of other planets to visit maybe on the way there, um, and space stations and pirates and various stuff to get through to get to the place that you actually interested in going. So you you going and immediately going where you want um, shouldn't be a thing and you shouldn't have fast travel in the game. Uh, so that's a mistake of Starfield. Um, but of course they put that in because the game wasn't very interesting. Um, so you will get to the planet, you'll have continuous from orbit down to the planet flight and because that seems to be what people want. Um, and you can land anywhere. Um, but with a city, there's a bit of a wrinkle because it's like, well, what will they do about you flying your massive ship down and just crashing on top of everything, right? Like Independence Day. That's not going to be very popular. So there's going to be um, places that have got a developed society will have um, um, mines in, in the space, right? So, you know, if you get to the technology level of being able to put up more than Sputnik for more than a few years and space visitors start become a thing, you'll mine all around your planet in space to stop visitors coming in. Um, so, um, and this might be what Space Force is all about, you know, that Donald Trump has started. So um, you don't know what they know and why they've started that up. Um, at least they're considering that as a vulnerable front that needs to be defended. Um, so you have all of that, and then how does it work? You have... Um, You have, you go to someone's planet and you are seeing a copy of it that is independent and you can modify it, you know, like you can like destroy it um, and it's not going to affect what they have. Um, and so you're happy because you get to destroy stuff. They're happy because they get to create stuff. Same goes for you. You get to create your stuff. They get to destroy stuff. Now, there's going to be a discrepancy here because your version of the universe that you're in is going to have a history of all the actions you took. And you destroyed this place, this place, this place. And for you, it's going to seem that those places are destroyed. And for the other player, it's going to seem that they destroyed your place. You went over to theirs and you destroyed their place. They went over to yours while maybe you were over there and destroyed yours. You get back to your place, it's still there. They get back to their place, it's still there. They go and come over to see your place. It's gone, it's destroyed. I go back to check on you, it's destroyed. How does that work? It works because my game remembers my actions and everything I've done will be a diff, what's called a diff, it will be a difference of what was procedure generated the last time around. So it will be, I'm flying through and I'm walking through into the star system, it will be recreating the city as it was every time, and then I will have it say, okay, what were the things I did when I last here? And it will go off and run those things as I was doing them again, so it will run through time again from the point at which I had arrived before, and it will run that time line again to recreate the state of the city so that when I get there, it is how it was. Now, time will have elapsed, so that has to be factored in as well. But it would do the part that was in the past when I was last there, and the part when it might be reconstructing after me attacking it, that will also have been happening and it will do that as I fly in towards the planet. So there's plenty of it stuff for it to think about as I am going close to the planet and it's doing stuff. And if I am on the really small scale of G 
just going to a city, going into a bar and punching someone on the nose who's a regular. And then I fly across the galaxy and come back again, go in the same bar again. The dude's still sitting there. He'll have a broken nose. And he'll have a broken nose because my spool file of all the things that I do with my controller, including punching people, will include a note saying, by the way, you went, went through a punch at this point in time in the game when you're at these coordinates. And it's not even having to say who I punched because who I punched and where they were is completely deterministic. So the guy is effectively putting himself in the way of my fist that is recollected to have been thrown into those space-time coordinates. And that will then break his nose. But I'm not there to witness this happening. It's all done behind the scenes. And then I show up and he's got a broken nose. And he's, or he's got it fixed, but it's like he's got, you know, he's sniffing because it's like it doesn't work anymore because it's got a deviated septum because it's broken internally and it hasn't been set correctly, right? But that will happen off hand, off, off, off screen, right? So this is the depth of how things will be. And it's very, very, it's going to be very deep game to do. But I'm hopeful that that will be good. And it's getting other people involved in making it, they could spoil it. Um, and if I get a big company in, in on it early, that could be a mistake. But where I would like their expertise is with multiplayer. Because I like playing Call of Duty and I like Demonware um, as a server because it's based on Erlang, which is communication protocol language. It's got very good, um, um, very good quality where it's like nine nines of uptime, where it means it like it's like nine ninety nine point would be ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time it's running so i could go on call of duty modern warfare right now and it would just quickly into a lobby quickly populated with people and and start shooting people right and i like that and i want to make a game a bit like that but i want to make a game that's also a talking game so i'm thinking how do i marry these two things and it's like well you talk in order to have the diplomatic part to kind of have the preparations for war. And then you want to make it so that you're not just stuck being the bureaucrat. You can swap what character you are. Yeah. So you could be president and you could order a war and then think, well, it's kind of a bit boring being president. I'm going to jump into being someone else and I'm going to be on the battlefield. Not as president, but as someone who is fighting on the battlefield. And that person would die, and then you jump into someone else, jump into someone else, and it would just be like you can pursue within at least your own side of your own faction uh, the control of any uh, of these uh, characters and um, hopefully keep the game interesting. And... Um, the whole kind of concept that games have, of like you can only be one character at any one time, is a bit old hat. And I was quite pleased to see that GTA V broke away from it. Um, but I wasn't quite pleased with the way they implemented it because they had like, well, they had Franklin, who was a thought was a loser. They had Michael, who was thought was a sap around his wife and, and daughter. And they had Trevor, who was extremely violent and thoroughly unpleasant. I didn't know why the other two wanted to know him. Then I made my own character in GTA Online, who was like a Russian woman. And I was really happy with the way that she looked and the clothes she was dressed in. And even though she had zero characterization, I liked her a lot more. And I empathize with her. And she goes into GTA Online and she gets shot. And I'm upset <laughs> because I'd actually made an investment into the character through me making the character. So, you know, just the act of having a captain, picking them and saying, yes, I'll be a woman and I have this white, white suit and I look quite sharp. It's 
it's enough for you to have some kind of empathetic connection to something and you don't need your character to have lines of dialogue we know that from master chief in halo he barely barely speaks and it's not like i'm going to have my character you know saying a whole lot because i mean you don't have a fixed character in the game you know uh, it won't be one of those things where you play where you have a character and the character then makes some commentary and um, they're sort of pushing the story forward. It's um, you have agency to do with what you want. And you could, uh, there's a thing that Clint Hocking had uh, that he said, he brought up this concept, which was called Ludo Narrative Dissonance. And um, Ludo Narrative Dissonance. It, where you have it and it's the ludological stuff which is a game right i think it's greek for ludo is a game um that is um having like cognitive dissonance with the stuff that is the narratological stuff the stuff that is the story and you'll find this a lot in games that will be like the bit that you like that's the fun game part has to sometimes take a back seat to the story because they're trying to move the story forward and make it have a consequential uh reason for why you're playing the story the, the game so the game by itself as mechanics can be quite fun but then it helps to have some structure and then have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing so i mean classic example would be robotron 2084 by Eugene Jarvis and that is a game which is more or less a masterpiece and you're just a robot running around shooting things but it starts off and it talks about how you are a robotron and what that is and then how the well no on a minute it's all the robotrons are created and they rebel and they're robots and they are um you have to save the last human family so it's like it's like that maybe the story is about three sentences and it's like save the last human family from these robots and it introduces what the robots are and what they do gameplay wise and names the members of the family and you've got to go and run around and pick them up and save them from the robots because i'll get kind of crushed to death and um it's frenetic there's so many enemies on screen at once and you're kind of like oh my god i've got to go and get her and i've got to get him and then run off to get them before they you know can so you can't just stay in one spot and just fight them off and fight the robots to defend yourself you have to put yourself at risk to stop the family being killed by these robots and um it's a great game and um that doesn't have ludo narrative dissonance because it has the narrative and it pushes it all the way out to the narrative frame and so it's just a narrative framing device of a game so the game needs to have some purpose and it's like you've got to save the last human family and it's like gotcha and then you go in there and you start shooting things right so you should not expect a game to be deep but you do need to have it to have some narrative. Now, I've thought about this for a long time and I thought there's another way around it. And the other way around it is something that's called co-authored narrative. And what happens there is the game actually writes its story with you. So you are not the center of the story. You are not the main protagonist and stuff is going on and you might be a witness to some crime and then they get called in by the police to say, okay, what did you see? And from there, your choices are completely free and open to you. You are not on track to follow a given story. You can do whatever the hell you like. So you might decide to be an upstanding citizen and say, yes, I saw this, that, and the other. And then you're now in trouble with the mafia because it was a mafia crime that you were a witness to. You might say nothing 
then the mafia might you know show up and give you a present because they knew that you could have spilled the beans on them but now you're like in kind of you know dragged into the mafia in some small way because like it's not ever so simple that they like they they like you now and it's like that's kind of a problem i'd rather didn't they even knew i existed right and so there's all sorts of things you can do in that space they can like if you have a relationship with a girlfriend in the game then the girlfriend gets kidnapped like happened well they did it in grand theft auto vice uh no what was it uh liberty city where nico belich's cousin gets kidnapped because of debts and i didn't go to rescue him because i couldn't care less about him i i could stand the character um and i'm not even sure what happens to him if you don't go and try and rescue him so it's obviously a setup for like right this will be a big set piece and if you go there you'll be shooting people and stuff and then you'll rescue your cousin it'll be great right and i was like you can't make me do that now i'm now out the opening part of the game where i had to do things a certain way and i'm free to do whatever i like i'm giving me a whole city here i'm going to go around the city so that's what i did and i thought this is always going to be a problem with games as soon as like you have a huge game space you're going to be ending up going into that game space but then after exploring it and exploring it and finding all the things you can do and finding it huge and open and interesting you're going to start to get bored because you can have too much right so what you need to have is you can need to have some kind of responsibilities and i call these entanglements so as you go through life your character will pick up these entanglements which will be things like you know they get a girlfriend girlfriend expects things from you um and if the girlfriend gets kidnapped by the mafia or say the the accuser then um you're like oh god what am i going to do now now maybe you use your contacts in the mafia that you formed to try and help you try and get her out of the danger you know um there's so many different ways it could play out but it's down to your choice now you could be completely callous and say i don't care she's not she's just pixels uh they can keep her sort of thing uh but to counteract that um and to counteract the whole thing about playing on a whim going around the city causing mayhem and having like a you know the equivalent of five star wanted system you would have it so that you have a kudos system which is a bit similar to the project gotham racing where you drive around the track and you accrue kudos for how well you drove so it's not crucial to come first if you have a clean race and you don't bang the sides of the track if you drift if you do emergency brake turns that sort of thing um it's like it's impressed you draft behind another car the clock the ticker goes up you chain these things together in a row and there's a risk element because if you go off and mess up and bash the side of the road then you collapse and all the points that you've built up nicely will go away so you're trying to drive as stylishly and as skillfully as possible but consistently for stretches and if you push the envelope you push your own personal best that's good and then you end up accruing points and that's that that will give you your score at the end of the game and it makes that this game is not just about racing and coming first and it can be that other people came first but you got more kudos than that right so um and they have to do it like that because when you're doing all these drifts and stuff you're slow around the track and someone just does it as fast as possible but they could be faster than you and you're more stylish than them and you win now it's a bit like playing domination hardcore domination at call of duty and you capture more flags than the enemy but you didn't necessarily kill that many people but you do really well because you capture the flags so it's like what is the metric by which you are measured for your performance and then you have to make the player aware that you are inhabiting a character 
you are in a role playing game where you are uh, playing a role and that role is this and you are like the hero so because you are the hero you really should be rescuing your girlfriend but if you were playing a character that was not formulated and characterized as a hero you wouldn't have to in fact if you went to rescue her it would be against character right it'd be out of character for you to do that and then consequently it could say well you're going to lose kudos points because of this so um i think it's important to get this you know to work where you have a um, number of different characters that you can play as you become acquainted with them you inhabit the roles kind of almost like you're playing the game as an actor and you would not be playing it as yourself or playing it to then work yourself out as an alter ego i've considered that i think it's more valuable if the characters you come across are the characters the game has to provide you because that way the game can provide you with characters that will challenge you um and and raise philosophical and moral questions so part of that is that the game will be doing a psychological evaluation of you all the time and it will be looking at your actions it'll be looking at your actions through the lens of the character you're controlling and so it will look at the things you do and you'll think okay that's we can have more of that or he might want to have variety or we might want to do this or that and they'll give you things that you have as little tests in the game that will maybe you'll overlook as significant and if you pass up on these tests it's fine it doesn't doesn't matter but it noted that you didn't take up the test so you know the test would be like you know are you going to intervene in this situation um are you going to be consistent with your character and be callous here um and that sort of thing and if you veer away from the characterization you're supposed to be then um it both affects the kudos but it also informs it as to like okay well we'll give you some different characters next time around because this one is obviously not suiting you right so if i was an actor and i was playing a part and i said here's a script you're supposed to be this character and i do a bad job of it they're not going to hire me for that kind of role again because i've proven that i'm no good as a romantic lead let's say right then the next time they say, right, try you as an action hero, right? We have to cut the beard and the hair and smart yourself up a bit, right? Lose some weight. And they're like, okay, we might, we might be able to do that then, right? Um, this, it would be a question of like trying you out on things. It, it might even work for this to work through just random. So, it would try you out on something, it would try you out on the next random thing, but the next random thing would not be like the last thing you tried. And then that way it would kind of put things in front of you to you to try out. And then because you could switch away from characters, you would choose when you could disengage from the experience and say, that wasn't for me. And that would soon take you to something else that was for you. So that's probably simpler as a program, actually. Um, so there's still lots of stuff to work out about this. And if you were to say, what's the story? Who are you playing as? It's like, you don't understand. That's not the kind of game it is. It's far broader than that. And you can be basically anyone in your, your side of things. And then, then get tired of being that person and jump into someone else and then get back to being that person later and you know the game is there to serve you and be entertaining to you so but i mean you can't if you have people in opposition with in the story that would be npcs you can't go off and just jump into them to get them to do something to serve your character and their interests and then jump back into your character that that won't work right there's like um friendly characters and then there's enemy characters or kind of 
not your group characters and then there'll be not your group neutral characters and um you're not always in a position to jump between characters it's it is limited to some extent um okay um That said, graphics never been the reason that I did or didn't enjoy a game. Good. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Can you discuss quantum resistant ledger cryptocurrency and how is it resistant to quantum computers works? I don't know anything about that. Um, I'm sorry, I missed your thing earlier. I'm getting the I getting the idea that maybe people are talking about stuff that might be bots in the chat but I mean I suppose if you're online long enough um, people come in and do stuff you know I don't think this person doing the the kitchen is that noisy what do you reckon I do the reaction now um, How are we doing now? I'll do it at 11 and it's now, so I've done seven hours. So I will do the reaction and um, I'll do it in 10 minutes. And if there's drilling and it's noisy, it's noisy. Um, and how long have I got? It's gonna be evening time by the time I finish, but I can still do my bins in the evening. It won't be terrible. Um, so we'll do that. So we'll put that down here. Oh, we don't want that. Okay. That's good. And then, right. Um, I got the lecture. I haven't even got the video of the lecture. That's good. That's a good start. Um, that's all the paper. Then we're going to have this be the lecture. It's funny. I had all of these things set up for where it was going to be jumping in that would be governed by forces that were dark this here is where he talks about uh chirality and it's um chirality is not fundamental but it's only emergent and the chiral complements of dark matter so this slide from the lecture in 2013 proved it was u 6464 and um well it's it's like very very crucial and important and it's in the description of my video why this is crucial and important and um um because he in the lecture says that his group is u128 that's inconsistent from what it says here and that led some people to misconstrue um what it was that he was proposing and um you know criticize it unfairly and they should have waited five weeks for him to publish and um that would have been much better because they would have looked and they would have seen the paper and they would have said oh you're doing this and it's totally different from what i said you were doing and um they would have shut up about their criticisms funny enough though this came out and they went and did a video um let's see this came out in april they did a video in june they invited on to talk about their critique and they said all the same things again and then it was established that they hadn't read this they hadn't read this they had read 
Section 8 and the appendix, and then they've done a text search, and they've typed in a, a short string that they have, were looking for. And they were like, well, I didn't find that in there. So it's irrelevant to you know me having commentary on it. And I just thought, he needs a better quality of critic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this... Um, I want this to be uh, out of the way of the names, and I want this to be, um, let's see, if I do zoom on that, that's all right, and I want this to be, uh, we want this to be here as well. Now, the thing about this is you might think, well, I need to see the the lecture bigger than this. But that would be the wrong way to think about it because, okay, I can zoom in, but that's not the point. The point is, is to, if I have him writing on the blackboard, then you might think, well, surely, you know, I need to be able to read what's on the blackboard as he writes it. But I don't think that's a big problem because the things he writes on the blackboard are in the lecture here, in the lecture notes here, where it will come through here, and it'll be better printed on this than he writes it here. So here we've got Einstein field equations, which is better than he does in the lecture. He does this and he writes okay he writes it like this semi-romanian metric structure something that allows us to take length and angle so that we can perform measurements at every point in this space time or higher dimensional structure leaving us a little bit of headroom the equation most associated with this is the Einstein field equation. And of course, I've run into the margin. So it says, that a piece of the Riemann curvature tent. So you got that, right? And you're thinking that's too small for the stream, right? Okay. And then you go off and you look at where it is written here. So he says, the equation most associated with this is the Einstein field equation. And of course I've run it to the margin. And then you go off and then say, let's scale it up. And this is what he, has written that, except there's an error of transcription where they put in a one and he has it as an S. Um, and I don't know that he has written an, an eight over that. So that looks a bit different. So I, I can't see from the angle here what he's writing here, but it's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be over um c4 so we go and we find what it should look like um we go to preview and we got it there right so that's the um thing it's right handy right there and that's the einstein field equation and you see that it's got this term c4 um, and then if we want the other one that's of importance, which is the uh, one for the standard model, uh, it looks like that. And I've written it vertically because there wasn't any room elsewhere to put it. And that has um, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And that is um, all gathered up inside of this group U128 double struct C. That sign there is the um, 
means it's a set inclusion site. Oh, hold on a minute. No, that's that's the wrong way round. I've got the set round the wrong way. That that is inside of that drat. That's round the wrong way. Bugger. I'm not going to leave that there. That, that is like, that's the element of that. So that's not what, that's wrong. That's wrong. Damn it. So can I take that into the uh, thing and change it? New, open, kind So this is it and um, we've got to swap that around so we're going to do this we're going to do this we're going to do this we're going to do that and then we're going to do that and then we're going to do this There, fixed. Okay. And then we're going to do now. If we, what happened to my document? Where is it? If it's Uh, that's now correct. It's now facing the right way, isn't it? Maybe it was me writing it upside down. Oh, no, I'm writing it uh, vertically that threw me off. Okay, so... Um, we... That's the thumbnail. That's my files. We need some files. Everything seems to be over here on this on the screen. And then we got this. Right, we want to bring all that back underneath this. Um I do think I probably need this. Um this thing under everything else on the previous page because it's going to be helpful because when I bring everything else on top then I can go and uh, need to put in the pa papers There, okay, so that's a good setup. And I've got the names of the people, and I can go off to refer to them when he talks about them. And then, oh, that one's called color, okay. So these are the main equations, and I've just been looking at the other one. So, um, yeah, okay. Okay. So, I don't think that drilling is as loud. It seems to be more near the back of the house. Um, I'm going to be doing it.
Okay. Somehow that's moved down. Right, let's see if I can hear myself. There's a lot of lag on this screen. See if I can hear myself. Wow. See if I can hear myself. That's perfect. Okay. We're going to have to go back to the beginning. There we are, that'll do. Um, maybe the text is going to be a bit better. That's got to be better. Okay. This is loud enough. Yeah, probably. Well, welcome to this um, special Simoni lecture. And my name is Marcus de Satoy. I'm a professor of mathematics here and the Simoni professor for the public understanding of science. And Charles Simoni prepared a manifesto when he endowed this chair to guide the holder of the professorship in their mission. And I'd like to read one part of that manifesto to you. Um, it said, scientific speculation, when so labeled, and when the concept of speculation and its place in the scientific method has been made clear to the audience can be very exciting. It is a very effective communication tool and it is by no means discouraged. And it is in the spirit of this part of my mission as a Simone professor that I would like to introduce today's Simone special lecture. I first met Eric Weinstein when we were both postdocs at the Hebrew University just over 20 years ago. And I had the feeling then that he was working on something big. But it wasn't until two years ago that Eric met me in a bar in New York, and we began, he began to explain the mathematics that he'd been working on in private for the last 20 years. As he took me through the equations he had been formulating, I began to see emerging before my eyes potential answers to many of the major problems in physics. It was an extremely exciting, daring proposal and also mathematically so natural that it started to work its magic on me. Over the last two years, I have had the privilege of being taken through the twists and turns of Eric's ideas. After our postdocs in Israel, while I went the academic route, getting my professorship here in Oxford, Eric went a more independent route, working in economics, government, and finance. So he comes here today as something of an insider and an outsider a difficult place from which to propose bold ideas. But having spent time seeing how powerful these ideas appear to be, I felt that it was time that Eric shared his ideas more widely, as I believe his perspective could give the scientific community a new story to explain some of the big questions on the scientific books. I'm therefore very happy to provide a platform here in Oxford for Eric to share his ideas on a new theory he calls geometric unity. The lecture will be approximately 70 minutes after which we will have um, a period to ask questions. Eric. Okay, so he says his ideas on a new theory. Um, in my description of this, I say the following. 
I react to the 23rd of May, I should have said 23rd of May, or May 23rd, uh, 2013 Oxford lecture on geometric unity that was given by Eric Weinstein at the invitation of Professor Marcus de Sotoy. Geometric unity isn't a theory of everything, or a theory, or a hypothesis, or a model, or a specific instantiation of a well-defined idea. Geometric unity is an incomplete work in progress program, which explores multiple speculative ideas as it inspires to become a unified field theory that seeks to replace general relativity with something less restrictive, which allows for a much more elaborate and symmetric quantum field theory. Um, and then there's stuff about uh, there to do with the fermionic field content slide. Okay, uh, I'd say at the end, um, here, um, the unitary group U6464 is a non chiral gauge group which is sufficiently elaborate for it to include as many types of fields which have left-handed spin properties as it has types of fields which have right-handed spin properties. It is the latter which are predicted to include the dark matter fermionic field content which ensures that galaxies rotate in the way that they observe to as if they had more mass spread throughout them between their luminous stellar material. Okay, so galaxies break the laws of physics. And there are two um, theories that could possibly be wrong, right? So we've got um, this one up here. That could be wrong. That's the one you think would be wrong because it refers to things in the cosmos and it's galaxies, you know, it's kind of its purview. And then there's this one, which is a standard model. And you think, oh, well, it might, it might be that that's wrong. And so you look at the standard model and you say, actually, if you think about it, over the years, it's been growing. So you started off with just U1, and then along came the extension of more stuff with the SU2, and then they unified these two in the electroweak unification, and then they added the strong force there, okay? But they didn't unify all of those. And the trend has been to add these groups, and work done by uh, Chen Yingyang and Robert Mills, who are over here, um, they were saying, well, you know, there's a way of defining uh, any arbitrary theory, which is of the form SUN. And N can take any natural number as its value. So from SU2, they were like saying, look, you could probably do SU3. That's my understanding of it anyway. And there's been an SU5 theory, which was come up with by these two people, Sheldon Glashow and Hal Gorgi, right? And that was the first attempt at a grand unified theory. So I'm not gonna get into all of that because I've covered it in previous videos, but essentially what we're dealing with here is you're saying, can you have a unification of these things which is actually more elaborate and contains more symmetries. And can those symmetries in these symmetry groups that already have symmetries, can they have an extra symmetry? And can that then, in that symmetry, whether things that spin right as well as spin left, can those spin right things um, cover the um, particles that would be the ones that would be the uh, dark matter? And it would be a subgroup of um, U128 um, C, where that C written that way is the um, infinite set of complex numbers. 
And so that gets broken down once you do the decomp decomposition into um, U6464. Okay, it splits, 128 splits into 64 and 64. And so this is where he is with his uh, work. And um, I say in the description, you see in the description, it says uh, 64, 64 in the description. And so I'm going to type in the chat here. U64, 64, um, wild spinners, and I say non chiral. So, non chiral means that it um, doesn't have a handedness, and the handedness was predicted to exist by um, Sung Dali, yeah, along the side there, and um, um, Chen Ying Yang. And I think what I'm going to do, because it's going to irritate me, I'm going to move this off here. And put it over the other side. Um, right, okay. Now I can mouse over there and won't do it anymore. So, um, we've got Chen Yi, um, Song Dao Li. Um, and Chen Ning Yang, who's like a hundred years old, and um, they were predicting that the the group SU two that's in the standard model um, that governs the behaviour of the weak force, which is to do with um, nuclear decay. Um, that um, would have a property whereby it would have a bias to um, where it would break um, a presumed mirror symmetry that was assumed to exist in the universe. And the mirror symmetry was like, well, anything that you reflect will, will remain the same. And this is the same if it's a symmetrical thing that you're reflecting. But if it's something like this, it doesn't work. So, for example, if I had my hand and I go off and point at the screen um, to touch things like, like that, okay? And I have it so that, imagine here was a mirror and I had another finger that would come to meet it would be the mirror image of it and it'll come to touch it so this is me making my own reflection with my other hand but this isn't really my my hand my right hand this is just a reflection of my left hand touching the glass then as Alice in Wonderland I step up on the mantelpiece whilst I'm still pointing at my reflection in the mirror and I step through partially and I go grab my wrist with my free right hand. Because this isn't my right hand. This is just the image reflected of my left hand. And I then pull this out of the looking glass world. It's going to be like that. And there's no configuration by which this can be made to occupy the same space as this. So it is different. Right? So... Um, that is the property of handedness. It means your left hand is different than your right hand because your thumbs are shorter, and that means that they are 
distinct so if i do that they're now the same length and they seem to be the same but now that's the back of my hand and that's the front of my hand right so that's handedness and in because mathematicians like to call things technical names they don't call it handedness they call it chirality and if you have something that's non-chiral it's like saying i have something which it um is the same when it's reflected and i don't have a good example of something that would be a non-chiral thing i suppose um well apart from the chip here this is symmetrical okay but the, the chip is what makes it chiral yeah okay so they said oh well there's going to be this property of um symmetry breaking and the parity that was thought to be exist in terms of like everything was going to be symmetrical and they thought the whole thing was going to be symmetrical in physics they had it say no not in the case of su2 and then lady by the name of Xiang Chang Wu um, did an experiment and proved this to be the case. And then um, Wolfgang Pauli um, wasn't happy about this. And he was the guy behind um, the U1 um, thing. That was the first major thing they did. So he's an important person, came up with the Pauli matrices and various other things and um although he was friends with her he couldn't accept it when his first told that uh, p symmetry had been broken so p symmetry is this property of parity uh where you would expect things to be the same and um he's like no no it can't be the case that this is um what's happening with this can't it can't be the case that this is the, the way it is oh i know what it's doing it's wanting me to resize the window while i'm at the edge of the window so if i take this and i drag it off the screen if i do that then it won't do it because it won't have a resize thing there's so much it does that is annoying that's the fault of the window system. You can't just come over here and lig around with the point. It wants you to do stuff. Okay, so I was wondering why it was not doing it. And it was like, it's because it's stupid. Um, they pack too much functionality into things. You know, every point that the pointer could be at could do something, you know, and it's like, okay um rather than taking like what is my intention and then you know i hold down the key on the keyboard and then use a mouse and it's like that key plus what i'm doing does something you know that would be how i'd do it rather than having like the context of where i have to be on the screen dictates what gets done which means i'm limited to having to be at a certain position on the screen in terms of what my articulacy is. So, yeah. You know, if you have like keys on the keyboard that you use with the mouse to do stuff, that would, there's potential there to do stuff. Um, Cause you can have all the keys produced letters on release. So if you hold down a key, then you click the mouse, it doesn't count as an input to a text field. Hmm. Um, so he asked for the experiment to be repeated. 
it was got the same result they made different equipment just do it with different equipment and got the same result and by about 1954 everyone said right okay just have to accept that there is this violation of peace symmetry now to keep it simple geometric unity could be said to restore the initial instincts of um why is it doing this? It's still doing it. Is the computer going to crash? I think the computer's going to crash. Unless the mouse has gone flat. How can the computer be going to crash? I can't move the mouse to be going to crash. It's still streaming. Oh, it snapped out of it. Okay, whatever I'm doing over there, it's not working. It's doing over there, and it's I'm losing the mouse. So it doesn't seem to help. Um, i tell you what, I won't even bother with this. It's a waste of time. If you want to change window, now would be a good time to change window. Now, I'm going to have it be there. I'm going to put those names there. I'm going to drag this in. I don't have any of my blobs. But anyway, that I can go up and down, zip, zip, that and scroll it. So that's probably better, isn't it? Let's do that. All right. So he was saying he had a new theory. Um, okay. Now, the qualification of this, I'm therefore happy to provide a platform here in Oxford for Eric to share his ideas on a new theory he calls geometric unity. Um, he just went and talked about how it is a speculative lecture, right? And scientific speculation, when so labelled, and when the concept of speculation that's placed in the scientific method has been made clear to the audience, can be very exciting. It is a very effective communication tool, and it's no mean discouraged. And it is in this spirit. Or well, this part of my mission that I would like to introduce today's Simone special lecture. Okay, so he said it's speculative, right? Now, then he contradicts himself by saying that it is a theory. And he's saying to share his ideas on a new theory. So I think that's overstating things to say it's a theory. And I should have been a bit more careful. It's not a hypothesis. It's not a model. This is not a single well-defined idea. I mean, it's not, what do I say? It's not, it's not a specific instantiation of a well-defined idea. He hasn't picked a single idea. He's considering lots of ideas. Right, that's not to knock it, it's to say it's a work in progress and is really a, a speculative work in progress, it will remain so for some time. And people need to get off this notion that it's a theory, it's certainly this notion that it's a theory of everything because it's got a long way to go before it's even a unified field theory. It needs to have all sorts of things about it that are partially defined or, um, you know, missing or um, lacking a formal definition.
get a formal definition, which is pretty important because these are not sort of trivial things. These are like parts of construction that are necessary. And I don't doubt that he'll be able to do it. This is the thing. I think he will. And then once he's done all that, then he needs to do the unification, which I was covering earlier today about, um, well, no, I was covering that yesterday about the process of unification and how that will go and what was involved in the direct square root. So that video, um, which is, I think, the previous one to this, I go into a lot more depth about how he is going to be going about doing his unification based off what I've understood of him and his paper on that score. And that would be me going... Um, okay, I'm going to find, have to find a way to get to the paper more easily. Um, oh, I don't know what to do. We don't need all of that there. We don't need all of that there. We only need like one page. See how stupid it is. It, it doesn't crop the bottom of the page. It it's retarded. You want to have the bottom go up and the top stay visible and this cut off the bottom. It's like, why? Why? Some people wouldn't react to that, but it doesn't need to be like that. And you'll see, when I've designed my own graphical user interface, you'll be using it and you won't even notice that it's like frictionless and you're working at the speed of thought you just won't even notice you won't notice everything will be like so incredibly optimized around what it should be like that it'll just be like people won't remark on it it'll be natural like why it wasn't always like this like well it wasn't always like this because um people just didn't know better so there we go we can access both now relatively easily and i i suppose i could have made this a tab of the other thing but we're doing this so this is going to be getting to the theory Oh, that should be up the other end, up the other end. Are you telling me I haven't got the tablet up the page up after all of that? I haven't even got the page up. Oh yes I have. But I need this close I probably won't find it here. 58. Um why is it there? I see. Um, I feel that that's in the wrong place. We'll move that to the end. And then, I don't know. Anyway, this thing here, and if it seems small, it gets bigger because we can do that. So, um, we can go in and we can make it fit the width. Okay. It'd be nice if this zoom was automatic and it would just fit to the text and you wouldn't have to 
hand to do it. Um, don't know why it can't do that, but they are. Um, it's pretty obvious I'm doing the same thing every time, you know. Um, this I want to make it larger. I want my views onto the content to be views onto the content. So here we have um, his proposed unification. In equation 12.10. And um, we'll see this thing. Einstein Dirac. The square root of Yang Mills, Heath Klein Gordon. And I've gone into um, some depth as to what's involved in all of that. Okay. And that was in the I think the previous video. So I want people to be able to pick up on the things I'm saying. So that would be page um, 58. And that will help you find that. So you can look at it yourself. Which is So um, this is unfinished, okay? So this is sort of work left to be done. Um, and we will now return to the beginning of the paper um, here and uh, continue from here. I don't know if these are all in the right order now. Um, so he's had the introduction and now we're going to go forward from here you know what? i think it's actually easier if i do just make this a tab so i just put it at the front and pop that there and then i'll drag this down like that yield to that okay so but that is actually now out of position and that there needs to be a bit narrower There, that's better. That's set. That's a good setup. So we have that, and we'll just see how this is with this. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Okay. So, right, Eric Weinstein begins. So, so it's a uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Oxford. Uh, for those of you who are not aware. Um, it is possible that no other university in the world has kept so tightly uh, and kept the faith for so long with uh, Einstein's great vision of a final theory for physics as a theory of pure geometry, sort of elegance and simplicity of the highest order. And the names that are associated with Oxford that uh, weigh heavy on me are Atia, Penrose, Siegel, Woodhouse, Hitchin, a very long list of people who uh, even when fashion uh, did not hold those ideas in favor, uh, always kept the faith that there was much to be learned from the geometric perspective on physics. Of course, unified field theory, in some sense, acquired a stigma with Einstein's failure to find it, in the sense that even someone like Einstein, uh, being tempted by the siren song of geometry, uh, might lose their footing and go astray. And in the years since, we've had a replacement theory, which is that what is really calling our generations is the, is the quest to quantize general relativity and gravity. And I'd like to, to go back to the sort of earlier perspective that um, there is no evidence 
to date in my mind that we are being called to quantize general relativity directly. Uh, in fact, there's been more effort spent on that quest uh, without very <laughs> tangible results than Einstein spent as one man searching for years for unified field theory. So we have to, in some sense, begin to undo some of what we think we know in order to truly reconsider and allow me to put some of these ideas before you today. Right, ideas. Marcus asked me to begin presenting uh, these ideas here. And hopefully this is a first opportunity, but if the ideas are not good, um, then uh, Lightning and say, Miles will lead you to- Doesn't say theory, it says ideas. But uh, in the event of a good flight, uh, hopefully this will begin a conversation rather than end one. I feel in some sense that I'm presenting the works of another man, a younger man, uh, someone who came of age right in the middle of the great string theory boom uh, with the anomaly cancellation in 1984. And I look at this work and I see a young person struggling with the idea, why can't I see that string theory is going to answer all of these questions over the next 10 years as we were told at the time? And making a very dangerous decision, which was, I think I'm not going to follow that particular path and I'm going to follow another. And it's not clear where this path is going to lead us, but we're going to explore it today and see um, as best we can. So in some sense, I've been able to polish some of that young man's work, but I'm also struggling to reconstruct it because as someone spending full time on that theory, he knew a lot of things that I no longer know. Okay. That's the first so, bit to the share. That, by the uh, as a beginning, I'm just going to say one disclaimer, which is that this is not a usual talk. And whatever contract a speaker usually has with the audience, uh, right now we're going to break that contract. This is a, con this is a talk about ideas. I mean, some of these ideas are bold. Some of them may offend some people because there's a sense that you don't have a right to be considering those ideas. Mm -hmm. I go back to the admonition of Jim Watson that said, if you're going to try to make progress, big progress, you are by definition unqualified to be doing whatever it is that you're doing. So, okay, he's not listed in my list of names because he's a geneticist. So if we go, um, That's James Watson, molecular biologist, geneticist. In 1953, he co-authored with Francis Crick the academic paper proposing the double helix structure of the DNA molecule. Uh, they want the Nobel Prize. Um, Oh, Rosalind Franklin. So um, they did use the double helix of DNA, but she, they relied on the experimental data collected at King's College, mainly by Rosalind Franklin, for which they did not provide proper attribution. Yes, yeah, bad, isn't it? So they wouldn't have been able to do it without her work. And this is the, she was an X-ray crystallographer who photographed DNA, and they were the ones that thought, oh, this is probably um, a double helix, this is sort of, this sort of thing. And she couldn't see that that was the structure of the thing, okay? So they did a dirty, and this is not for the first time. Um, so... Uh, let's go on from here. So, um, lots of nasty people in science, actually, if you dig into it. Um, current picture of physics. What is physics to physicists today? Okay, that's 
Oh, Ed Witten. Uh, Ed Witten's down here. Edward Witten. Um, okay. So we might have to look up him. This is Edward Witten. And um, then we might have some videos of Edward Witten, which is, might be worth watching. There is this video that is possibly of interest. So uh, I think this is worth watching if anyone hasn't seen it. Now it is in Italian, but I do think it's pretty good. So um, he's a very good communicator. So let's make this bigger. You might say, well, why can't he be bigger? But <laughs> um, this is um, just so that we've got some. I'm probably going to get a copyright strike to do this, but anyway. We're not going to show much of this. <clears throat> they, sh they shouldn't mind if I'm t staring people in the direction of their content. The story that leads to relativity began in the 19th century with the work of Maxwell Faraday and others on electricity and magnetism. They weren't originally trying to describe light, but when Maxwell discovered how to write equations that described electric and magnetic forces, an amazing thing happened. And those equations actually also predicted and described the propagation of light waves. And as it turned out later, also radio waves, TV waves, gamma rays, and so on, which are all different manifestations of the same basic phenomenon, the same basic kind of wave seen with different energies that came out of Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations have the very funny property that they tell you that light waves will travel in any direction at the same speed that we call the speed of light, regardless of how the light waves are created. That's very funny because, for example, I might throw a ball and it has a certain speed, but if I'm standing on top of a railroad truck when I throw the ball, it'll come out with a bigger speed the speed of the train plus the speed with which I can throw the ball. So the speed a ball has when I throw it isn't just a property of the ball. It also depends on my state of motion when I throw the ball. Mm -hmm. But Maxwell's equations say that light always has the same speed in any direction, regardless of how it was created. Now, it took decades before the significance of this sank in. For one thing, people didn't believe it. It was tested experimentally by Michelson and Morley, mm -hmm. who found it was right. That wasn't, I don't think, what they thought they were doing when they did the experiment, but that was the answer they got. But even after the experiment, people were confused about what it meant. And physics was in a state of confusion in the late 19th and early 20th century. The time was right for a new theory, which was Einstein's relativity. Mm -hmm. But Einstein was the one who had the bold thinking to put it together. Einstein's point of view was to accept that the equations of electricity and magnetism were correct okay. and that our traditional intuition, which physicists expressed in the form of Newton's laws of motion, was what had to change. I see. So he developed a new theory, or at least a new way of looking at existing theories. He modified Newton's laws, but he kept in pure form Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism. And that was how he created special relativity. Mm -hmm. Special relativity, I think, was a little bit like calculus. Uh, calculus had been invented centuries earlier by Newton and Leibniz, and it changed the world when they invented calculus. It was far more powerful than what was there before. However, the time was right for it, and their contemporaries were inventing bits and pieces, although they didn't see the whole picture. It was a little bit like that when Einstein invented special relativity, which is what I've described, where he modified Newton's laws to deal with the reality of the properties of light. But 10 years later, Einstein did something far more marvelous. And for this, the world really wasn't ready. 
If it hadn't been for Einstein's vision, it would have been a long time before this would have been done. Einstein recognized and understood far more sharply than anyone else at the time that not only were Newton's laws of motion inconsistent with Maxwell's theory of light, but Newton's laws of gravity were inconsistent with special relativity. And again, he recognized that it was Newton's theory that had to change. So um, he developed a new conception of gravity that, um, in a sense, was made by imitating Maxwell's laws of light. But it turned out to be a much more difficult and much deeper theory. In technical language, it's a nonlinear theory. The geometry that's involved that he needed to use was much more sophisticated than any mathematics that physicists had dealt with before. He had to use and develop the theory of curved space-time. And his basic concept was that when a planet goes around the sun, it's not because it's attracted to the sun, as Newton would have said. Rather, the sun has created curvature in space-time, and the planet is trying to find the closest thing to a straight line in a curved space-time. OK, we'll just leave that there for now. And we will go to the diagram, see if I can find it of um, the thing. How do we find the diagram then? That's unfortunate, it's not there. Um, okay, so um, I have to find it in my own video, which is a bit narcissistic, but if we go There we go, this one. Across you one. We go here. Right. So over on this side of the diagram is space time. I might say, well, are there anything else? And said, yes, if you think about it. You could have something where it has no no columnar numbers. It, it has no dimensions at all in the sense that it does, it does not have um, you know a number of rows and a number of columns. Just leave that off for a moment. So this is the diagram. Now I can't remember where the diagram is, um, but this is the best one that there is for describing. Uh, space-time uh, because you've got um, the geometry being warped by mass and then um, it's actually affecting the clocks so the clocks that are further away from the mass are turning at a normal speed and then they slow as you get closer to the mass so this clock here that's going around really quite fast you see that? And then this one that's like right close to it is they're all turning slowly. So I'm trying to think where it was I found this. I don't think it's in the comments, is it? Hmm.
Okay, well, I can't easily find this. Um, it's not showing it, is it? Maybe I can find it by finding it when I brought it up in this. Um, That was there before. Is there underneath? Oh, hold on a minute. What's this? It says the general relativity time and what's that say? File general relativity time and space distortion extract GIF. Okay, try that. The general relativity time and space distortion. Well, is that not extract? It says extract. File, general relativity, time and space distortion, extract gif. Wikipedia. Time dilation. No. Hmm. Where could it be if it's not there? This is painful. Gravitational time dilation. I've just been here. Time dilation. Oh, okay. That's all right. We'll have that. But this is... Um, that's not even playing. Okay. Right, so we've got somewhere... File colon... There, that's it. 
Good grief, that's hard to find. Um, original file. There we go. Talk about detective work. So, um, space time. This is so hard to find on the internet. It's like, you wouldn't believe it, how hard to find that is. Um, you think, oh yeah, you know, I've got that, you know. There you go. I think I'll leave it on the screen now. Mm -hmm. Might as well. So, <clears throat> we've done that. We looked at that. We found that. We've got that. We'll put that out of the way. And um, oh, we want that down there. Oh, but if we put it there, we won't be able to see the clock. Hold on. It can't go completely off screen. Um, I have to do that. Okay, we won't have it on anymore. Um, and we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, in that spirit, let us begin. What is physics to physicists today? How do they see it different from the way in which we might imagine the layperson sees physics? Okay. Ed Witten was asked this question in a talk he gave on physics and geometry many years ago. And he pointed us to three fundamental insights, which were his big three insights in physics. And they correspond to the three great equations. So the first one is, is that somehow physics takes place in an arena. And that arena is a manifold X together with some kind of semi-Ramanian metric structure. Something that allows us to take length and angle so that we can perform measurements at every point in this space-time or higher dimensional structure, leaving us a little bit of headroom. The equation most associated with this is the Einstein field equation. Um, that's wrong. Um, it's the Einstein field equations, plural, but never mind. Now, what we'll do now because I don't want to keep going back to the uh, images. We're going to get hold of this stuff. We're going to have that, and we're going to turn it um, the right way up. And have that bigger. And that. And we'll move that over to here. And um, we'll have the other one. That is that equation. And the other equation, which is up here, is also in the fire system. And it is this one. Need that one. Mm. 
Right, go off that side of the screen and go back. We've got the other side for the question there. Now, I don't know what's gone wrong here, but something's gone wrong. So, this um, the equation most associated with this is the other side field equation. He tries to write it in there, it doesn't look right. He makes a writing error on this, uh, where he's writing in um, mu nu and he writes in mu mu. Um, that should be this symbol, uh, sorry, this symbol here of uh, this, this kind of V-like shape, and he writes in the same thing twice. Then he goes back and corrects it later, and he runs into the margin. So it's a long equation. I don't know why he didn't leave himself more room for it. He got a long blackboard. Um, the... So he says, I, of course, I've run into the equation. These represent multiple equations. I'll cover all that in previous videos. Talked about it at length. So I've run in the margin. So it says, that a piece of the Riemann curvature tensor, the Ricci tensor, minus an even smaller piece, the scalar, so right so this here is a piece of the women curvature tensor and i'm taking that to mean there's a wild curvature tensor and a women curvature tensor making up the no hold on a wild curvature tensor and a ricci curvature tensor um comprise the Riemann curvature tensor and Einstein got rid of the wild curvature tensor in order to leave himself with the Ricci curvature tensor but if you put the Ricci and the wild together you get a Riemann one so when they're talking about the pseudo or semi Riemannian manifolds it's possibly because Einstein's not basing his geometry on something that's strictly speaking Romanian manifold because the curvature is not governed by the Romanian curvature tensor but something that's more kind of decomposed into parts and he's got rid of some of it because it's like prevents him from doing what he wants to do so I think he gets rid of the wild curvature tensor and that comes up in regards to the shear operator. So if we go and look at the shear operator, and this might seem completely out of sequence, but you know, whatever, then we're gonna have to have another tab and we're gonna go and look at that file tab. Everyone seems to be fascinated with the shear operator. So we'll go and do that. And we're going to go to eight. We're going to be back here. Um, now, here we go. So set to 9.1. And we go uh, 43. Um, that's worth reading. Um, we go to section 9.1. Uh, kill off the wild curvature. And so we're looking at that part. And this is stuff that I've looked at and I thought was significant. All right. So we go to this part here and we're going to just read this section 9.1 see what we can make of it so page 43 of the document which i've just put in the chat bosons are the 
particles known to us are saturated enough bows, which are the force mediating particles or the force mediating fields. And it's better to think of them as fields. Um, the other kind are the matter manifesting fields, and they are named after Enrico Fermi, and they're called the fermions. So you've got fermions and matter, and bosons are uh, forces. So you're going to have um fermions equals matter which is like electrons and quarks and then you've got bosons are forces and they are photons and gluons that's if you don't know that, you keep on hearing fermion boson, fermion boson, and you won't know which is which, and you'll get them mixed up, and you'll think that the fermions are the forces because you think F and force, it, that had me for a while. I honestly thought the fermions were the ones that did the forces because it's an F. Yeah, yeah, that's how little I knew. I feel better about this because it's really not a problem. Now, I think this thing here is something to do with um, kind of a Lagrangian. If you go back into, um, uh, it's not the area where he does the equations, um, but I think that's to do with um, the equations. Um, shall we just see if we can find the equations? Hold on. There is mm -hmm. we're gonna need another tab. Um So what we're looking for is um, um, for an equation. Oh, the equations. Two or four deformation complex the equations governing fractional spin. The equations. That can't be it. No, no, it does a whole section on the equations. Maybe it's just called equations. Equations, 12.1, 55. Uh, getting closer. I don't know why it doesn't say the equations. It just says equations. It's weird. Why do you think he does that? It makes it harder to find as a document. That could be a criticism. Um, now I'm only criticizing him for his um, presentation. There's nothing wrong that I can see with anything he's asserting mathematically. Um, and if there is, it's too subtle and too um, esoteric mathematically for me to be able to discern anyway. So I'm not saying that just because I can't find it, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just, just that I don't find anything wrong. And I looked at the critic's work, because he's had a critic, and everything about the critic, it, um, everything he alleged to be the case that was a, he said was a flaw, um, was completely invalid. So um, I know enough to know that the critic was completely wrong on all counts. So um, and I've done a 12 hour video about the critic. So I don't need to go into that now, but 
I'm in a position to say that about the critic. That means I'm in a position to say that um, I, I, I understand he doesn't understand it. And I understand the reasoning behind him saying why he thought there was a flaw. And it's interesting that on, on episode um, uh, 1628 of the um, Joe Rogan experience, uh, this gets brought up and he accepts that there was some, um, he, he said he um, made a valid point um but something would have brought up anyway i mean we could look at that now um the joe rogan thing we could go over what gets said i don't think it would hurt give it a bit of context so we'll go here and he is handing over this thing to um Okay, don't want that. Might have to probably jump in here. It might be in the middle of him saying something out of context, but we'll just go for it. Been being a pussy back. Well, what is it? Explain what it is. What, what, is, what is this thing that you, you handed me? What is this? It is, okay, this is the hardest thing for me to say because okay. I have to not hedge it. I think it's the theory of everything. And what do you mean by that? There is a moment where you have to say, this I believe about a radical departure. And you don't want to say it because you want to hedge it. It is, it, Jamie, if you could bring that up and you go a little bit, uh, maybe two pages in, is this available online so someone can peruse it? In fact, uh, okay, right there on the left, uh, go down that table. You see where it says X4? Yes. X4 is four parameters. It could be salty, sweet, sour, bitter. It could be low, uh, treble, medium, uh, base, and volume. And the question that I took from Einstein was, can we generate the world, everything, from something as innocuous as four parameters? All right, so we drop out that, get some context. And we can do quite well here because it's right to hand. That's the first page that he was just showing. Then we go to that which was the page he scrolled to and this is the einstein quote and it says um what it really interests me is whether god had any choice in the creation of the world okay it's kind of interesting isn't it so is the universe created the way it is um uh, and and was the is there like is there other constraints that mean that the, the universe can't be different than from the way it is. So, if there is a power that makes it, maybe to some extent it gets everything going, but then everything after that just un unfolds inexorably, and it's not like there's a whole lot of intervention past that initial impetus, right? It, you think about a god or an entity or some agency, some prime mover, and you might think, oh, they've got a hand in the details of every little thing, but then you say, well, no, evolution uh, gave us all the diversity of all the different animals on Earth, so you can take that right back down to an amoeba and then you can take the amoeba back down to chemical reactions and you take the chemical reactions back down to you know the fusion of um uh, simple um atoms like hydrogen into more complex heavier um, elements 
which has got more photons and neutrons, and then those stars die and explode and distribute her heavier elements, and then they get collected into exoplanets, and those exoplanets then have water that is in the form of uh, liquid um, hydrogen and oxygen, and those that bonds together in, the, in quite large quantities because of the way valence works, and then that has a uh, neutral pH, so it's not like the thing that is in most likely to form as a consequence of, of chemical reactions um, is something that's acidic. And that's interesting. So that's an interesting consequence of physics that the, that the results of a lot of things is to this neutrality. So it's a context in which you can have things that will, um, once they're made, they're not, um, uh, you know, um, in this toxic acidic environment um and so they survive uh so that means that maybe things self-assemble because of that um you know get deep into it like the number of dimensions we have is such that you can have dna because if you try to have a helix and you say like i want to make this thing like a helix the double helix then I can't do what is essentially a knot where I take something and I take it over something else and then under something else and over it again. I can't do that if I'm not allowed to move off the plane. If I'm stuck on the plane because it's a two-dimensional surface, but I've got time, that's not a space in which I can operate where I can go off and do all of this stuff, right? So there's no knots in flatland and that means that you can't really have any inhabitants of flatland that are made with dna also if they have an elementary canal you know eat stuff what happens you know because weren't they just split apart the top half of their body and the bottom part of the body will drift apart so um then if you say well if you have an extra spatial dimension um, beyond what we are used to, and you could just freely go into it, then what would that be like? And so you'd have your your DNA strands, and they like, well, they don't go through each other in 3D here. You know, that's, these things are rubbing it against each other. But let's really, say we make a rule by which if I change it to the um, flip like that, that the, the, the spots rather than stripes well it's stripes and stripes will resist but s spots and stripes won't and so that will then go through that and then come out the other side so an example of this property can be seen in a game called Um, Ikaruga and um, we just go with this I suppose and so we've got this and what happens is you're a ship here and it's one of these bullet hell games and uh, things scroll down the screen at you and you're supposed to avoid um, getting destroyed by the bullets now the bullets you can survive the bullets that are the same color as you. And so what you are forced to do is to swap colors all the time. And that will then mean that you um, so he goes through the white ones there, then he switches to the black ones there, goes back to white. So it's like there's an extra dimension, but rather than it being a dimension of space, it's a dimension of color. And so it's like, you know, dark energy, dark en light energy, and it's like, um, there you go. 
So that's Ikaruga, and we'll put that in the chat. Um, so if you can imagine that you had this property with the scarf, that you could go through it, you wouldn't be able to keep uh, things together in a signature that was uh, one for four because um, DNA um, Okay. Now, he then reformulates this into a more scientific concept of uh, God having choice in the creation of the world. And um, I don't know why he says we have taken the liberty of reformulating. He seems to like to avoid saying I, says the author, he says we. He's not royal. I don't know why he does it. Um, starting from X4. So X4 here is the um, four-dimensional uh, surface. It's not something to the power of four. Um, so you need to bear in mind what is the superscript four applied to. If it's like two to the power of four, then obviously two is the number two. Four would be making that two into two to the power of two, which would be two times two times two times two. Two times two is four times two is eight times two is 16. So um, it's not that, uh, and if it was like an ordinary variable that was like X was equal to two, then again, it would be 16. But because X is a special thing, then it's a space, then that's going to be referring to one that is a four-dimensional space. Uh, so, um, so he says, starting from, so he's not starting from nothing, he's starting from this. And he says, starting from X4 as a topological structure. Topological structure, all it means is it's, um, hmm, how do I explain this? Um, if you have this, then that could be seen as a donut. If you put your fingers through there and you remolded it as if it was plasticine, then so long as you don't make holes or turn the material into making a new handle and glue it so that you're adding a handle or something. <coughs> no, <coughs> if you're not closing a handle or opening up the hole, then this can deform and this can be the central, that can become the central um, hole of a, of a donut. So... Uh, if we look at topology on the um, Wikipedia, well, there should be a video on it, actually. What's going on here? Why did that come up? There we are, topology joke. So, if you, you, my name is Henry Sagerman. This is topology joke. This is a joint work with Keenan Crane. So there's an old joke uh, in topology. Uh, so a topologist is somebody who counts all the difference between a coffee mug and a donut. So, uh, so topology is the study of uh, geometrical objects when you don't care about lengths and you don't care about angles. All you care about is a sort of uh, global shape properties. And so everything's made out of 
very stretchy rubber. Uh, and in particular, so no, don't care about lengths or angles. Um, all you care about is things being the same form. Okay, so if they are the same form, but they're not identical, they're not equal. That is a term which is called isomorphism. And if I see a sign of the symbol that would be isomorphism, it's essentially the symbol is a tilde above an equal sign. And that would be the isomorphism sign. I can't easily put it in the chat. Um, it means that if you, you take a, a coffee mug, you can sort of unindent the place where the coffee goes, yeah. and you can kind of squish out the handle a little bit, and eventually you can deform it. Uh, into this perfectly symmetrical round donut shape. So, as the joke goes, the topologist doesn't know the difference between these because in the study of topology, you don't care about any of these actual geometrical shapes of these different objects. Um, so, uh, as I say, this is John Roy with Keen and Crane. He actually uh, designed the shapes of these. I just did a little bit of editing to, to make them printable. Um, where do the shapes come from? Well, um, right, so there we got that. And then we could go possibly into Wikipedia. No. He'll be here somewhere. There we go. There we go. This one on the left. It's not brilliant, that one. It's a bit clunky. I've seen smoother ones. Oh, we'll go along with that, whatever. We'll just see how we get on. Uh, let's see. Back to the paper. So the paper, he's saying, that's, that's um, you know, algebraic topology, that's what that is about. Um, that's one of the things that's on the list up here are things that you're expected to know about. So that will be that one there. Oh, oh. And they had uh, Letts Friedman making it, who's going to be having to read a book on algebraic topology um, to understand geometric unity. And he really doesn't need to know um, about it in a formal sense. Okay. All of these things that I was like told that I needed to know as prerequisites. Um, you don't need to know them, you know, 100% completely. Uh, it benefits to know a bit about them. But um, if someone goes off and says, here, read these 18 books, you know, gauge theory, group theory, um, algebraic topology, differential geometry, partial differential equations, you know, general relativity quantum field theory it's like yeah um i'm all right mate um you might say well don't you want to know don't you want to learn and it's like well you will learn stuff reading the books but each of the books is like 200 pages or 300 pages or more and there's 18 of them so that's an awful lot of reading and i'm not that good at just absorbing things in an empirical manner so uh, I'd sooner skip around whilst respecting the fact I don't know and I could get myself unstuck by prematurely drawing inferences where I don't know enough and get the wrong end, getting at the wrong end of the stick. And I do that a lot. But I also quite like doing it like that because um, I, I feel as if I'm being like a scientist. I feel like I'm... Uh, reproducing the scientific endeavor so I'm going into something that's already been figured out people already worked out the, the laws of physics and everything and I'm going in 
over the course of the last three years and I'm just sort of saying, well, could it be this? Quite a lot of the time, you know? And trying to guess and, and thinking, well, how would I have it be if, you know, I was God sort of thing? And um, then thinking, well, no, maybe if it's like this, God has no choice. Pick the, the option where God is as minimally involved as possible and the thing works out its next step for itself right so whatever initial thing gets things going the rest of it just snowballs out of that initial circumstance okay so you know maybe god did create the universe but the the action was like if he's omniscient he can see everything he can you know he's not He's not needing to be an in interventionist God, is, is he? From a philosophical perspective, it diminishes his perfection if he then goes back around and says, yeah, about that creation thing, um, I think I need to make an adjustment. I need there to be a flood um, because I made man and that, that went wrong and I need to punish them or he... Or he's like, you know, I made people and then they were immoral, so I went off and I basically nuked um, um, Sodom, you know, and Gomorrah. It's like, why is he having to do that? I mean, he made human beings the way they are, so if they're engaging in immoral acts, why is he smiting them, you know? And then um, why is he not smiting the Nazis, you know? Why isn't God coming in? Because he's Jewish, isn't he? And and absolutely wiping out the Nazi regime, right? With nuclear weapons, or whatever was witnessed by Lot's wife. So um, it's not clear that that's um, it's kind of counter to the proof of God's existence that He lets that happen, you know. So starting from X4 as a topological structure underlying the space-time construction. So what he means by that is he's saying we don't yet have time. And I mean, I'm not sure whether he's saying that we have space even. Um, I would have thought you'd have space, but no time. I might be wrong in that, but we have to say something uh to what extent can the observed universe together with its stylized contents and laws mirroring its own uh, be generated without further assumptions okay now that's really quite interesting what it's just said there which is scalar um probably forget about that um I find that interesting. Need to have a photo of that. That's quite interesting. So, because um, it's not a hyphenate, you see. And it's nice to have, it would be nice if you could have variable names, identifiers without um, hyphens in. And um, I know you have things like Yang Mills and stuff like that, but that's more like when they're not um, like that, and that would be a type. So it might be, it might be, oh, it might be a parameterized type. That's interesting. Yes, it's a Ricci, but it's like rather than a Ricci curvature, it's a Ricci scalar. So it's like, yeah. So that would actually be a parameter of the Ricci. Okay, well, it could be either because, in the context of the let's call analysis, it's like if you have another term after this, um, it's not going to get in a confusion about whether its subscript is going to be anything to do with this because 
it's going to just work because the next subscriptive thing is going to be a separate subscriptive thing. So this is a way of having spaces and variable names uh, and still having it so that you can have everything support multiplication by juxtaposition because you're doing, you know, A, B, C to multiply A and B and C. And then you do your subscripts as A subscript Ricci scalar and then B subscript Ricci curvature tensor or something and you know like that and then you get to put in the things that you want as needed that's kind of quite nice now um that's saying it's type is that right Is it saying it's type? Well, yes, I suppose so. I mean, it is. Oh, hang on a minute. When he writes it on the blackboard and he does S, he means the Ricci scalar with the S. So, wait, 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 wait. wait. I think I understand part of his lecture a bit better because this thing here. He's not doing the R term in front of this. So normally you go, yeah, yeah, I understand what he's doing now. I thought he'd written it funny, but he's not. Look, what he's done is he's written this, and instead of having an R term, which is confusing because you've got that as an R term, but that is an R term with a, Ricci curvature tensor, yeah? So if I do this, then what's happening here is we've got, oh, we're starting to make some progress. So this here is, that uh, is mu, and that is new and this refers to uh, mu is the um, that's the rows uh, well could do that as different color I had it as red and blue before didn't I I think I heard it that way around and then we do this oh I'm going to do the whole thing again but you get a general idea so you've got a, a thing where there's across this way are your um, rows and the other way or columns and then a given row column pair will be zero one and this will be all the column numbers will be the same number uh, zero one two And that will be um, um, zero, one, one, two. There we are. So uh, if I do, that's row one, row zero, two. Yeah. 
All right, there you go. That is your 4x4 sensor. And um, that's what's called a rank two tensor because it's got uh, these rows that'd be one of the ranks and the other one would be that rank okay there's the rank one two tensor okay um now that bit there that's just part of thing indicating the number so we're just going to ignore that for now and then we're just going to zoom out a bit and the thing that threw me before was this i was thinking why is he writing in s and so this term is the um well, the first thing he writes, he writes slightly wrong, but he goes back and amends it later. So this thing here is, um, it should be mu nu. So if I do that and I go just there, that's kind of closer to how it should be. And then, um, Should look a bit more like a V. So this one, if I kind of colour it in, we're going to have this one. It's going to be that. Um, that one's going to be there, and this one's going to be the blue one, like that. So you see the relationship there. So this term, this first term, that's. Um, uh, here, that is the um, Ricci after Ricci Corabastro um, curvature tensor, and so the thing that here, that's the thing that makes it the tensor, and this here is the tensor. Because it's a um, rank two tensor. Now I'm going to erase that there. So redraw it there in a bit. So that gets subtracted from this, and it's S two. Uh, Powerful man. I thought he'd made a mistake, but he hasn't. What he's done is he's calling this. Um, he's calling this term um, the Ricci um, scalar and he's calling that he's making that renamed lowercase s it's just a rename so that if you had it in there and you changed it to s it would look like right Right, so he's got an S there. Now that's all well and good, but <coughs> that's not what he's written. So what he's done is got a half S, and he's gone and just said, "No, I can do better than this. I can put the 
S, I can have it be this, I can have it here. So he, that's what he does. He makes it the denominator. He makes it, no, it's the numerator of his thing. And so that ends up being here. And then he puts it in there. And that's entirely legitimate mathematically. However, I don't, you can't put that all as a numerator. You can't then say, oh, we'll put g mu nu as the numerator and take the, and halve it. Um, I don't think that would work. Uh, so you can close all of that up and that would be fine. Um, but we'll leave it as it is. It's pretty obvious. So that, that is a little multiply going on there, which I'll represent by a little dot. Uh, dot for multiply. Um, so that's what you've got going on there. Um, and we could put in a dot here just to kind of keep it consistent with the blackboard. Right, okay, that makes sense. I'm quite pleased I noticed that really. So if we go here, um, this is the bit he's referring to Einstein. So we go and zoom in on this. I'm not quite sure why this is plus s um, when it's minus in the equation. Um, anyway, let's see if we can find something else to eat. Um, that's about it on that. That's interesting. It's um, something I've not seen done before. I mean, the, the equations, plural, tend to get rewritten 
in slightly different ways. You sometimes see it with G, and it collapses all the terms. So on the left, collapses all of these terms here into one um, letter G. So that would be like doing this. I'm not overly fond of that for the Einstein equation because the thing is you get a G in the other term on the opposite side, you get it over here for the um, gravitation term of the constant of um, Newton. So I'm not a big fan of that. Okay. What's interesting is the guy whose name it is who gave rise to this is um, Gregorio Ricci Curabastro. See that at the top there? And you look at that and thinking, well, you've got two R's in the standard version of it, you know, maybe they could have made the first R be for his first part of his surname, and the second time they use an R, you use a C. And that would be, you know, for the curvature, um, Corobastro, um, then that would be, um, how did it get to be like that? It's not like that though, is it? It's like this. Um, so how would that look? Well, it would be, instead of an S, it would be I'll have to change it another way. Um, and that would be curvature. That would be capital C. To avoid confusion with the other term. Or it would be you put it in front of the other bit, so you keep that as a half. And then you put it in here. But the problem with that is it kind of interferes with it being C as a speed of light. Richie Curvastro, Richie Curvastro, Curb. Good name, isn't it? Curvastro. And it's actually a hyphenate, and this is actually minus. So the thing is between the first part and the second part, it's um, a subtraction. So his second part of his name is subtracting from his first part of his name, which is quite funny. 
you see that? Got Richie Curbastro and then it's Richie Curbastro. What you could do, um, although you'd have to do Jimmy and you, wouldn't you? Um, that I'm missing out. You could do. We'll use that, do that. And then we'll do a division under here. There. So we can write it like that. That's kind of nice, isn't it? I mean, nothing wrong with you doing it like that. Apart from that, it would throw off ordinary math. If you wrote it in the computer, you could do that. When you have a programming language, it's like, oh, I've got so many identifiers. I want to name them all informative names. And they all get really long names. Um, however, when you're doing mathematics, you can have quite complicated concepts, and people are quite happy to name them single letters. So you, it's just a question of, like, in one context, you are like using a blackboard and you're manipulating those single letter things with like symbols. You know, you're saying, you know, you're saying something like, something like that. And you, those things, A, B, C, could be quite you know more complicated than it might seem um and having a um, longer names would just be uh, unwieldy and the thing that you're interested in is the operations so we're basically interested in this part when you look at the mathematics you're interested in i think are you interested in that part more than the other hmm. I mean, in a sentence, you're you need to have a sentence that's got some punctuation in it. Is there isn't really anything here to serve as an example. All right. Uh, it was the original intention of eight. So. There would be that. And that would be a clause at the end of the sentence. So mm. okay. I'm just wondering about 
with English, whether or not it's inverted from mathematics or if it's the same. Are you dwelling that much on the punctuation or is it now? Are you looking at the words more than you're looking at the punctuation? Whereas in code or whatever, you're looking at the operations more than you're looking at what they are floating on. I think that you okay. You have different modes of reading. If you have some code, you tend to be well. This would be an example of some code, or well, that wouldn't be code. It'd be all in one place. This it isn't like real mathematics, really. But these lines. Um, damn it. These lines, not those selected highlighted lines, but I'm just saying in general, they are You go through your stuff and you are reading up and down, right? All the time when you're reading a program and you're trying to work out what it all does. And so you're, you are dwelling in this area and you're like saying what does all this do you're not reading it and then moving on not this thing where you're moving steadily on that way absorbing the information absorbing what's been said you don't tend to read things and go over them over them over them So, because of the dwell, it actually means that it's okay for you to have the, um, the all their symbols. And they get to find and conventions are consistently used for which ones are used for what and then you get very used to certain symbols being assigned for different things although you know in a computer language you could use any arbitrary thing for any arbitrary thing so in a sense there's an important lesson in having it so that you're working with a consistency of notation, aren't you? So, um, I say traditional. Once you have consistent traditional notation, um, because that way it's all going to be um, uh, okay. And then they've got conventions. I think the, 
the conventions uh, would be something like West Coast, East Coast notations. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm not wrong about that, but that would be like that. That would be East. And then West would be that. Now, I would have thought that was a convention. Now, notation would be how to describe something. So if you were to say something and you went, you know, blob, something blob, then that notation there might be unfamiliar to someone else and they might go, I don't know what the blob does. So it's not necessarily the case that it's that obvious what the notation is and that might be, that might be kind of like a notation, it might be like, is it like a dialect? Not sure. Mm. Need something more to eat.
want to add more chocolate biscuits. Um, I'm thinking about the communication of things because it's it's connected to language, but it's also connected to presentation. And I'm not criticising him for his thing. I mean, although he's deviated here from using the conventional thing of R, it's like, okay, I quite like that he's using S. Um, I think it's quite a good solution because it's more optimised to just go S over 2, um, G, new new, as opposed to saying, um, well, it would be actually minus. So R, uh, no, that's wrong. It would be, forget about that, it would be a half R, G new new, which is the more traditional way about going about things. Um, and then he's saving himself a whole symbol here, isn't he? By writing it like that. It's a bit more compact. Which makes sense because this is the way mathematicians are. So one of the principles is concision. If you can go from right your mathematics more concisely. But the opposing consideration is um unfamiliarity and it doesn't seem to set it up um, although technically by saying S is a Ritchie scalar he is sort of just there saying that that's what it is but I don't remember in the lecture I'm saying it. So, or does he? Or does he? Because does he not, in the lecture, um, describe what this thing is? Like a piece of this, a piece of that, he says, doesn't he? Um, let's see. He says... So it says that a piece of the Ryman curvature tensor and um, which presumably means this, right? So this would be that would be a piece of the Ryman. I don't know how to spell it. Yes, Matt Ryman. Uh, curvature tensor. It's confusing because they're both of them got N. Um, the both of them are R's. But that isn't R for Ryman. It's R for Ricci. So it says a piece of that. And so I think it leaves a bit behind. So the Ryman coverage tensor must be more than that. So the bit that I think it's missing is possibly we're going to say um, it's added onto the wild coverage tensor. But I could, I'd be guessing there. Well, I can't write in the other bit because it's gone funny. Um, don't save. So we've got that. 
we wanted to look up the bit from his paper where he's talking about cutting off the stuff. There. So, so there's a piece of the coat, Lyman coat tensor. So I'm thinking it gets rid of the wild coat tensor. Um, here, as in Einstein's case, the wild, wild curvature tensor is annihilated by the contraction operator above, so the operator preserves and mixes only the analogs of the Ricci and scalar curvature components. So we're talking about Ricci and scalar. Mm -hmm. Now here, I think he's just been dealing with, which was S, is the third term in the list. And then when he has his boat, there is the third term in the boat. Um, so putting things into the space metrics is the term out in front, the G mu nu. Yeah? So um, we get that video, equation 9.3, we'll see that. Um, yeah, we've got a video, pull that up, jamie.com. People are going to get so annoyed when they find out what's been going on. Wow. Oh, well. Um, let's have a look at this. We've got to do... Um, pull, oh, it won't even be in YouTube. It'll be here. Okay. So, when I was puzzled by this, you see, and I thought, what's going on? And um, the curvature ship monopoly represents that curvature can be decomposed in a sort of sum of what are called the wild tensor, traces Ricci, and Ricci scalar, considered as elements of adjoint valued tensor product of adjoint bundle with form bundle two forms now none of that i understand none of it i tried looking into it this week and it's like one of the most recent things i've been looking into I bought a book on general relativity, but I mean, obviously you've got to read the book before you know stuff. You could say, well, why am I making the video until I, I'd know more if I read the book? Well, I also need to read, I also need to watch a number of videos about spinners, right? One of which in the series just got released two days ago. Um... There are lots of these videos. And just uh, it all it all work. It's all it's all a lot to know. Don't know what the adjoint bundle is. Now, I have wondered whether this here curvature 
might itself represent a term. That maybe that was the um, reaching curvature, the one that was the well, the reaching curvature tensor might be the actual bow because it remains after it goes into the bottle, you see. That's my reading of it. The reaches scalar, as is written on the blackboard, is the S that's over the half. I don't know where the traces it reaches comes into things. Because the thing is, is that this doesn't include the cosmological constant unless it's in the traces reaching part. Um, does he say anything about the cosmological constant? Oh, hold on. He says is equal plus the cosmological constant. Let's just get a proper head idea of what it is. So it says that, okay, read this, get some context. So it says that a piece of the Riemann curvature tensor, which we presume will contain the wild curvature tensor, we don't know, that's a guess. And he said to reach your tensor minus an even smaller piece. So that implies that the Ryman coverage tensor is the reach your tensor. This is the first term that says R, which would be this one. We ought to probably do it properly with the damn with this. We want that, right? This one here would be the Ricci tensor uh, minus an even smaller piece, the scalar curvature. Okay, which is a Ricci scalar curvature, which he has written as S, multiplied by the metric, which is G mu nu. Now, when he does the bottle, the bottle. Is a thing that gives things metrics. So th this is a space of metrics. And so things are going into the bottle to gain their metrics. And so they don't have it, um, I think they don't have it over here on Y. And then when they're brought through into X, that's when they gain a metric. So it's like this. But it's stripped there of its G mu nu. It's over here. And then it ends up being um, given a Lorentzian metric. That looks about right because that says um, I think that says the cotangent bundle over X. Now, I don't know why it says S2. Oh, that would be a sphere, wouldn't it? I don't know what sang spear. Unless it's like saying, well, the universe itself is a sphere, the possibility. I mean, you have the, the Big Bang and everything's exposed to the Big Bang, so it's going to have a shape, isn't it?
don't know. But um, I'm thinking this is the thing that gives it the gene you knew. And it gives it to the terms that as a uh, Richie Scalar, and it's giving it to the Traces Richie as well. So I'm suggesting that the Traces Richie, because it gets the metric, wouldn't that be the other one that gets the metric? And wouldn't that wouldn't it be the Traces Richie is the cosmological constant? We'll see. So it says that a piece of the Riemann curvature tensor. Which isn't represented in the diagram or the or the website or 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 this equation or anywhere. Um, it says the Riemann curvature tensor is made up of the something and the Ricci tensor, which we've got here, um, minus an even smaller piece, the scalar curvature, and that. Uh, multiplied by the metric, yeah, um, is equal to R, is equal to, is equal, oh, he's omitted to say plus the cosmological constant. So he nearly skipped over that. Plus the cosmological constant. And he didn't say that was um, multiplied by the metric, actually, funny enough. Now, do we see it on the blackboard him putting in the cosmological constant? Well, if he's going to include the cosmological constant, he would have to have a tensor. It couldn't appear just as a as a constant, it has to be applied to a tensor. It has to be something involving a metric for it to make sense. Okay. Okay. So, um, even if we don't see him writing that on the board, then it's okay. So, he's written that. Does he give it the terms Jim you knew? Um, I think so. I think he just did. Is the Einstein field equation? Like that part, the next term, that's the thing with the other part. And of course, I've run. Oh, he has that. done it. Look, 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 look. Okay. And of course, I've run in. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely there. So, so it's in the margin. You can see he's put it in. Of course, I've run in the margin. Equals something. Okay. All right, gotcha. So it's definitely in there with the term for the other part. So he writes the whole thing, and I think he's got the rest of it over to the right. So um, what does he have to say about this? Um, it's hard to say how to pass this. So to say that a piece of the Riemann curvature tensor, I'm thinking that this comma that in the transcription should be a colon. Yeah. So it says that a piece of the Riemann curvature tensor, colon, the Ricci tensor, comma, 
minus an even smaller piece the scalar curvature multiplied by the metric plus the cosmological constant is equal to some amount of matter and energy right now i need to look up the einstein field equations to know well i need to know more about the einstein curve rough sorry, the Riemann curvature tensor in relation to the ricci tensor and the wild curvature so that's the next intention so what is the what is Riemann curvature tensor um, while curvature tensor um, Ricci tensor, which is the one we've got before we get to the minus the other stuff. So we could say minus um, scalar or half scalar like that. Curvature um, multiplied by the metric by metric. Oh, um, plus a cosmological constant. Times metric, which doesn't say that, but it's still put it in there, is equal to um, constant stress energy momentum tensor. Oh, that's quite a lot there. <coughs> so what is that? <coughs> I have to write down my intention. Because it's like to do the shiab, we're looking at this and we look at that. The purely bosonic portion of the action is a real valued function that says script I on B while there are other possibilities to explore for the choice of the ship in a bottle operator. I would prefer if the ship um ship um was capitalized um because it's an acronym we'll begin with one um and i don't understand what this d minus one thing does um it's an equation 9.2 we'll begin with one which makes a parallel to einstein's construction of the full Riemann neon curvature explicit. Now, he has a ship um, and when we're dealing with the ship and it's out here, it's got all its masts. Oh, it's lost them there. Right, okay. Okay. That's not too bad. So you've got... Oh, right, 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 right. So here, in general relativity, the first 
of the mass is the while curvature. Then you have the traces root G. Then you have the root G scalar. So that's where he gets rid of it. Now, if he's got um, root G scalar, the curvature that's written on the boat is, a, is the base of the boat. Is that not the root G curvature tensor that's on the boat? I mean, on the ship. <coughs> now, is it that the traces Ricci becomes the cosmological constant? So that would be a question, the first question. Now that the reach of scale gets the metric, the wild one doesn't because it's just lost and it's broken away. Um, and we're not, we've got another term and no mass to represent that term. So it must be the body of the boat. Infer body of ship labeled Curvature is the Ricci curvature tensor, right? I mean, none of this is labeled in the video, is it? If I go and look at this, it doesn't tell me. Um, the curvature ship monomically represents that curvature can be decomposed into sort of sum or what are called the wild tensor traces which in which is scalar. And it's not saying the body of the ship is a thing, is he? That's not really very helpful. Uh, it'd be nice to have that. Now, if I'm inferring something that isn't there, where does the R term the outer term come from?
myself a cup of tea. Uh. Got some pistachios now. Want to eat them? Got to add something. Um, right. So, I like to try and figure out things without any help. And if I figure these things out, or I kind of gain the general intuition, it helps me later to gain a general intuition about other things somehow. It's sort of like I'm refining how I process the symbols and get a kind of feel for what's going on with the language in which everything's being expressed. But it might, I think it's probably the wrong approach if I want to really make progress with this. Um, and it's not making for a very good stream. But the thing is, and I thought I'd just stick with it a little bit longer I need to read out the thing to do with the, um, this. So you've got these. I was thinking that these are the masts. And so if you look at the masts of this, got a boat with these masts and you says you need to kill off the wild curvature now it doesn't mention it there so it's saying the shear is which is this equation 9.3 on the screen there at the top that is The puzzle of how to kill off the wild culture contribution to recover Einstein's, to, to recover Riemannian geometry's ability to form Einstein tensors of gravity in such a way as to preserve Erismannian gauge covariance is part of what's meant by geometric unity. So I'm taking that to be a pretty significant sentence in the document. The puzzle of how to kill off the wild culture contribution. So, my man in geometry presumably has a wild culture contribution. And then we're saying this thing, the video, it describes general relativity with Einstein killing off the wild curve to contribution. Now, is it the wild scalar curvature or wild cur curvature tensor? Not sure. Could be either. It says the wild tensor down there, all right, so it's a wild tensor, um, okay, 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 so here as in Einstein's case, the wild curvature tensor is annihilated by a contraction operator, so okay, the next bit is mentioned that he says the wild curvature contribution which makes M Ambiguous whether it means curvature, um, scalar curvature, or curvature tensor. But he is meaning the, well, hold on a minute. I think if he was going to mean the whale, the wild scalar curvature, he would say that, wouldn't he? Now, referring to the video, 
So it's decomposed into the wild tensor. So I'm going to take it as meaning the wild tensor and not the scalar, the wild scalar curvature. I'm going to assume that it is the wild curvature tensor. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we're going to say. Killed off. Okay. Now what? Now we've got traces for each e, which is gaining metric. Is second quote, um, first point, does it, the traces for each e become the cosmological constant? Unclear. Um, there's a trace on that line. Trace this. Um, if this is applied in order from right to left does that mean that's a shear and then that shrinks and then that uninverts it as it's been put in the bottle and then it does that with the the smaller mast or the bigger mast. Um, the, it's in order. It does it with the bigger mast. And it does shrink the bigger mast. So I think this first one shrinks the size of the bigger mast. Um, and so it has that first. And that's the thing that does an operation of some kind. And then that... Um, well, that's that falls the moss down and then that one does something to it before it goes in the bottle and well and then that stands up again I don't quite know that I understand I mean if this is how little this metaphor is supposed to be taken it says the bottle is a space of metrics and he's standing things up inside of it and whatever. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. What's being stood up. How do you get these, these tensors to fold? What are they folding against, dimensionally speaking? That's a question. We're all hypnotized by this ship going into a bottle. Um, all very romantic, but what's actually going on geometrically with these surfaces? Can you not say because they are four dimensional? There's no way of picturing it. Mm. There's a half there that looks like it will be what will be operating on the S over 2. And the way he's written it like that is so that he doesn't have to put a line underneath the whole thing and then put two underneath the line as a denominator because it would interfere with him writing Richie Scalar like, like that if he had the two. Um, in there as well 
That's okay. I have a feeling that's important. Like it might have something to do with the, um, it might be the Ryman curvature tensor. Let's say, it says first thing is one, that is the spinor bundles Ryman curvature induced from the Levi Chavita connection. Right, so it's coming from at the unhinged H13 uh, uh, star. Okay, and then that's the spinner bundle would be spin um, 7 7. So that's applied to spin 7 7. And it's induced from the Levy Civita connection. So you're going back down to H. 1, 3, which is a flat vector space into curved um, Riemannian curvature of the pseudo Riemannian manifold. But the spinner bundle is at right angles to reality and at right angles to reality, you went off and said, I want to have the um, Hinged up um, horizontal vector bump, horizontal vector space, and then you hinge it back, and then you take that onto your curved surface, and it comes back through the Levi Civita connection going in the wrong direction down, well, in the, or not the wrong direction, the opposite direction down, and then. Um, that then the spinners are oh, spin seven seven, right? Uh huh. Okay, and we'll do there T omega and the old omega there. I'm not quite sure what the old omega is, it's a component of the complex, isn't it? Of the aspects of omega. I can't remember. It won't be the it's like bosons and fermions. So I think it's in the bosons. But the other stuff on the right hand side where it's zeta and um can't remember the other character. Um, right, that seems to be what's in some of this. So, um, oh, hold on a minute. It's notating this as being Omega. Where is this old Omega sign? Is this it here? No. Oh, hold on a minute. Is this it here? No. Well, where is T Omega? Shifted torsion, T Omega, T Omega, T Omega. It keeps on reoccurring. So what, okay, I think I'm reading this one. He is defi he's defining it after he's used it. Uh, Shouldn't really do that. You should define things before you use them. 
I mean, I suppose, no, I suppose you can do this. You can say, here's some stuff that's complicated, and then after presenting the complicated, inc incomprehensible stuff, then say, where this, this, and this, this, this means this. Yeah, that's all right. Because I do that in my language. I don't have let, blah, 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 and then I say, um, the body of the code is subject to that let. I, I think that's a silly way of doing it. Um, it's better to have it be where. Um, hmm. Everywhere you see a T omega, it means all of that. Element of omega one y add. So I don't know whether omega one is related to omega. You know, the capital omega. It might be. I haven't noticed him using it in a special way in the paper to mean something and say to find what the omega is. I think he does. Maybe I need to look into what the omega is, it might be. Might get a definition somewhere. I don't know what an add value to form is. All right, I've um, had enough of this. It's, I'm getting add value to form coming up ever such a lot. It seems to be coming up so much. I don't think I can, can you continue without researching this. Okay, so that and that was that those multiplied divided by those no subtracted by those I see okay I wonder what the semicolon is being used for. Semicolon in that is being used how? Don't know. I've got one left. No, two left. 
Um, what's this semicolon do? Can't even see what the purpose of the X is. X, semicolon, something. Hmm. Wonder. I don't think I could search for that, or do you think it would be too specific? Ah, this throws me back into what I was looking at. I look up linear algebra. Variables are, fun are separated in a function from parameters. What? Is the semicolon has been used in algebra, any variables after the semicolon are parameters? for function.
Typically, the <coughs> semicolon is only used when writing equations. Sort of an answer. Hmm. Covariant derivatives. Okay. Maybe that's how it's being used. Uh. One forms. Okay. Two forms. Uh, I'm not seeing anything. Wait, is it a two form? I think I'm going to fall asleep. Um, to watch it. This is too difficult. I'm going to have to have a rest and come back. How long have we been doing this for? Oh, well, we can't really have time to respond because it's ten and a half hours. So I'll pick this up later and um, do it more later. Um, this thing about the wild curvature tensor, I need to do some research and reading on it if I can find out more before I start the stream later. I will kind of go and get some kit. Um, it might seem very snail's pace, but I feel that the stuff to do with the shear is a bit that he is problematic. Not well, I don't think it's a big problem, but. I think that it's something that people focus on a lot and it is um, incomplete and he has said he's going to reconstruct it from his notes. I mean, re reconstruct it from scratch if necessary. So I just want to be, I wanted to, if I could, be better informed about what the issue was with it. And um, you know, 
when it says it's about this, that, and the other, and you don't know the context, you don't know how it is that things have, um, you know, what is the role, the, the Ryman curvature tensor, and has it got something to do with the wild curvature tensor in it, and all of that sort of thing. It's, like, it's not really very helpful. So, um, since I want to expose my vest, isn't it? So, um, and if I can't make sense of this based on in at the moment, I will, um, say so. I couldn't get anywhere with it. But that's the question, is these questions, one, two, and three, okay? My assumption of the Ryman coverage sensor includes the, the wild coverage sensor and possibly more. No. I'm just using pseudo Romanian geometry. So he might be getting rid of part of that geometry. Let's look it up now. What is the wild coat sensor? Well, hold on a minute. I've got two things. What do you mean? Curvature space time, or more generally, a pseudo Romanian manifold. Ah, uh, like the Riemann curvature tensor, the wall tensor, especially the tidal force, and the geodesic. Reach the curve saw or trace component of the Riemann tensor. The wild tensor is a traces component of the Riemann tensor. Mm -hmm. It governs, moral coverage, it governs the propagation of gravitational waves. Ah.
In Dimension 2 and 3, it vanishes. In Greater than 4, it is generally non zero. It works if space is flat. I like that. No. Too hard. Two hours ago. Um, 